Block 2, and so called Elf freed us from Allbone's rage, gave us all hope that ushered a new age. If Allbone's was despair then despair is gone, for his reign of terror is over, and the demon is gone. The bard sang the last verse of his song. The audience members stood up from their seats and began to give a standing ovation at the spectacular but off the rails performance by Samantha and Crocker. The lieutenant helped up her subordinate from the ground before the two bowed down happily to the jubilant crowd. The other actors including the two injured ones also walked out to bow down to the crowd. You did it. I can't believe you did it. Free food for you and your friends for the best show I have ever seen. Luther smiled. He was fighting back tears of joy as he walked up to Samantha and hugged her. Dash later around midnight after the jubilee. Dash. You hear this Ken? You hear that? You fucking hear that? That's gold right here. I am rich. Crocker boasted. Yeah. You were fantastic back there. Ken smiled whilst he kept his eyes on the road and his hands on the steering wheel. Hey, Rose if I can ask, how did you do those moves earlier? I didn't know you can stretch like that. Crocker asked, well gymnastics does do a lot of favors for a woman's body. Plus, I main feng in Tekken. Samantha answered. Wow. You're such a fucking nerd Sammy. Crocker laughed as he kicked back his seat and leaned over. I do enjoy the intense drum beating of that song you chose Lewis. It comes from a fighting game. Iris said. Yeah, Tekken is a classic. Maybe one day we will show you the ropes. You'll love it. Crocker smiled. As the squad continued on their midnight journey back home, Samantha's radio began to ring. Hitting the answer button. She placed her mouth over the microphone and her ears focused to the speaker. Strider lead this is Polonsky. Do you read? Said the colonel. Lieutenant Rose reads you. Samantha answered. How was the party quest you undertake? Polonsky asked. Went very well sir. The locals appreciated our help. Relations with Tyrian is growing greatly sir as we speak. That is good news to hear because I got some good news from my end too. The second wave of colonists has just got out of the hyper lane alongside an escort of marines. Call signs is the Mayflower and the Aurora respectively. I want you and your squad to greet Major Holyfield as he touches down tomorrow at noon and he would like to meet Iris too so have her join in too. The colonel informed her. That is great news to hear. I'll also inform Diaz and Root about this ASAP. Stider lead out. She said dropping the radio. Tomorrow is going to be a whole new leaf for the development of the colony. Befriending the locals was one thing, gaining the support of your parent civilization is another. Chapter 12, The Second Wave. The colony ship the Mayflower and her escort the amphibious assault carrier Aurora docked at 8 a.m. in New Albany that day. After adjusting their clocks to match the timing of sunrise and sunset, the fledging colony is now slowly but surely getting its feet deep into the ground in the new world they inhabit. The second wave of colonists and materials are being disembarked from the cargo holds of the Mayflower as it stood side by side to her sister ship the EODEM. Welcoming videos were being played on loops as the new colonists made their way to their designate homes that the pre-purchased when they signed up to volunteer for the brave colonial expansion effort. Yet the old fervor that had once saw struck the United Federation of Earth is slowly fading as the government began to lessen the expansion of their realm in favor of administrating their numerous colonies. The Benham III expedition was probably going to be the last of their colonial expansion efforts for a long period of time as the ruling party, the Common State Party, seeks to divert resources into properly governing their already existing holdings, but the unexpected introduction of a whole, living breathing and intelligently inhabited world has caused the big wigs back on earth to reconsider. In addition, the youth navy had also sent out, with full marine complements to escort frigates to assist in the security of the fledgling Benham III colony, the intrepid and the Mount Cheyenne. Strider a group alongside Colonel Polonsky and several members of the New Albany militia were by the docks that day. But however, instead of greeting the immigrants they were standing idly by for the arrival of Major Elias Holyfield, commander of the Youth Task Force sent to reinforce the New Albany colonial militia. 
Their coming was joined by a variety of military assets ranging from two marine companies of a grand total of 500 whose combat missions were 119th Mechanized Airborne and 53rd Engineering, a fleet of aeroplanes ranging consisting of multi relay ground attack planes and a greatly needed resupply of ammunition. For Iris, marveled at the influx of new faces and materials pouring through the gate, there were strange gizmos she could only describe as something only a madman can conceive. Machinery, tools, and clothing, not even the dreams she had melded with Cain could prepare her for what she saw. Cain, what is that giant looking egg over there? The vampire pointed to one of the ovoid objects being imported through the cargo bay. It had a glowing white blue center contained in a transparent glass chamber with a yellow black hazard warning sign plastered on top of it. Iris was told by Cairn that she should never approach anything in New Albany that is that sign posted next to it. Otherwise, as she can remember from the words of Samantha, you will die of AIDS, cancer or maybe even AIDS cancer. The recollected voice of the lieutenant said. She remembered also asking her what exactly AIDS and cancer is. It's painful. Painful as hell. Crocker answered her question. Cain, who was standing methodically still tilted his head slightly to Iris' left side so that he doesn't appear to be neglecting his militaristic posture. That's an energy reactor. Gives electricity to the colony. He briefly described. Iris remembered the explanation she got about electricity, at least based on how the youth can best explain it to her. A stored lightning bolt they said. At first, she thought that the earthlings can literally catch a lightning from a thunderstorm. Her statement made the Strider group, especially the normally work-minded Cairn and the methodical Samantha burst into laughter, but now she understands the measurement and yes, the concrete measurements of how much power can be held within a just a single box-sized battery. As the energy reactor being hauled away, the shadow of an airplane blanketed the ground they stand in darkness. The winds began to pick up heavily due to the influence of the Vklaircraft's rotor blades coming from its jets. Iris had to keep hold on to her dress from the violent rhythm of the winds. A panel opened from the sides and small flight of stairs was made from the back of the panel allowing entrance and exit from the aircraft. A sharply dressed man in military formal wear emerged from the aircraft and descended the stairs. He was proud and haughty in appearance and the glares from his eyes could instill a cold-hearted dread among the malicious soldiers as he slowly made his approach. The man raised his hands to salute the soldiers as he began to stand in front of his militia counterpart. Colonel, Major Benjamin Holyfield, he was a large physically imposing man who had both the body build of Sergeant Crocker and the dark blackish brown skin of Cain. Good to see you again Major. It's been a long while. Colonel Polonsky saluted. The two promptly began to walk together in a strafe to get an overview of the soldiers who made up the welcoming committee for Holyfield's arrival. I do say Polonsky, your men have been doing well despite the limitations and unexpected outcomes. Holyfield commented. Thank you Major. I am also glad you can arrive in such a short notice and despite the reluctance of the big wigs upstairs. Polonsky nodded. Yeah, the Wicks have been scrambling lately and it was only through my insistence that they allowed me to join you. I do have to work with less resources than what I am used to for this new assignment but at least I get less people to yell at. So, we are dealing with primitive fantasy world people am I correct? Holyfield asked. Indeed. So far, we have first hand experience with some of the natives. We took some casualties but we managed to pull through and established an uneasy peace with the locals at least for now it's uneasy. This is all thanks to the efforts of Lieutenant Samantha Rose. She is very attentive and subservient to the colony's goals almost robot-like even. Everything I have ordered her to do was met with nothing short of success. She is a good soldier like all should be. And you also accomplished this with the help of a cooperative native by the code name of Sakagor Ear and I believe this woman right in front of me is her. Holyfield said as he stopped in front of Iris. It wasn't that hard for the major to spot her from the crowd of military camos since she herself is wearing a dark purple dress that looked more in line of a noblewoman's party attire than a normal grunt in for an inspection. 
Major Holyfield examined her quietly from head to toe. Normally if someone were to check her out for this long at such a close distance, they would be mesmerized by Iris in humanly acquired beauty thanks to her vampiric heritage. But Holyfield examined her like a fear-inducing judge who will reprimand you for the slightest of mistakes. You seem to be handling the sun quite well. For a vampire, Holyfield bluntly said. So they told you to? Tell me. Are you not afraid of me? Iris asked. Yet she had to contain the shock of the man openly telling her secret in such an open setting. Benjamin leaned closer to the vampire with a grievously judgmental aura resonating from him. I have seen much worse in my career, vampire. I do not care how old you are. You cannot fathom the terrible things these old eyes have seen or the heaviest things I had to carry nor the hard choices I had to make as an officer of the youth military. Holyfield gallantly said. But I am not here to discuss philosophies with a real-life horror movie monster. I am here to get my boots on the ground and protect the people of this colony from the horrors of this new world. I do not know if you ever asked this question to yourself before but are you a friend or foe to us? The Major said. Iris silently looked at the grim eyes of the Major. She can sense the man's resolve and experience judging by his face alone. Makes sense as it would take someone of his character to achieve such a high rank in the Earthlings military. You do not need to answer that question now vampire. But perhaps you can convince yourself in the Governor White's boardroom. The Major said. Dash fast forward to the Governor's Palace in New Albany. Dash. Building where the Earthlings established their seat of power has come a long way from being a large ditch in the ground about two weeks ago into a finely built establishment with Romanesque style exterior and a classical European style interior. Iris was invited to the first meeting of leaders that will discuss the Earthlings' future in the fantastical planet of Gleesia. Her purpose was to brief the newly arrived VIPs from the Aurora and the Mayflower. Iris recognized several familiar faces such as Dr. Malona who was seated with other scientists with their matching white coats, Major Holyfield and Colonel Polonsky plus other high-ranking members of the militia sat across them in all of their olive garments and colorful medals and badges that hung on their breasts proudly like laurels on triumphant general's head. There were other leaders too at that room that ranged from those who represent the colony's most influential private business owners and engineering executives in charge of building New Albany's infrastructure. Governor White sat at the most authoritative position in the conference table, at the right-handed side of the table in view of all attendees. This allows the governor to oversee all of his attendants and those who represent all the important structures that pillar the entire political entity of New Albany. Iris had scoffed at the way that the Earthlings conduct their form of monarchy called democracy where the power of the civilian government whose reign is superior to the military. For a woman who lives in a feudal society where the Lord is not only the administrator of civilian affairs but also the commander-in-chief of the land's armed forces. Keeping these two aspects apart was unthinkable to her and even to everyone in Gleesia too. The discussions began, after the exchange of formalities and titles is with Dr. Malona who gave an updated report on his research's progress. He was found that the Mana Crystals, aka Element 120, or Unbenilium as dubbed by the Doctor. He had an air of pride resonating from his girth due to his discovery of a brand new element. Yet what is strange is that it was a naturally occurring one. Normally the elements that are above atomic number 80 and over were man-made elements yet he found a naturally occurring element with such powerful properties. He was using the very few samples he is ranging from a recovered personal stash of mana crystals from the raided Davico mansion and to Iris Shock, her own necklace. She had conflicting feelings over the study of her family heirloom. One such feeling was anger that the purified mana crystal necklace passed down to her was being used like some toy for the scientists to play with their tools with. In contrast, she knew that the doctors were capable of discovering many fantastic insights with their knowledge and tools. Yet she disapproves of the usage of her necklace for their research. Dr. Malona stood up from the podium and announced his research findings. It's through my study, that element 120 or known on this planet as mana crystals as a brand new source of energy similar to uranium but rather curiously. 
without the dangerous radiation, the doctor declared. The room was lit abuzz with his statements as all the significant characters whispered to each other about the implications of the doctor's findings. Such the discovery of a mineral would revolutionize the way the youth can extract, generate, and consume energy. The desire to obtain more of this new element 120 galvanized everyone. So I propose that with the governor's permission and with the help of the militia to obtain more of these Marnock crystals. I have already scouted out several deposits with some probes and with permission I want a retrieval team to obtain samples for my team to research with. Malona requested. I think that can be arranged. The governor enacted. Don't you have one already? Some sort of necklace? One of the second wave engineers from the back of the room asked. It's already tiring enough to work with the only sample we have right now which is the necklace we obtained from the bandit attack several weeks ago. The necklace is currently our only sample of element 120 and I couldn't perform more invasive means of probing without risking accidentally destroying the sample. The necklace, for your information, is the property of Aris Kadahagan who is present in this room right now. Am I correct my lady? The doctor bowed politely to her, all the A's in the conference room turned to the vampire who blushed in nervousness over the sudden spotlight. She was so used to hiding behind everyone noses so such a massive spotlight activated her social anxiety within her. Sweat began to fall down on her snow-white skin as she struggled to utter any words. Noticing her hesitancy, Governor White intervened. It seems that Sakagoyo is not in the mood to talk right now. Let me talk about her, Jeremy said. So, Iris Kadahagan, codenamed Sakagoyo is a guide who has been coerced for lack of a better term, to help us in surviving and integrating ourselves into this new world. She has been an invaluable asset in charge of cultural studies and linguistics for the people of Gleesia, or a the very least in Tyrian right now, Jeremy said. It's quite impressive such a young and beautiful looking human is working for us if I say so myself. Another attendee who belonged to the second wave complimented Iris. Oh, she is as human as she can be. Jeremy replied. His gaze directed itself to Iris in a serious tone as he nodded to her discreetly from across the table. Anyway, next topic. Let's talk about our infrastructure plans, Engineer McTavish. Please take the floor with your proposition to establish a road system throughout the principality. He continued. Dash meanwhile back in New Albany at Aristobar. Dash. The cracking sounds of billiards balls impacting each other and the laughter of people filled Casey's sports bar. The business catered to virtually any person looking for a leisurely time away from the hustle and bustle of their day-to-day -day work. In contrast to what Lieutenant Rose has seen with Luther's drunken bastard. Casey's had wider space, can accommodate more people and best of all it had more modern age technology from a refrigerated beer tap, a wide selection of alcoholic drinks that had just arrived at the same time the second wave colonists touched down and a 152 inch 4K plasma TV which at the moment is still being assembled onto a wall and trying to establish satellite TV connection. All was exciting and merry just like the jubilation Samantha has attended yesterday, but she wasn't enjoying any of it. She sat alone with Dr. Hana at a lonely corner table at the Risto bar drinking away several rounds of margaritas. Robot-like? That's a synonym for hick slave I tell you. Like I am sort of drone that Polonsky can just hick order around like some sort of puppet. Samantha drunkenly said to Dr. Hana. Evaluating her psychological state, Dr. Lee Hainanel had to struggle to piece together the young officer's mental well-being. She was reluctant to allow her to drink copious amounts of alcohol but Samantha insisted she be allowed to drink if she wanted to let out her bottled up frustrations. And Hana knew that angry emotion when stored for long periods of time can be very detrimental to her decision making for a woman of her rank. The lieutenant felt offended by what the colonel her but she didn't have to bravery nor the appropriate atmosphere to call Polonsky out. His words were simply insulting to her father and to the very vow she took when she first joined the military in his footsteps. I thought to have the colonel calling you a good soldier a good thing? Yet the way you're treating it. It's like he said something horrible. Hana deduced. Damn right it's Hori Hit Cable. My father. 
the great and honorable Desmond Rose. The angel of Beltavif didn't earn his medal of honor through blindly obeying his commanders when the odds were stacked against him. He was a fighter. He was a hero and he was. My dad, Samantha cried as she slammed her head to the table and began to sob. Captain Desmond Rose, her late father, ignored orders from his high command to retreat in order to rescue stranded refugees and those of his own unit's soldiers when violent separatist rebels from the planet of Bel Aviv rebelled against the youth colonial government. Many offshot colonies, especially those very far away from the core human worlds would often rebel against the government for many reasons ranging from religious extremism, old tribal earth xenophobia oppressive taxation and land grabbing to name a few. The rebellion in Bel Aviv was the result of a series of fundamentalist political ideologue extremism in a similar vein to Maoist communism from the corrupt colonial government whose leader set himself up as a dictator and established a rogue state in his planet in reflection to the old dictatorships of Earth like North Korea and Libya. The youth intervened at the side of the rebels and Samantha's father. Captain Rose was one of the soldiers to carry out the liberation, however, their intelligence on the enemy's strength was off. The dictator had a secret army of androids armed with heavy rifles and supported by autonomous drones. The robotic army countered the invasion with an unhinged blitzkrieg which pushed the rebels and the youth army back to a corner. The robots were ruthless in their assault due to their lack of humanity and a sense of self-preservation. They didn't discriminate on civilians and combatants. This has prompted the youth high command to evacuate the plan and glass the surface into oblivion with a heavy barrage of kinetic batteries from the Navy's guns. Ordering those who have survived the failed invasion to evacuate to a designated area. Yet not all people managed to keep up with the general retreat as many people fell behind. Seeing a large swathe surrounded by over a million fleeing refugees trapped in an isolated urban part of the planet being surrounded by hundreds of the corrupt governor's forces. Her father was told to leave them behind because there were only a few hours left before the bombardment. Yet. Desmond couldn't bear himself to leave the people behind to their destructive fate. Cutting off his communications with high command, Captain Rose ordered his men and all those who could join him to move up to the pinned down refugees and help them escape. Although he suffered heavy casualties from the youth forces side, thanks to Rose's selfless act, he managed to get most of the trapped civilians out of there and were successfully evacuated right before the scheduled kinetic bombardment was about to commence for his bravery at the face of overwhelming odds stacked against him. Captain Desmond Rose was awarded the Medal of Honor. Samantha remembered being right next to her father as he received his medal then made an inspiring speech where he talked about sometimes, you have to just do the right thing even when others say you shouldn't. Samantha was so inspired by her father's words that she, much to her mother's shock and initial disapproval, signed up to become a soldier of the youth military in her father's footsteps. I understand, I know your father's story and I respect that, Hana said. Oh Rhea, we, Samantha sarcastically chided in her intoxicated state. Please, Sam get rid of this first and look at me. The Korean woman pushed aside Samantha's half-full margarita from and groped the hair of her head. Her breath reeked of alcohol and complimentary salted peanut appetizers. Dr. Hana stared at Sam's eyes and noticed that they were lazily moving apart from their synchronized form under the influence of the bottle. She could barely make a proper unaided diagnosis when a loud cheering noise shrieked behind her. The source of the noise was that the men were cheering that they can now watch live sports via the newly set up satellite TV on their 152 inch 4K plasma TV screen. The noise and cheering couldn't let up as they saw the game being played in front of them which Hana couldn't stand listening to when her patient is in need of her help. She immediately carried Samantha over her shoulder and very discreetly rushed to the women's restroom. Since the building was mostly catered to men since it's a sports bar, very few women would be enticed to visit such a raucously masculine establishment. The women's toilets were very quiet and very empty at a place like this. After making their way inside the room, Samantha pushed herself away from the doctor, grasping her stomach in one hand and her mouth with the other. 
she pushed the cubicle doors of the nearest toilet stall open and knelt down to the toilet to throw up. She hurled away the toxic elements that she overloaded her systems with. Hana walked behind her and patted Sam's back to comfort her. After a brief moment, Samantha stood up and walked to the sinks and stared at herself at the mirror. The skin around her eyes were of a hint of black in addition to the slight crimsoning of the eye whites themselves. Her hair was a bushy mess compared to the prim and proper form earlier thanks to her constant cringe-induced groping from being called obedient by the colonel. I, I, I just got hurt back there you know doc, I didn't want to show it to the squad or the other men, I just, didn't want to appear weak in front of them. Samantha said, that I can understand from you both as a woman and as a person in charge. It's always hard to not show your emotions to other soldiers, said to reduce combat effectiveness. But for a woman, it can be much harder than a man and this is not a sexist thing. It's simply a fact that every woman must accept that we are all more emotional than the men. Hana lectured, I know. Samantha quietly lowered her head, but I don't want to be like some puppet that high command can just pull my strings attached every time they use me. I need some independence. Assertiveness, Samantha said. Well, I do know that with the second wave of colonists coming in already and the expansion of our facilities, there's going to be a lot of work that needs to be done. Volunteer work, Hana emphasized. Samantha's eyes widened in surprise as she turned her head to Hana. What kind of work? She asked. Well more recon in studies and observations just like what you were doing for the past few weeks. But this time, the SOG has the freedom to choose where they will do their traveling and scouting next. Hana explained. How did you know of this? This is, technically for military ears only for crying out loud. Samantha flipped herself over from Hana's forbidden knowledge. Some of the soldiers at the Mdbay mentioned their excitement over the new change of MO to me. It was just announced right after the colonel left for that meeting at the governor's palace. I thought you knew. I just stormed out of the airstrip. How the hell was I supposed to know? Well, maybe you should learn some self-control my red-headed friend. Samantha hugged Hana joyfully as she tightly wrapped her arms around the Korean physician. Oh thank you, thank you, thank you. Samantha ecstatically gave her gratitude, don't mention it. Just remember to not let your emotions get the best of you, at least in front of your men. If you need some time to be yourself, you can always call me. Hana replied. Promise? Samantha pouted. Pinky promise. Hana clasped her finger around Samantha's dash the next day in the command room, dash. The room was bustling with activity as familiar faces mingled with new ones. The sounds of conversations echoed loudly in a serious undertone like a busy but normal day in a stock exchange as everyone got to work. Thanks to the additional staff and communication technology from Major Holyfield, the efficiency of the command room was increased exponentially. Samantha made her way quietly but confidently to Colonel Polonsky who was standing idly by tapping away on his tablet which he gets information and news of the militia's day-to-day -day operations in real time. Lieutenant, I was just about to tell you something. You're pretty happy today? Is it the new spaghetti shipment? The colonel turned to her. I haven't tested it yet I'm afraid but I am here to choose a new assignment for my squad. Let me see what needs to be done. Samantha confidently answered she stepped her foot down ready for adventure. Well, you're being quite proud today. Just like your late father, God rest his soul. He tempered down his voice in respect to the war hero. So here is what needs to be done for the day. I got a hearts and the minds mission that involves building some asphalt roads across the principality and the marine engineers could use some extra hands. Then I got this request for assistance for some kidnap for ransom bandits from Prince Clovich that Mendoza could use extra guns for and the other one is something nobody has taken an interest of. A requisitions request for a large cache of unvanillium from Dr. Malona that involves going to some hill east of here that I will take the for the good doctor. Samantha interrupted putting her foot down again. That Iris told me is haunted. Polonsky finished his sentence. I will still take it. 
The doctor needs those mana crystals for his research, plus, Iris has attached to my squad anyway so might as well come along with us there. Can give some of her expert opinion on the place, she reasoned. Well consider yourself on the case then lieutenant. By the way, I was about to tell you something important. Polonsky nodded. Samantha gestured him to continue with her hands, eager to hear what the colonel has to say. Thanks to the marines and Major Holyfield, we got additional personnel to work with. I know that there are certain roles in your squad that are still vacant so the Major took the liberties of filling out one such role. A radioman. Here's the transfer orders. He should be hanging around the Aurora's barracks right now. Polonsky passed her a cardboard file with the youth military's insignia imprinted on it. She opened the file and read its contents. Her new squad mate is named Edward Clay a communications technician of the rank of corporal from the 119th Mechanized Airborne Company. Tall and strong of the expected build of a man who towers at 6 feet 1 inch feet. Alongside his assault rifle, he carries the standard issued wideband tactical radio system that was tucked comfortably in its compact form around his back. His qualifications include being a broadcast operator and coordinating precision airstrikes and artillery barrages. Samantha smiled at the new addition. Come technicians, as she knows from officer school, were like the secretaries for CO keeping track of all the orders, radio traffic, and doing the complicated geometric mental gymnastics in coordinating strikes and barrages. The burden of such tasks lifted from her is a welcoming relief. She was never someone who functions well when multiple people are talking to her at once as she could get very socially anxious at times. This flaw only happens when she is off of the battlefield since she feels more at home yelling out orders to as few people as possible, whether they were directly going to enact her orders or delegate it to others below her in peak efficiency was how Lieutenant Rose would ideally have as her command structure, it is simple and old as time, but effective. I expect you to give me a report by the afternoon Rose, dismiss, the colonel said. Dash an hour later at the vehicle bay dash. So this hot elf chick, me and Diaz here were surrounded by these nasty critters and we barely survived. Abidaya relayed the events of his hunting trip with Vincent to Crocker who was busy cleaning and loading up the mounted machine gun on Strider Group's land cruiser. Damn. And you managed to take photo of this girl before she left? Let me see. Crocker requested. Switching open his phone, Diaz tapped to the gallery folder and opened his picture of the mysterious self archer woman named Eliathra. Turning his found around, Crocker leaned downwards from his elevated position to examine it. He was astonished and amazed by the young woman's serene features, golden blonde hair, azure colored eyes, and her fair skin with a slight tanning on her cheeks. Well holy fucking shit. She's pretty damn beautiful. Just like the mold books and movies about them. Being elves, long lived, and supermodel sexy and all. Since they exist, maybe we can go traveling to whatever big ass tree house village city place they live in. Crocker commented. You say that like you really want to go croc. Diaz said. Well. This old soldier would love to see something pretty for a change. Been through shit and more shit. Earth, Mars, Centauri Prime, Kesselheim. Wait Kesselheim? Diaz interrupted. Yeah served there for a year. The city is nice but the slums are basically like the old Brazilian favelas in classic drug cartel movies. Crocker answered. That's where I used to work in before I got arrested and all. I wonder if my locker is still there now that I am gone. I miss my stuff. Custom guns. My heist mask with a smart HUD that the best can money buy and my old car. I miss Marlboro. I am quite the driver. Diaz boasted. I didn't know that, Kane said jumping into their conversation. Well, I tend to be more proficient in lighter weight vehicles. This land cruiser is as fast as a fat kid chasing an ice cream truck. I am quite my normal standard reckless. I can't drive like a normal person as Mr. Byongchin told me all the time after I caused thousands in property damage just getting to point A to B. Diaz scratched his head in chagrin to his confession. Well leave the driving to me then Diaz, Kane said. 
The penal soldiers backed away from the group. Where's the LT? Abidaya asked. Right here, everybody. Samantha walked in. Alongside her was a man of African-American descent slightly short of Crocker's height. The man also sported a radio antenna from his right shoulder and had the badge of a communications technician alongside his insignia. Who's he? Crocker asked. Command has given us additional resources and manpower thanks to the arrival of the Aurora. This is Corporal Edward Clay. He will be our communications technician. He got the qualifications to talk with command and call in support of all kinds just to sum up his resume. Samantha explained, it will be a great pleasure to work with all of you. Clay saluted. Hey don't forget me. Iris interrupted them. Iris. I thought you were going to be giving lectures on the planet Glee easier to the second wave colonists? Kane questioned. After I help you getting this mana crystal cash, the doctor wants me to evaluate the quality of the crystals once we see them for ourselves. The vampire answered. Well okay, expect to get a bit tight inside since we got a new guy. Corporal. Clay. Radioman likes to make miracles if you catch my drift. Diaz joked to break the ice with their new squad member. The Earthlings chuckled at the suggestive fantasy elements of the penal soldier's joke. The Radioman's job is to call forth miracles. You're a mage? A powerful one? Iris asked, not fully absorbed by Diaz's attempt at humor. Yes, Sakagoria. I can call forth four kinds of miracle spells. They're called Air Strike. Artillery Barrage, Supply Drop and Medivac. Without these spells, oh my, the Youth Army will crumble down. Clay followed in with the joke. I never heard of those spells before although Ken did told me they were. Hey, that's not magic. Iris snapped. It is if it helps you. Maybe one day you will see some of my miracles yourself. You speak good English for an alien. How did you learn our language so fast? Clay asked. That's a long story, that I would rather not talk about. She replied. Yeah it's best you don't want to know, trust me in this one. Samantha tapped the new guy's shoulder. Anyhow, our mission is to scout out a cache of unvanillium that Dr. Malona has detected west just next to the border of the principality. She briefed everyone. You got to be careful. I hear lots of brigands and Aussish nomads like to run around those parts of the land. Iris warned. That's why we will have air support at the ready in case the worst happens and a few extra squads to secure the site. We just need to scout it out for them first before they can move in. Samantha. Sounds like a plan LT. Abidaya nodded. Right. Crocker enthusiastically affirmed as he cocked the now belt fed Verdun machine gun making it ready to fire at any opposition that stands in the way of New Albany's progress. Buckle up people we moving out. Samantha twirled her finger as all of the Strider group boarded the land cruiser. Rose walked up to the shotgun seat and closed the door. Let's go. Samantha pointed the way forward. Chapter 13, Mana Storm. Ken's drone soared above Strider Group as it surveyed the hilly plains where Dr. Malona gave an approximate location for a detected cache of unvanillium crystals. The squad had taken the scenic route of exploring the western side of the principality which was painted and sculpted in the forms of wide plains that slowly become arida as they continued to move further west. They had passed by several fortresses manned by not of Prince Klovich's men but by the Stla Aegean Empire. Iris had warned them that it is best to keep their distance from the forts because they tend to get skittish with those coming from in and out of the eastern borders of the empire. This is in no thanks to the numerous nomadic hawks that plague the eastern plains with their mad quest to despoil any hapless caravan that they prey upon. Hopefully, the reconnaissance drones patrolling about courtesy from the carrier the Aurora is being put to good use by Corporal Clay in a hopeful attempt to early warn of any impending surprises that may dare lurk around in these cold and desolate wastes. The doctor is right. There is a whole cache of unbenillium right below us. Ken declared. How many are we talking about? Samantha asked. Ah. According to the drone. I would say about one ton of them. Ken answered. That's quite a lot to be placed in one spot. Iris commented. Is it unusual for it to be like that? Samantha inquired. Unusual in the sense that normally, 
Mana crystals tend to be not in deserts but near mountains in more cooler climates like deeper into the Empire's territory or by the Dwarven clan's holds. To find such an amount in these sunny grasslands is normally unusual, naturally speaking. So are you implying that maybe, just maybe by your logic that someone may have deposited these crystals here? The lieutenant twitched her eyebrows, most likely. I think she is right Rose. The scanner has also brought up that the crystal cache is being held in some sort of hollowed out cavern of sorts beneath us. It looks like we are gonna need some heavy machinery to dig up all this dirt. Kane said. Very well, Clay. Contact command and tell him to move in with the rest of the stuff. Plus call him to bring some doses over. The good doctor is going to get his new samples this week or I will be damned if he doesn't. Samantha ordered. Dash about six hours later. Dash. The machines of the heavy mining industry plowed through the dirt ground as their exhaust pipes belched the refuse of their fuels. The youth soldiers patrolled the 50 by 50 meter perimeter with their arms firmly on their hands in a vigilant watch for any intruders who may wish to harm them. Fraliath Roletha, the machines seemed like monsters made by some twisted necromancer who bundled up pieces of metal and would dare call it a living being. They were more like a parody of life than anything else. She was followed the loud roars of the demonic creatures from New Albany to this place, and initially an unnoticeable piece of flat land with no other features but the short dry grass and mounds of hills. She was about to dismiss that perhaps the demons were just expanding their reach away from where she knows they originated from until her body and soul began to feel something. They screamed to her like hunger panging her stomach, but instead of food, she could sense the presence of mana crystals. Being an elf, their nature was more finely attuned to the winds of magic or ether as they call it that emits from the mana crystals. They called to her from beneath the earth like moths searching for a flame. Did these demons know where they can find these crystals? If that's the case then the human kingdoms will be in deep peril. The demons, as said in the legend can also use the mana crystals for their own ends. However, like the law of physics dictate, not all energy can be retained wholly through its energy conversions. Some power is inevitably lost through the act. Humans, dwarves, and most lesser races can only efficiently utilize a third or half of the attainable energy of mana crystal. Elves in the other hand, as if created for such a purpose, can utilize 66% to 80% of the stored energy from the crystals. In the old storybooks she read in her library in her palace, demons are said to be able to harness 90% or in some exaggerated cases, all of the power the crystal stored without any minuscule loss. If the demons get their hands on such a large pile of mana crystals in such a short and unguarded area away from the secured mining facilities of the Empire and the dwarves would be beyond devastating to the chances of the survival of the world. She must warn them. Running away from the demon gathering until she was about a mile between her and them, she knelt down and conjured her magics to summon the energy needed to send out a distress call for her human allies. Emperor Eldin, this is Aliathra. I spotted a group of demons collecting mana crystals in the middle of the eastern border of Tyrian. You have to stop them before they become too powerful. She communicated her message to her tweet a bird. Additionally, the elf also embedded additional magic to her spell by programming the conjuration to also relay the location of the dig site so that the slay agents can know where to strike. Knowing the humans. They will quickly dispatch the border guards stationed in the eastern Tyrian border to take them down. Hopefully, with their experience and familiarity of the native terrain and their superior manpower should be enough to stop the demon's plans of acquiring the crystals which to her own curiosity is seemingly placed mistressly in the middle of the frontier wilderness of the Slaeagen Empire. Quickly turning her head around for any eavesdroppers, Aliathra cloaked herself with an invisibility spell to quietly leave the scene. She still has a cover to maintain as one of her world's most valuable intelligence assets due to her close proximity to the demon's nerve center called New Albany. She has also remembered that she was given the invaluable opportunity to walk inside freely into the hearth of the demon's so-called wall-less fortress with the help of an unaware individual named Abidaya Root. 
she will have to prepare for the dangerous mission. She will need to cast holy wards against the possible evil influences that the demons could throw at her. She even also takes into account this Vincent person. He had the look and feel of a normal human compared to everyone she has observed from afar in New Albany. But something is rather off with that one. Behind his cavalier stature, she could feel something roguish underneath him. Are the demon's human disguises slowly failing? Were their forms just a ploy to fool the human kingdoms so that they would treat them like their own kin? Such deceit will not go unpunished. Dash back at the dig site in a makeshift targeting range. Dash. Iris had nervous but to the youth an ambrosial excitement face etched into her as she stared at the MGL revolver type grenade launcher. The very same one she took from the hands of an incapacitated Ken in the battle for Devico's mansion. She could recognize the weapon through the distinct etchings on the launcher's receiver. It was presented to her in all of its fineries by one of the military crates that stored the youth's weapons and gear. Go on, take it. Ken told her. I, I, don't know, I just grabbed that wand of yours out of anger for those bandits. It's, a. How do you say? Eat of the moment kind of moment. Iris hesitated. She was nervous about wielding the MGL again but the display she had shown enchanting the weapon with a variety of magical elements was of noteworthy status. Among the youth, the vampire could remember all the pestering she had endured when scientists, soldiers, and normal residents alike asked her how she managed to create a frost bomb. For a person of her advanced age. She had lots of practice honing her skills in enchanting the magical energies into objects as a job for Luther when he needed to sell specialized weaponry to his huge clientele of questing warriors and high-paying noblemen. Sometimes, the order was a brilliant flaming sword, other times a bow that can shoot icicles and in some outlandish requests a breastplate that allows the user to breathe underwater. With the advent of these new youth technologies being present right in front of her, there were more possibilities for even more enchantment combinations. Iris picked up the MGL from its container and held her left hand to its foregrip and the trigger grip with her right. She took a long look at the weapon scope which gave her an enhanced zoom of the makeshift targets in front of her. Then it dawned on her that MGL needs ammunition to be able to fire its explosive magics. She opened the revolving container of the device and picked inserted the ammunition into each slot. Remember, those are training rounds, not the real thing. But if Dr. Malona's theory is correct, it won't matter. Ken reminded her. After she finished loading the ammo into the cartridge, Iris closed the lid and took aim. Channeling her magic, she enchanted Ken's MGL with jolts of lightning emitting from her body and attaching themselves into the metal body of the weapon until it became fully embedded with electric magic like a lightning rod. Squeezing the trigger, Iris let loose a training grenade shot at the nearest target. The grenade exploded in a cloud of lightning infused smoke cloud in its wake. Ah fuck! yelled a voice behind Iris startling her. She turned around to see that Clay was scratching the side of his head as he cringed in pain. He was right next to his radio which is on top of a table. The headset he wears with him was rather not in its usual cranial position but it lay alone below him at the tawny surface of the plains. What just happened? Ken rushed to his clay concernedly. I was just talking with command on my radio when suddenly my audio went static that. Talk to me, Clay said. He began to gesture his hand to point to his right ear. What? Ken asked in confusion. Just say anything on my right. Clay demanded. You. Hello, food. Clay. Chicken. Alpha. Omega. Blue. Ken muttered randomly. Shit. I think I'm a bit deaf on my right ear. Where did that electromagnetic pulse come from? Ken left Clay to run to the doctor to get his ear check. The engineer turned to Iris, who still held the electric-infused MGL at her hands. What happened? Can we continue? Iris asked. Yeah, but let's do less of that lightning bolt grenades. For now, Ken suggested. The vampire which disenchanted the MGL off of its electrical influences and re-enchanted the weapon with the crimson waves of fire. She took aim again with the MGL and opened fire, as he observed her brilliant display of magical prowess with modern earth weaponry. Ken could not help but evaluate what just happened to their new radioman. 
Can the magic of this planet have any negative effects on their technology? If unbinilium infused lightning can disrupt a radio, what would happen if such energy was multiplied? The possibilities of such an unknown force when applying theoretical chemistry and physics caused his black skin to go white with fear. If magic can affect electronics, then these unbinilium crystals may be more potent than what the good doctor has initially theorized. Looks like he is going to have to tell that fat Hawaiian in the lab coat about this and see what he thinks about it. Dash a few hours later, a breakthrough happened. Dash. The engineers struck something hard. Or at least that's what the reports said as Samantha rushed to the location of the discovery. She saw a gathering of the dig site's laborers hurriedly uncovering the discovery. As she gently pushed them aside, Samantha soon found what had caused the workers to get all excited about. It was a stone carving of an artificial design. It had ornate tribal markings inscribed permanently on the gray surface of the rock which glowed with magic. Iris do you know anything about this? Samantha asked the vampire who just recently walked behind her as she marveled at the excavated site. No wonder there is a whole cache of mana crystals in the middle of nowhere. This is a Sanhill tomb. Iris answered. Care to elaborate? The Sanhill are the ancestors of the people of Tyrian. Before the Principality got absorbed into the Slaeagian Empire, the Sanhill had a thriving culture distinct from the other human tribes a few hundred years ago. For the nobility, they believe that when they die they will need to be entertained in their afterlife, so they are buried with many of their possessions, like their furniture, wealth, servants, faithful warriors, and most importantly, Mana crystals. Iris answered, like the Egyptians, an old earth civilization long ago in our history, get buried with all of their stuff after they died. Tell me, what kind of noble is this man if you can judge by the entrance of the tomb? A king. Oh, damn we just hit the jackpot. Diaz exclaimed enthusiastically so. Wait. Oh shit. Is that mean we are going to, you, rob a dead guy in there at the spooky place? Yeah. Count me out on the scouting team for this one. I may be a robber but I have standards. His optimism turned to reluctance and then outright refusal. Well I won't force you in this one for now. Okay Kane, Crocker, Iris you're with me. We are going in and I want that door opened yesterday. Diaz, Root, and Clay, stay outside and keep the radio in contact command of what we find. Samantha was never comfortable having the corpo coming alongside her inside the tomb. He might let his greed supersede any kind of traps or whatever hidden dangers could lurk inside. Yes sir. Strader group yelled in unison. Dash deep inside the tomb. Dash. The burial chambers were decorated with a wide variety of possessions ranging from mirrors, statuettes, gilded war gear, and jewelry. The first few rooms looked undisturbed by any other person for centuries due to the lack of any disorderly disturbances if the same logic for Egyptian tombs applies to Sanhilian ones. Yet Samantha had to practice restraint lest she gives in to her own avarice. She has seen those mummy movies and feared that room could suddenly be flooded with an unending deluge of flesh-eating scarabs to seal her soul within the dread manse's walls or much worse fates that she do not dare fathom. All this stuff, damn. This king must be loaded with cash. Crocker commented, leaning for a closer look at a small gathering of gold with eyes filled with lust. Don't even try sergeant. It could be booby-trapped. Samantha warned. Be respectful to this place otherworlder. This is the final resting place of someone who must have been revered in life. Iris reprimanded him. Oh, yeah all right. Shit. Can't concentrate for shit in a place like this. He backed off from the treasures. They continued to move slowly deeper into the tomb where additional items rest on their way ranging from scrolls sealed with decorated handles and inscribed with seals of runic symbols. Then they begin to walk to where the dead were laid to rest in stone-carved sarcophaguses. Each cover of every tomb had a distinct pile of items resting atop of them which signifies what kind of person was buried there. Weapons and armors belong to soldiers and bodyguards, rods and mitres to advisors and religious figures, plates and plain cloth garments adorned with decorative gold and jewelry to signify the opulent status of the one who rests within this tomb. They all formed a large circle around a pedestal where another sarcophagus laid in the middle of it, the coffin's exterior. 
unlike the plain stone ones that surrounded it, were made of some sort of refined bone decorated with traces of gold and jewelry in intricate patterns. It was big enough to fit a fully grown man inside it. To the LT's deduction, this must be the king whose final rest is this very tomb they now roam. In an adjacent room, Samantha spotted a bright bluish glow that was being dimly emitted from the door. With the help of Crocker opening the stubbornly locked door with a swift kick from his exosuit, the lieutenant and her second in command and entered the sealed chamber. Jackpot. Samantha smiled. The room was filled to the brim with unbinillion crystals as if all hoarded into a single tile of space. Damn. My eyes hurt a bit. Crocker commented about the irritation of his eyes. I know me too. This. This is more than what Dr. Malona needs. Samantha said. The crystal storage room had unbinillium that averages around the same size of Crocker's torso. They were too heavy to be hauled off by hand however and would need much more stronger means of moving these crystals out. By the walls of the room, Samantha noticed that the walls behind the crystals were showing signs of wearing off due to the decay and dilapidation of their structural integrity. There was a faint green coloring behind the walls that shimmered upon the contact of light. Those walls, are made of gyronite a mineral that is known to block siphoning of mana crystals when placed between the user and the crystals. Iris pointed. Scanners says that this mineral are similar to the materials we use to make containers for nuclear materials, and this stuff is already way past its half-life. Ken analyzed. Well no wonder I have never seen any spikes on my scanner on the initial readings. I'll tell the lads back up to get the gear out. Let's go. This place gives me the creeps. Ken shivered. Hold on, I want to take a look at the tombs before we go. Samantha objected. They walked to the elevated pedestal of the decorated tomb to investigate further. Picking up her camera, Samantha aimed the device at the coffin to marvel at its golden splendor. Iris walked in front of her and leaned closer to the sarcophagus. She waved her index figure to the right as she read the inscriptions. Do you know the language? Ken asked her. Yes. This is King Martin the Necromancer's tomb. Iris answered. I am sorry. But what did you say he is? The what? Crocker questioned. The Necromancer? I have read about him. He was considered the last of the Necromancer kings of the Sanhili when it was still independent from the Empire. Iris explained. Oh great first fantasy creatures now we got fucking zombies and spooky scary skeletons. What next? Flying pigs. Crocker joked. Breaking off from her subordinates attempts at humor to lighten the shocking discovery, Samantha took a quick snap of King Martin's sarcophagus with her camera, but as the device made its clicking noise, the ground began to shake. Alarmed, Strider Group unholstered their weapons and screened the barrels of their guns on all directions. Being surrounded without any cover by a necromancer's main means of offense which are dead corpses is an unfavorable position to be in for the squad. Then the lid popped open from the inside which then followed the stench of a spice-preserved corpse filled the chamber with its odor. A soft moan came from the gilded coffin as the reanimated corpse of King Martin the necromancer stood proudly as a shambling corpse can be in front of them. Who dares, he said. The ancient king was dressed in what Samantha can describe as something of a traditional Gaelic attire with a green-colored kilt that he wore over his male armor that became stained with brownish rust despite the best abilities of the coffin to seal away the oxygen from his corpse to the outside world. His bones, in contrast to the physical traces of his clothes, were a mix of bone and a ghostly ethereal glow that is slightly transparent in several portions of his exposed body. From view of King Martin's exterior, his right forearm bones were completely of a ghostly form in addition to his left ring finger of the same intangible material. Underneath the necromancer's male armor and robes, through several holes from years of neglect, Samantha noticed that there were a faint glow coming from within Martin's ribcage that emitted light in a flickering rhythm similar to a heartbeat. The youth slowly aimed guns at the undead king ready to fight their way out of an army of corpses. Yet Samantha had a bad feeling that not all of them will be able to get out of this tomb alive if this will all go down hostility. My lord. You. King Martin. Samantha lowered her rifle down to the floor slowly. What are you doing? Ken asked her. 
trying to get you guys out of this alive. Shush. Samantha quieted the engineer before she turned again to King Martin. King Martin. This is surely a mistake. My men did not know that. Silence slave. Martin interrupted. You have woken me up from my slumber. Now I must. Hey. Why does. That. Woman share my. Blood. Martin pointed to Iris. The youth soldiers turned their eyes to the vampire who stood behind them stoically from the arraignment. You know her? Samantha asked King Martin. You know him? Cain asked. Yes, for the Kadahagan line can be traced back to the priest kings of the Sanhili. Iris answered. Long before the coming of the empire, the Sanhili practiced in what we now call necromancy. The priest kings of ancient Tyrian were obsessed in attaining ultimate power for themselves. They hated their mortal forms and the possibility of being powerless so they experimented with magic until they found a solution. A means to prolong their lives well above their mortal life. Span whilst also enhancing their abilities to siphon mana from the earth. However, it came at a cost of their physical bodies. Their bodies began to fail and their forms slowly withered to dust and in place. An ethereal form that is corporeal to the touch. Iris explained. So. They are slowly becoming ghosts, lashes, but this allows them to tap into magic. Ken summarized the information. The Ethereum. This night-skinned peon is of astute mind I do say. King Martin confirmed. Oh, come on. Even your grandpa even calls me that name too. Ken commented on the necromancer's appropriation of his identity. I thought I just called you Nightman Ken. Iris corrected the Nigerian. Just call me Ken from now on okay? Fine but let me continue. So the Necro Kings were one of the first people in Gleesia to pioneer the art of necromancy. At first, it was originally used to make an expendable labor force for the Sanhili to build their civilizations but over time the priest kings found more applications to their skeleton workforce as soldiers. If you recall the Jubilation Day play you remember about Allbone the Steel Butcher? The youth nodded yes. Well after discovering this brand new means of manipulating magic, Allbone himself went to Tyrian and demanded to know the secrets of necromancy by the Necro Kings. King Martin, the king at the time was not willing to share his knowledge, Iris said, and not even my horde of unvanillium too. King Martin crossed his arms. In his anger, Allbone murdered a large number of the Sanhili populace and enslaved the rest. Iris continued. But still I refuse to give up my secrets. In order to not allow him to know the secrets of necromancy, I embraced the slowing kiss of a jacity but not before giving a few of my most precious tomes to my five children. I sense from your blood, Iris, that you can trace your lineage to my eldest son Cardo. I recall the notes were of a serum that allows the user to both live for extended periods of time and be very proficient in siphoning the magic from the mana crystals at the cost however that he must drink blood of a living being. Were you sired or born a Kadahagan? Martin asked Iris. I was born one, and I am considered the last of his line grandfather. She replied sadly. By the gods. Cardo, my eldest and my most faithful child. What had transpired? I expected him to have many of kin. The skeletal king questioned in shock to the news that a portion of his descendants are dying out. He, they, my father. He, Iris stuttered. She feared the next words she has to say in front of her grandfather. He messed up somehow. Cain interrupted. I do not want you to speak Nightman. Martin roared. Yes. My further Terran. He, unfortunately, drew disfavor with the rest of the other vampires. And now I am all that is left of the blood of your eldest child. But I wish to seek amends with our family one day. And please, forgive me for him. Let us stop calling this one Nightman right now. It's making him agitated. To best put into words, Iris apologized for Cairn's upset outburst. It did little to lessen the tension of the room. The ghastly king could wake up his entire legion and surround them with a snap of his fingers if he wanted to. He stood menacingly with a capricious gaze at the intruders. He didn't care if one of them was one of his children. He wanted all of them out before they could steal even a single one of his valuable possessions and he wanted them out a minute ago. Please King Martin, 
We beg you to spare our lives. We did not know we are disturbing your tomb. We will not take a single coin from your treasury if you promise to let us go. We are only just a small band of fifty people, the rest of whom are outside. Samantha stepped in front of Iris to Pali. She knows that returning to New Albany empty-handed or worse in a body bag would be devastating. She cares about the mission but she equally cares for the lives of her men, even in the case of Diaz and his mega-corporate ways. Liar. You are just another hapless band of tomb robbers. I hear the hooves of a thousand horses just walking along outside ready to spring out of here with all of my treasure. The Lich King shot her down. Horses? We didn't bring any horses. Samantha twitched her eyebrows dumbfoundedly. Then, if those aren't your horses I hear, then whose steeds are they? King Martin questioned. By the gods. The camp is under attack. Iris exclaimed. Dash meanwhile back at surface level. Dash. HQ. 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 We are under heavy fire. We need support now. Edward Clay yelled to his radio in a desperate bid to call high command. Yet all that answered to him was the static nothingness of a disconnected line. Damn it. He cursed as he ducked his head low from a grazing magic shot. It scorched the surface of the rock that he hid behind leaving a dark's burn mark where it landed. How's the radio? We gonna get overrun at this point. Abidia cried as he reloaded his sniper rifle. I can't get a damn answer private. Something is blocking the signal. Clay replied. What? We are being jammed or something? By what? Diaz said. How am I supposed to know? Clay replied. It was previously quiet back at the surface level of the tomb with the engineers quietly resting after a long day's work. Clay, Diaz and Abed had initially thought that since they will just lazily sit down on some chairs just to stare at the approaching sunset quietly while breaking the ice with each other with the new guy. However, they heard a faint horn noise that slowly grew closer every second. Then a volley of arrows rained down on several of the engineers and soldiers injuring and killing a dozen of them. The three remaining members of Strider Group scrambled to get their weapons out to fight back their attackers. It was the aforementioned Dorsish nomads who stormed the camp through the thunder of their hooves and whistling of their arrows. Their mounts were a variety of beasts and animals. Some were the familiar horses that many medieval armies would ride into battle. Others were bear-sized wolves whose backbones can support the weight of their masters, and most likely the worst were the ones who rode giant spiders on top of the arachnid's head while they leaned over its body for not only does the spiders move along the earth effortlessly without tiring, it also can spit out venom from its mouth and extremely adhesive webbings from its anus. They encircled around the perimeter of the dig site constantly firing arrows and other projectiles at the youth. Some of the mounted hostiles wore distinctive robes and held magical staffs that shot balls of energy at them. Keep firing, keep firing, one of the youth soldiers ordered. Yet communication between the soldiers were a mess. Their radios weren't working due to static receiving and were forced to yell out to. The suppressive fire of the mounted archers kept the youth pinned down to what little cover they could manage to hid from. We're getting fucked in the ass right now. We need a plan where's Lieutenant Rose? Abidia yelled. Still down there in the tomb. Clay replied. We need support now private call in command to get anything over here. Abidia stuttered in a hasty exhalation of his venerable breath, his gasps breathing the pistonic gases his sniper rifle emitted from each shot he took. I am trying, but the radio is barely coming through. It has to be those magics in this place disrupting my quantum radio. The radio operator answered. She would have known what to do. What now? We're cut off from command and these orcs are kick our butts. Diaz said. I got a plan. Diaz you said you can drive right? Clay asked the penal soldier. Yeah, all right we make a run for it for the landstrider. Root, I need you to mount MG. We'll draw as much of the heat of our guys with a horse of our own. Clay took command. T Let's see if these orcs like a taste of 0 .50 California. Root smiled. Hey you. Cover fire. Clay turned to another group of pinned down soldiers adjacent to their position. You got it. One of them said. He and four other soldiers stood up from their cover and opened fire at the encircling orcs. 
The three Strider group members leapt out of their cover and made a break line speeds to the squad's land cruiser which was parked in the middle of the dig site where the rest of the vehicles from military to construction were parked. They dodged arrows and magical missiles narrowly as they stumbled their way through the heart of the base. The nomads and their wizards were all focus firing at their three but thanks to the covering fire of the rest of the youth. They managed to reach the armored safety of their land cruiser unharmed. Diaz took the driver's seat, clay rode shotgun and a B-Dyer climbed onto the back of the vehicle and manned the mounted. 50 calories machine gun. Vincent ignited the engine reviving the car back to its diesel-fueled life. Floor it. Clay yelled. Diaz punched his foot on the pedal and the land cruiser sprang away from the vehicle bay like a wild animal set loose from its cage. The ex-thief didn't bother trying to avoid the minor obstructions of construction signs and tables as he ran them over with the heavy weight of the land cruiser. The car soon managed to break out of the perimeter and out of the encircling orcs who dodged out of the way. A bee cocked the MG and opened fire at the orc horsemen, spraying them in a rainstorm of .50 caliber bullets. Yet the repetitive recoil of the machine gun was almost uncontrollable for his weary arms. Unlike the muscular Sergeant Crocker who can tame the high caliber automatic kicking movement of the MG, a B-Dyer couldn't seem to manage the beast that is a .50 caliber machine gun. His gunfire was of a chaotic mess the wildly flew everywhere from out to the sky. A horse, or landing on the plain soil causing a huge splash of dirt to kick up from the earth. Diaz's extremely violent handling of the land cruiser's wheels also didn't help too. However their hastily thought of plan threw a wrench in the plans of the orc nomads. The marauders' initial plans were to surround them in an encircled position similar to how they would control their herds then shot every single one of them down with their arrows. But having a metal beast suddenly burst out of their formation in a panic-like state whilst firing wildly invisible arrows that struck several of them down demanded their immediate attention. Over 80 of the horsemen broke formation and pursued the land cruiser under heavy machine gun fire. We got a tail V. A Bidia cried. Diaz shifted to lower gears as he pushed the land cruiser over a hill. It leapt up the natural ramp sending a several feet up into the air before landing back on the ground in a heavy stomp. He turned a hard left immediately after the wheels touched down giving a Bidia the stability he needs to fire the .50 California. He gunned down over two dozen of the Orsish nomads. As soon as the nomads and their beasts of war got close enough. Diaz would speed off again. What fucking roller coaster in the right? Diaz commented. Nice driving. Let's go. Clay smiled optimistically over their chances of survival. Meanwhile, back at the dig site, Samantha, Kane, Crocker, Iris, alongside King Martin, emerged from the tomb to be greeted with a rain of magics, arrows, and bullets. Elemental balls of energy flew across the scorched marked breadth of the site like city lights with the flickering of muscle flashes from the youth complementing the luminary display. Men struggling to survive every barrage of arrow and magic with a return fire of their own, polluting the battlefield in the sounds of war. The noise pollution, in stark contrast to the homely and quiet tomb below further angered King Martin from the rude awakening of his centuries-long slumber by these intruders. I will not stand idle while these marauders tamed my land with their disgusting feet. Martin shouted as he pulled out his enchanted staff and sword and began to cast a magic fireball and hurled it straight to a cluster of six orcs who were approaching danger close to a group of pinned down youth soldiers. The fireball narrowly missed the youth soldiers and impacted orc marauders in a brilliant outburst of fire killing them all. Hey, that was too close. Samantha reprimanded Martin. After I deal with these orcs I will deal with all of you metal people next. Martin raised his voice. Okay how about this? You help us deal with these orcs and I promise my men will leave. If we don't you can do whatever you want with us. Samantha promised. By your own words? By my words. Samantha swore. Just then a lone runner dashed towards Samantha. His face was weary with sweat from the heat of the battle. LT, you're okay. Oh shit. The runner cursed as he opened fire a burst of his rifle to King Martin. Being an undead, 
He was not affected by it by the slightest but the gusty force of the bullets that barely grazed his skeletal frame left him aghast. Whoa soldier, the zombie is a skeleton. Samantha informed him. Oh sorry, Fuxio we're surrounded. The runner apologized. I see that, tell me something we don't know. Samantha demanded. We counted 250 plus foot mobiles surrounding us right now. He cut to the chase and informed her of the balance of the battle. That's around 5 to 1 and they are uphill shit this is bad. Where's the rest of my squad? Samantha asked. I saw Diaz, Root and Clay make run for your land cruiser. They managed to draw some of the tangos away by driving off. They should come back soon. He replied. Fuck. Our west side. West side. He shouted pointing at the direction they are behind from. Strider group turned around to see that the Orsish nomads have rallied the remains of their raiding party into one giant blob formation. They were preparing to charge through the west side of the dig site and break through the defensive perimeter by the sheer weight of their numbers. Wagrkari e. The orc leader cried. He rode atop of him a giant spider mount that was over two stories tall. Damn it. Defend the western perimeter at all cost, Samantha ordered. Strider group double-timed their sprints as they rushed headlong into the embattled grounds as the defenders struggled to prevent a breakthrough. Crocker opened fire his LMG unleashing a 750 RPM barrage of suppressive fire taking down three dozen orcs riddling their green-skinned bodies to a bloody pulp of ballistic entry and exit holes. After his belt dried. Croc knelt down to undergo the long, by battlefield standards, reloading of his weapon. Iron Man. Watch out. King Martain warned him. One of the more monstrous mounts of the Orsish nomads, a giant lupine creature commonly called a battle wolf managed to survive Crocker's LMG fire and made a beeline straight for the murderer of its mounted owner. The lupine leapt at Crocker with its teeth aimed for the Brit's throat. Lewis managed to hold Wolf's mouth away from his vital organs for a good arm's length of distance. With the added strength of his exosuit, Crocker snapped the neck of the monstrous canine with his bare hands before tossing the corpse aside. You are strong Iron Man. King Martin apostatized. Meanwhile, next to Crocker, Iris was starting to sweat heavily through the heavy expenditure of her magical energies. She had used a great amount of her power to enchant her MGL with several magically enhanced explosive ordinances of fire, ice and lightning directed at the Orc Marauders. But now she is slowly on the verge of exhaustive collapse, and there are still over a dozen more to go. Iris we need more firepower, Samantha yelled. I, I, can't. I. She answered woozily. The vampire witch fell down on the ground and then slowly crawled to her friend Ken who sat down in low cover reloading his carbine. Iris. Ken yelled as he grabbed Iris and dragged her into his cover which barely concealed them from the hail of arrow fire. I am so. T. Yed. She softly said. Damn it. You need some of that mana. Ken worriedly replied. The vampire tried to muster up the mana from beneath the earth in King Martin's tomb but a sudden shock stopped her. They are my crystals. King Martin roared selfishly. Now, at a time like this, Samantha argued, feeling her body slowly failing from mana exhaustion, Iris became desperate to retain her consciousness. If her ancestral grandfather won't allow her to use his hoard of unbenilium, then there is only one way to obtain the energy she needs. I need. Blood. Iris muttered. What? Ken asked confusedly. Your blood. I need power. Your s, since. Please. Iris begged. No way. I'm not your blood bag. Ken protested. That is a direct order. We need that firepower now. Samantha yelled. With great reluctance, Ken gave in. He leaned his head to the right exposing the left side of his neck. I will make this hurt as little as possible. I am sorry if it is to come to this. Iris apologized. She moved on top of the Nigerian above his waist and gently caressed his neck. She smiled softly at her nightman, knowing full well that unlike the last time she bit him, it will be for everyone's own good. Hold still, she whispered. She unleashed the fangs in her mouth and plunged her teeth at Ken's neck. The Nigerian cringed in pain at the sharp incision of Iris' canines but the vampire comforted him placing her hand lovingly on Cairn's cheek. After a brief ten seconds that seemed to last forever, 
Iris let go her dental grip from Ken now reinvigorated with the power of blood. Her eyes turned bloodshot as she mustered the power within her onto to the MGL grenade launcher and opened fire. Each 40 times 46 mm shot from the magically enhanced youth weapon let loose a barrage of mystical energy that seared the flesh of the orcs and their monstrous cavalry. She felt godlike with her powers. Every time she bit another living thing, Iris can feel an addicting surge of power that exponentially empowered the potency of her magic. Human blood was by far the most effective on giving her this albeit temporary hour of power, thanks to her super-powered junkie rampage against the orcs. The youth got more time to reload and retreat deeper into the dig site, about a kilometer away from the action. The Strider group members inside the Land Cruiser were already about to finish off the last of their pursuers. Diaz managed to get some distance away from a significant amount of Orc nomads from the dig site to lift off some of the heat away from the defenders. Additionally, the static from Clay's radio began to fade much to the radioman's relief. HQ. HQ. This is Strider group, Clay said. This is HQ. We have been trying to call your team for about 30 minutes. Has the weather been giving you any problems over? The voice of one of the HQ commands radioman answered. Thank God it worked. Listen, the dig site for Malona's Unbinilium crystals is under attack. About 300 plus tangos and technicals are attacking us. I repeat the dig site is under attack. We need support over. Clay told HQ. Affirmative, rolling strike package to your AO at once. The voice in the radio asked. Interrogative, what happened to your communications earlier? I I don't know. Some sort of jamming or something. We need air support and we needed it ten minutes ago, Clay asked. Just hurry. Clay happily dropped the radio relieved that help is on the way. He banged the top of the land cruiser's ceiling to get Obedia's attention, who the redneck has just finished off the last few orc nomads who chased them. His hands let go of the mounted MG and began to shake violently to the same rhythm it produced with its recoil. My god, I am gonna let Crocker do all the super shooting from now on. I can't believe he does this for over 15 years. I'm shivering like a bad cold. Abidia said, Yay I fear you, but good shooting back ear old man. I buy you a round of when get back k? Diaz said, Sure thing, hey. Look over at the horizon. 10 o'clock, Abidia pointed. Diaz and Clay turned their heads to the redneck's direction and see that there are black dots slowly approaching at their position. Diaz, wanting to get a better look on what he is looking at grabbed a pair of binoculars. A spare one that Samantha keeps at the glove box of the land cruiser and placed his eyes on it. Those are Slay Aegean Legionnaires, Diaz exclaimed. He recognizes the blue and gold armor that the Slay Aegean Empire. The liege lords of Tyrian wore their heraldry which depicted a golden dragon figure head wielding, on one hand, a sword and the other hand a weighing scale which best signifies their dominion over most of the human cities and settlements in the Zanigrad. Diaz spotted a wide variety of units ranging from your standard infantry carrying a sword or shield bikes, or ranged weapons such as crossbows and bow and arrows. Then came the cavalry from lightly armored yeomen to the heavily armored knights. But what struck Diaz's eye the most was a half dozen of a particular creature that flew haughtily above the Slay Aegeans with their radiant wings. It was a squadron of hippogriffs and their knights. They had the head of an eagle, the forequarters of a vicious predatory cat and the hinds of a horse. They were adorned in armor that are tailor-made for their bodies from their heads, frontal breasts, backbone and hind legs. It was a relieving sight for Clay to see the local security forces responding quickly to the orc incursion. They must be responding to the orc nomads back at the dig, Clay said. Well, they're too slow, Abidia complained. Cut them some slack bed. They probably have yet to invent sliced bread. Diaz chuckled at the youth and Slay Aegean's huge technological gap. Let those natives fight it out for now, we got an opening. Rearm and regroup to better fighting positions while you still can now. Samantha ordered on her MIG. Affirmative Lieutenant Rose. One youth soldier responded on the radio. Over the rubble, 
pockets of the Federation's resistance emerged from their hovels and began to make a hasty retreat into more defensible sections of the dig site as the battle further escalates all around them. If I live through this guys, I got one hell of a story to tell to April when I get back. Abidia chuckled, he and the rest of the soldiers were now arising into higher spirits at this new development as their dire circumstance shone a ray of light amidst a sea of hostility. You talk to your gun, Clayt witched his brow on to the eye I mean, I am not judging you for anything fronty arrow, you, I named my guns after my wife and kid, Jarhead, Abidia explained, oh, 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 s sorry, Clay apologized, really, that's pretty, neat, the radio operator pushed to salvage his gaff, you are actually the first person who thinks me naming them after them to be neat, Abidia returned the humor. Quit chatting and start shooting. We got bogeys on our six. Diaz yells from behind the wheel. The marksman obliged and unleashed from the full Herculean strength of the Federation's industry onto their exotic pursuers. It did not take long for the sharpshooting hunter to realize he is unknowingly taking several dozen of scores of the most unusual of big game. A bee leaned back from the MG port so he could get a once and a lifetime view of the Stla Asian hippogriffs and the South Desert dire wolves. From what Iris has told them about them, hippogriffs are mounts of high ranking knights from the Stla Asian Empire. It is said that the monstrous mounts were bred near the mountains at the northeastern section of the empire alongside the dwarf clans. Hippogriff knights are assigned roles of light cavalry either as scouts hunting down enemy skirmishes or harassing their more equine counterparts. It was considered one of the most decorated type of soldiers in the Legion and a significant number of the Empire's reserves are stationed in border fortresses at the southeastern end of their dominion where Tyrion is situated in. As for the dire wolves, they sport short hair and have backs as strong as the most standard of mounts in Gleesia such as horses with a predatorial bite to match their favorite of Tamas, the nomadic hawks of the southern desert of Sanigrad. The redneck was about to doze himself off to a quick moment of shut-eye when he noticed that the shadow that the hippogriffs produce with their wings slowly enveloped him in ebony. Die demon, yelled the hippogriff knight. His man descended from the sky claws out and ready to strike down on Abidia. The marksman roughly ducked down to the MG port below to the safety of the squad's armored car barely escaping the razor talons of the hippogriff which only met the sun-kissed skin of the land cruiser's steel frame. The force of the monster's failed strike managed to slightly tilt the car sideways for a brief second. A bee felt was caught in a daze by the sheer surprise and ferocity of the hippogriff attack. His rough touch down to the land cruiser's passenger cabin was enough to plumb his elbows and his cheeks slightly with bruises. What th? Diaz tried to make sense of a B. Diaz falling down thinking he might have accidentally slipped from the MG port when suddenly the land cruiser began to violently be shaken back and forth in a sudden turbulence of force. Gelaork shrieked the hippogriffs as they tried to rip the armored bone from the land cruiser, but their feline claws only made insignificant cosmetic damage to the metal beast. From their right, left and front sides, the hippogriffs after realizing that their claws would not dent the sides of the vehicle proceeded to try and slash open the glass windows from each side. Fuck, fuck, fuck. Drive, 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 Clay shouted, shifting the gears out of parking and putting the pedal to the metal. The land cruiser let out its own mighty roar that shook the courage of the hippogriff knights. With a proud acceleration, the vehicle leapt from its stationary position causing the hippogriff that tried to claw it from the front to lose its balance and fall down in front of the bumper where it was immediately run over by the land cruiser, killing the rider and the mount under considerable tons of steel. HQ, HQ, mission update, the Stla agents are hostile I repeat the Stla agents are hostile. Clay cried to the radio. Say again? HQ asked. Slay Asian bird monsters and their knights are attacking us. There's a whole army of them chasing us too. 800 hundred foot mobiles bearing the Slay Asian Empire heraldry over. I need an ETA on that air support and reinforcements. Clay said. ETA 5 minutes. HQ said. Roger on last transmission. Clay dropped the radio. You hear that? 
The heat's coming, he reassured everyone. They better be. I ain't wanna die here. A be dice war. Me too, Diaz added in whilst he sped along the plains making a beeline for the dig site. The land cruiser covered the distance between them and the approaching Slay Aegeans at such an inhuman speed that even the Hippogriff Knights, who by their standards were the elite soldiers specializing in the tactics of Blitzkrieg were impressed by the deceptively uncanny speed of the Metal Demons. Yet instead of being discouraged by their otherworldly foe, it only steeled their determination to wipe out the demons off the face of Gleesia. For if they fail to hold the line for their civilization here, then surely the world will burn in an endless tide of chaos and destruction. Based on the youth's estimates, the third party will arrive by the dig site's doorstep at about four to five minutes. Charge! The leader of the Slay Aegean army yelled, after making their way past the Orc Nomads' corpses and the ruined dig site, Diaz spotted Samantha who was breathing heavily from the fatigue of intensive battle alongside the rest of their squad. He parked close to his commanding officer before he and his two companions disembarked from the land cruiser. Looks like you are alright, Diaz smiled. It's Lieutenant Rose Private. Formalities please, Samantha castigated. That's beside the point, but we got holy shit a zombie, Clay was about to inform her but he spotted King Martin who in his skeletal body moved behind her. The three previously separated youth soldiers opened fire at the ghastly king which the Martin twitched in reflex to the attack, but ultimately, he was unharmed by the attack. What is up with you? Do you always shoot at the first sight of a lich? King Martin irked. You, yeah we do. Actually, Samantha confessed awkwardly but you are a friend of Iris, so, you are at least for now a friend of ours, Diaz, Clay, Abidaya. This is King Martin he is a free, Samantha tried to inform her squad but she was interrupted by another burst of rifle fire from Diaz. Sorry but years of zombie movies and video games has caused us to evolve to shoot a tenny. Wait free what? Diaz inquired. King Martin is friendly lich. Mummy, King. Whatever it is, for now. Plus, damn it Diaz, trigger discipline. Samantha snapped. How long have I slept Iris? Did the people of Zanigrad still remember my name after I have long passed? King Martin asked his granddaughter. Many still do remember your name grandfather, and they fear it. Only your children still remember of your once mighty kingdom such as I. Iris answered. You can blame the holy witch hunters. I, I must rest now. So much energy used. After I bet Cain, the vampire which woozily replied, You bet Cain? Abidaya asked. His body shivered, he could still remember the cold teeth that sank onto his neck those weeks ago. Yes, and he is okay now. Thankfully it's all over. The orcs are either dead or fleeing. Iris answered. Yeah about that, Yume there's another army trying to kill us. Clay informed everyone. What? Samantha. Crocker and Martin yelled in unison. Slay Aegean's LT tried to attack us, and by the looks of it they wanted us dead really bad. I think one of them called us demons or something. The radio man explained. Imperials, my most hated of foes. They will surely raise and defile this tomb when they see that I am what is buried here. Martin gloomed as he hovered over to Iris. They most likely have a full complement of their soldiers marching at us as we speak my granddaughter. How long before they descend upon us? He asked. About five or four minutes at best. But I just managed to call HQ and they're bringing everything here to keep this place safe as we speak at around the same time they get here. Clay said. You managed to contact command? They better come soon. We just barely fended off the orcs. I'm down to only two clips left, Samantha commented on her rifle. Just three grenades for the MGL, Iris added. Half a belt for me, Crocker continued. And I can't feel my face. Kang cringed by the corner he rested his back on. Watch the skies. They're casting spells. King Martin suddenly shouted. Several balls of magical energy made rainfall down on the dig site impacting the ground in magical outbursts of the arcane energies. Looking across the horizon, Samantha grabbed her binoculars and spotted that several of the Slay Aegeans who were mounted on horseback were, 
They brought mages too. We need to buy ourselves time. Clay. Contact command I need an update on the reinforcements. Rose ordered. Clay picked up his radio again and began to dial up the device but all that was emitted from his device was more static. Damn it not now. Clay cramped. You stupid radio. He cursed at his failing gadget. The magic, it disrupts our comms. Kane said. Huh? Clay turned to the Nigerian. It was just a hunch I made after Iris used those practice rounds earlier. You getting loud static on your radio. I bet it's the ambient magical energies flying around us all over this planet that is messing with our comms. Kane said. We got to let command know of this when we get out of here. The engineer gritted. So it's the mage's fault I have been trying to contact HQ forever? Damn what kind of cruel planet is this? Clay lamented. Focus soldier. Right now, we need to buy ourselves time. The lieutenant rallied her squad. We got about three to more minutes before help arrives. Samantha asked. Indeed miss. Clay said. Okay. Clay keep trying to make contact with command. Diaz, you can drive right? Take Crocker with you to the land cruiser and try to slow down the Stla agents. Take some more land cruisers too by the way. Priority target the mages. And speaking of mages, Abidia grab your rifle. I'll spot targets. Defensive formations go. Samantha ordered. Yes ma'am. The youth said before dispersing. Crocker rallied several of the youth soldiers to board the other three land cruisers and man the mounted machine gun. Diaz followed suit with the Brit with his combative driving skill. The Strider Group's Sharmad car took lead of the four land cruisers, spreading themselves out evenly and opened fire at the Stla Asian Legion forcing them to raise their shields to block the barrage of bullets to no avail as the armor-piercing .50 caliber took down several dozens of legionnaires before their ammo reserves exhausted. Yet they have done their duty and managed to slow down a Bidaya in the other hand, unholstered Leah. He then went down to a prone position and flipped down his sniper rifle spypod and took aim by placing his weary eyes through Leah's scope. Samantha knelt down beside him with her binoculars at hand. She began to call out a bed's shots who with pinpoint accuracy. It wasn't that hard to find the mages as they wielded magical staffs wore distinctively colorful robes that stick out like a sore thumb at the approaching Stla Asian army which in contrast wore uniforms of armor and dark colored robes underneath. Every shot from a bed's rifle met its park with the sudden and gradual demise of the Stla Asian's combative magical capabilities plus lessened the interference for Clay's radio. That's it. Keep at M. I can hear HQ again. Command, Clay said. This is Major Holyfield. What the hell is going on out there? Benjamin said on the radio. Some sort of magical shit is jamming our radios or something. I need the call sign for our airstrike. Clay answered. Pegasus 3 to 5. Holyfield said. You mean Captain Carplian? Good to see her out now. Clay said. You know her? Samantha asked. Yeah. We share tables together in the mess hall back up at the Aurora. Great pilot she is. Whenever I call in an airstrike it's always her. Pegasus 3 to 5. Again and again. Clay answered. She is the best pilot in the Aurora. He added reassuringly. Okay call it in. Samantha said. Pegasus 3 to 5 this is Strider Group. Our position is pinned down by the IR Beacon Memphis. I authorize CBU strike on hostiles 400 hundred feet west from our position, Clay said. He reached into one of his pockets for an IR signal beacon and turned it on before placing it firmly on the ground. Affirmative Strider Group, making an attack run. The feminine yet Captain Carplian, designation Pegasus 3 to 5 replied. Lace your targets. Give them the beam. Samantha dropped her binoculars and turned on her rifle's laser designation. She and her wingman lined up vertically on the in-must battle formation of the Stla Asian Legion. Her hands inched slowly to the bomb release button as she slowed her descent to about 300 feet in altitude. Some of the Stla Asians curiously turned their heads at the two strange metal bird in gray coloring as it approached them menacingly, unknowingly not expecting such a bird no larger than one of their own hippogriffons could possibly do much against the staunch wall of spears of their battle formations. 
tuck tail. Their general said, bombs away. Carplian said, fox for guns, guns, guns. Her wingman added, hey Iris. Clay grabbed the vampire witch and her lich king grandfather's attention. I call this miracle, air strike. Clay raised his arms in an acted display of magical prowess as the pilots commenced their run. They unleashed their payload at the Slay Aegean Legionnaires, erupting the battlefield in a hail of bomb and heavy Gatling gun fire, easily decimating them from a rain of 30 mm uranium depleted bullets and fracturing cluster bombs, leaving a loud and inhuman roar as it passes. For the A-25 that Captain Carplian piloted may be of the size of a hippogriff, it had the power of a dragon within its mechanical soul. The end of times have truly come. A wounded Slay Aegean Legionnaire despaired before succumbing to his devastating injuries from the felling of a hail of arrows. Do not fear. Fight these demons. For the Emperor. For our nation. Charge. One of the surviving sergeants of the remaining survivors rallied. In their religious fervor the natives prayed to the heavens to their heathen gods before. Arms raised with their weapons gave out one last charge in an unbreakable display of their faith and hatred for those who would harm their civilization with their corruptive influences. No way they still are at it. Samantha said. This is Valkyrie one to one. Reinforcements has arrived. Clay's radio spoke. Over a half dozen Superos Prevl aircraft flew past Samantha blowing the wind behind her as they hovered above the battle weary youth. The tiles doors opened to reveal fresh faced youth soldiers roping down from the canaries and door gunners laying down machine gun fire to finish off the remnants of the Slay Aegean Legion heirs. Curse you. Demon scum. The last Slay Aegean bedeviled before he choked on his own blood and fell down to the flat dirt ground. He was merely only four meters away from Samantha before he was gunned down to Swiss cheese by the reinforcing youth. Those earthlings who were hunkered down at the dig site cheered Poroterra for their victory against overwhelming odds. We did it. Samantha cheered. She hugged Abedia and Clay together who gladly received her embrace. The reinforcements, after fully descending to the ground began to either administer first aid to the wounded or secured the perimeter for any stragglers with others to capture anyone surviving Slay Aegean alive for questioning. Both Major Holyfield and Colonel Polonsky would love to egg questions on why the border fortresses of the Slay Aegean Empire unprovokingly attacked the youth despite reassurances from Prince Klovich that they will not be hostile to earthlings. Lieutenant. A radioman from one of the reinforcing soldiers approached Samantha. Yes? Samantha turned to him. Major Holyfield and Colonel Polonsky would like to have a word with you. He answered. The radioman reaches from the pockets of his combat rigged and pulled out two ball-shaped curiosities from him. He then activated the anti-gravity projectors from the balls and throw them into the air where they floated above the ground 160 centimeters from the plain soil. Lieutenant Rose, the voice of Colonel Polonsky emitted from one of the balls. The floating orbs immediately projected the holographic images of both Colonel Polonsky and Major Holyfield. Colonel, Major, Samantha saluted. Battle report, Polonsky said, we were ambushed by hostile forces, first by these orcs and then by the Slay Aegean border garrison armies. She summarized, Corporal Clay has been trying to radio us early but the line keeps breaking. Do you have an explanation about this poor communication? Holyfield asked. It's just a theory from Mudwin sir but he believes that extensive outburst of magical energy can disrupt our electronic communications. That sounds preposterous. Those radios are state of the art. Can this magic really jam them? The Major pressed. Polonsky sighed whilst he placed his arm on his forehead. Trust me in this Major. But you'll get used to this we have seen so many things only the likes of fantasy writers can dream of, Polonsky said, well okay, perhaps I do need to open my mind more. So, you were able to hold the line against how many? First I got 400 then an additional 700 tangos if that's correct with you, Holyfield inquired. Indeed, Samantha nodded. Impressive, you're just like your father Lieutenant Rose, if you were still alive right now. I would have been the first to congratulate him on getting is just as a great team leader as him. Polonsky softly smiled. I am honored. Samantha light up her face in joy. Good to hear from that. But don't get your hopes up yet. 
I still need to consult with the other survivors for witnesses and the awarding committee before anything can be official, Holyfield said. Now, Galantry aside, have you secured Dr. Malona's unbinilium crystals? Polonsky asked the most important question that mattered the most to him above Strider Group's survival. Well about that. We came upon a complication where Samantha was about to explain until her left shoulder felt the cold and bony touch of death. Who are these other ghosts? King Martin asked mistaking the ethereal images of Polonsky and Holyfield of being other undead spirits like him. Oh my god. Holyfield recoiled. Zombie. The radioman exclaimed. He pulled out his pistol from its holster and fired several shots at King Martin, yet still like previously. The skeletal monarch was unharmed. I am starting to think the world after millennia I have slept now despises zombies and reanimated skeletons now. Tell me again why I agreed to let you live? Martin asked. His hands began to conjure necromantic magic. Relax please, let me do the talking, Samantha told him. This pretty fellow is King Martin. He is the owner of the cache of unbinilium crystals which so happens to be his tomb. And Iris grandfather, she explained. Greetings your majesty I am Colonel Polonsky and this is Major Holyfield. We are Lieutenant Rose's superiors or generals Polonsky greeted. Ah, it is good to see fellow men of arms. But let's us not dally now to why I am here at your presence. This is about my mana crystals. Or these unbinilium. You call them. King Martin spoke to them diplomatically. Well he said no we. Samantha was about to break out the bad news before she was interrupted by the skeletal monarch. I changed my mind. I will allow your people to have a small share of my mana crystal hoard for you to do what you please with, and to make my proposal better. I can even give you some of my old sages notes on their studies about the mana crystals to you. King Martin said. Well better than nothing. Thank you, your highness. Polonsky bowed. But what made you change your mind? It's Samantha Rose who stands beside me. She reminds me of me. King Martin answered. Oh how so? Samantha turned her gaze to the Lich King in a slight reddened amusement over his complimentations. She was like me when I fought against the hordes of Allbone the Steel Butcher. I knew I was not likely to win, but I fought for my people's right to live free, and Samantha, I can saw myself within her. I am assured that whatever she plans to do with the mana crystals I give her, I know it is for the best of reasons. Martin said. Well, that is good to hear from. I can't believe this is going to my resume but I agree with the ghost zombie thing. Polonsky awkwardly smiled. This is unusually generous even for me to hear from. There has to be much more than just how we defended your tomb from these marauders King Martin. Holyfield pushed to inquire. My kingdom has long since passed into dust many cycles ago. But if I had known my children and their children continues to live even if they lay scattered amongst Gleesia's sacred lands, then it is selfish of me to withheld aid for them in their plight. My granddaughter, Iris shall help you if she knows she can trust you and I hope, I too am making the right decision in entrusting you with some of my life's works. Martin answered, that is interesting to hear from you. Very well, we shall accept your generosity and return with our gratitude. Thank you for your contribution. Holyfield bowed before turning his head towards to Corporal Clay. Send out strike teams on all of Tyrion's border garrisons. I want all of them wiped by the end of the day. No loose ends. Holyfield ordered. Wait what? You can't be serious. Polonsky snapped. We need to cover this up. He turned to his co-leader. How do we explain to Prince Klovich that an entire garrison of border guards just vanished near one of our positions? We can kiss that peace treaty goodbye. He tried to reason. I must protest sir, is wiping the border forts out really our only option? Samantha said. Well does any of you have any better ideas when Prince Klovich inevitably finds out what just happened? Holyfield crossed his arms. No one dared say a word nor proposed an alternative solution. My plan still stands. My men will go out and eliminate the forts across the western border. Absolutely no survivors. Then when we have to talk to Prince Klovich about his defenseless borders saying it was the orcs who began.
began to step up their attacks on the principality. We then can offer him our assistance in containing these orc raiders. With some luck this will strengthen our alliance with the natives or at least keep them from getting angry at us. Holyfield said, sneaking a glance on one of the orc nomad corpses that littered alongside the Slaegian legionnaires. That is quite an order major. Polonsky gulped subtly hinting his silent aversion to the radical action of the Major. Watch your tongue Colonel, desk jockeying. As a militia commander makes officers like you soft Polonsky, you don't know what it's like being in the real army, I will hear no more from you about this subject. The native garrisons are going to wipe them out whether you like it or not. Holyfield stepped his foot on the ground. At least take some of the soldiers prisoners. Get maybe some information out of them about the attack they tried. Polonsky begged. Well, you do have a point on there Colonel. I will consider it. Yet I doubt the Geneva Convention will apply to them once I apply the right amount of pressure onto them. He chided back. Remember our duty you to the protection of the citizenry of the Federation above all else. Don't tell me that you grow sympathies with these aliens. Holyfield said no major. Please proceed with your operations. Polonsky lowered his head. Command out. Holyfield ended the transmission. Their holographic images disappeared leaving Samantha alone and distraught. Her initial joy over the possibility of her getting a medal was dashed aside by Holyfield's Machiavellian political move to keep the incident of what has transpired today under the rug. She was not someone interested in politics but she could feel, deep down inside, her instincts say that Holyfield's fail-safe plan is will have the opposite effect for the general protection of the people of the youth. Chapter 14 One Night in New Albany this is preposterous even by your standards Major Governor White rebuked. Indeed, added Director C. N. D. Popho of the Unsuza what you're saying is borderline genocide. After reports of Major Holyfield's unethical orders of annihilating all the Slaegian border forts across Tyrian surfaced thanks to the timely notification of several SEALs team members and Colonel Polonsky. A discreet emergency gathering of military and civilian officials was called in late that night. Governor White, Director D. Popo, Major Holyfield, Colonel Polonsky and other important officials were gathered in the Governor's Hall conference room. Unlike the upbeat hair of colonial fervor that recently was emitted by arrival of the second wave colonists, which is slowly being died down due to the youth's overextension of their governmental capabilities, was instead replaced with an aura of dreary uncertainty as news of the Slaegian's unprovoked attack on a unit of youth soldiers buzzed around the officials. A significant count of the officials, from military officers from the second wave who have worked with the Major closely for over a decade, to civilian officials who still had fresh memories of their disastrous planned fall sided with the extremists' hardline methods of Major Holyfield. It wasn't something out of character that the Major would consider given his history of being a cold, calculating and ruthless to any enemies of humanity's progress to the stars whether it is from hostile fauna in far-off worlds to the internal attacks of rebellious insurgents who dare test the unity of the youth's spirit. It is said that Holyfield himself is responsible for the extinction of so many violent carnivores and the total eradication of several terrorist groups and the man would gladly redo all his bloodied crusade of protecting humanity all over again if he could. He is without a doubt have no shame in his duty to his race, but now the Major stands in a pseudo-trial among his new peers. It was his first time being assigned outside to a brand new group official and their reception to his methods were hostile compared to the cold nods of his previous superiors who were more human-centric when it comes to the progress of mankind's colonial efforts. Have you gone soft after meeting extraterrestrials governor? Against your own race? Holyfield put his foot down, I am not major, and I will never do that to the youth. These aliens are as human as us, with a few exceptions but still. He shot back. Why say they are like us? When they dabble in MR magic like children holding a knife, these people are dangerous for the well-being of this colony's safety. No existence. You know we are outnumbered one too. God knows how many of these kinds of mages are out there, 
The cities that the UAVs are scanning now is growing in count by the minute. It's us versus the entire world for all we know. Holyfield shot out his point. According to Iris, mages are quite rare and glee easier. From her estimates about one in every twelve people. Insana Grad shows various capabilities of siphoning magic from the Unbinilium crystals. Polonsky argued. That is still a worrying number, if you also take into the account that the mages can conjure pretty much whatever they can come up with their minds. You saw that fire golem that attacked you, Iris and her abilities to enchant magic to our grenade launches, and don't get me started on magic emissions being capable to jam our radios. Plus, that information is only applying to the mages of the Slaygen Empire. Who knows what kind of other unknowns this magic can be wielded by. I remembered that Iris, during that introductory seminar, she described these elves from a continent west of Zanagrad called Elfilnora where the locals, are more potent and sensitive to magic. What happens if they turn their powers against us? You're saying like the elves are a bunch of power hungry warmongers who would gladly zap us to death with lightning bolts. According to the reports, the elves usually keep to themselves and are rather accommodating albeit a little bit arrogant. I never said they are power-hungry warmongers Polonsky, I am saying that they are potentially a bigger threat than the Slaygens who have just attacked us for no reason. Holyfield raised his voice. The bystanders in the meeting all murmured to each other over the two high-ranking military officials' statements. Silence. Governor White yelled deafening the entire room. Holyfield. Polonsky. He turned to two. You both make good points on the dangers and sureness of Benham III. But right now, you are both getting yourselves off track from why we are here today. We cannot let go of the fact that this Slaygen Empire had their men try to attack our soldiers but we cannot afford to ruin our already established diplomatic efforts with one of the Slaygen's own vassal states. It must be a misunderstanding. I doubt it's deliberate. Jeremy scolded. The room once again filled with murmurs for a fleeting moment after the governors. And if you are wrong? Holyfield questioned back. How about this? Some middle ground for both of you two? So, look here. I both agree to what your points about what both of your points have in common is that we are all new to this world. We are the aliens here this time and they are the natives. It's only smart that right now we should focus more on consolidating our foothold in Gleesia. My proposal would be to reduce the number of sorties within 50 km radius from New Albany then reassign them into patrol groups. I don't want any more expeditions until we got this figured out. Silence entered the two commanding officers and then they bowed down to the governor's superior authority over them. So how will you investigate this incident? Holyfield asked. There's already a man on the case, Inspector Reed. The governor softly smiled confidently. Dash the next day, by the outskirts of New Albany Dash. The sudden urbanization of the once empty plains and hills of southern Tyrian from outside the Verdon Valley forest surprised Aliathra. When she first arrived in the Principality last month, the only sounds her sensitive leaf-shaped elvenears can hear were the soft brushing of trees, the light crackling of water from the valley's numerous creeks and the casual timing of numerous animal noises. These sounds were replaced by the vehement bubbling of large metal beasts that shifted the land to the ways it sees fit, turning the land from an uninhabited plot of land into abruptly cropped up white spires with glittering glass that reflected the Gleesian sunlight like a lighthouse's beacon. It reminds me of home. No, focus. This must be a demon trick. They know I am homesick. I won't let them have me. The elf woman reminded herself of her perilous mission. She was given special permission from these humanoid newcomers to enter in their home of New Albany. They promised her a steady supply of food and to allow her to indulge in her curiosities of the strange paintings that Abby Dyer and Vincent described as a photograph. All of which are just diversions for her. She knows that this is the once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to explore the inner workings of these otherworldly people. She will have to play it safe however. She is going to be waist-deep into enemy territory and failure could be disastrous for the forces of her world's order. Greetings. State your business here. A youth soldier stopped her. Just as she was about to pass by the first set of houses made by the otherworlders, Eliathra was stopped by a trio of olive-garbed men. 
It was some sort of security checkpoint. All non-UF civilians must be processed through before entering New Albany. Another UF soldier added. They carried black iron sticks in similar construction to the ones that she saw Abidia and Vincent wielded to fend off the sea devils. Their jade-colored camouflage can easily blend into the forest woods of any temperate climates and the weave of their clothes were as thick as a cow who was fattened up for slaughter. Their heads, as the elf emphasizes were of weary tension as if they were alerted to something dangerous. She almost wanted to ask what's with their faces but she caught her tongue beforehand. Asking too many direct questions would make her stand out from the myriad visitors who were being processed by the checkpoint guards. I am here to meet a farmer, she quietly answered. Name? The soldier asked. Abidia.mroot. I wish to buy his crops. Okay please stand still, he told her. Her colleague, of a physically imposing height slowly approached her with a strangely shaped black knife that looked crudely made that it looked no more than a prop for a play or a child's toy. It had text painted yellow that says Super Detector written on the knife's blade. The elf felt tense seeing the weapon being casually held around without any care, respect or discipline unlike her kind who treat their weapons as if an extension of their bodies. With a twitch of his finger, the knife began to emit a soft but sharp sound before the man slowly reached out his arms. Aliathra reflexively stepped back to avoid the blade but the soldiers held her hand albeit instead of hostility. The firm grip of the hand was of comforting warmth, or maybe it's perhaps that the one gripping her hand was another woman of humanoid shape. Relax, it's just a scanner miss. The soldier lady reassured her, not wanting to be set back. The elf princess relaxed herself. The guard carrying the scanner knife promptly began his probe. Just the feeling of the scanner's electromagnetic field emissions made the elf's skin crawl, raising the tiny hairs on her ivory skin up as she shuddered. Then the scanner reached into the back of her waist where she keeps an emergency dagger for her own self-defense. A-H-H. She screamed as the knife peeped upon the contact of her star metal bladed dagger. The magically crafted blade made by Ethylan's finest blacksmiths screeched upon the disturbances of the scanner knife's magnetic field. The shock of the sensation that reflected from her dag collapsed her on the hard rocky asphalt road of the other world's settlement. Whoa, female soldier said backing off. Are you okay miss? Hang on. Wait I think. Her larger colleague coldly stepped in front of her and reached into the back of her waist. Knife. The man said before quietly placing the elven dagger on a great ray. That's mine. Aliathra objected. You will get it back. No weapons are allowed from this point on. Here take this. Present this paper to us and you will get your nice looking knife back. The soldier said. And Root family homestead is fourth left then follow the road all the way. You can't miss them. The woman said. The guards moved aside from the elf clearing her way to New Albany. Oh, if you happen to be a mage of sorts, don't even try it. The towering guard with the scanning knife warned, Welcome to New Albany, the first colony of the United Federation of Earth. Being disarmed has already caused the elf to go uneasy from the danger she is now in. Not only is she in enemy territory, she is also completely defenseless and if the guards' words are to go by, any kind of magical conjuration will only get her fished out by the numerical superior other worlders. From this point on, she will have to scout out the entire colony without too much risking. Remembering the directions to Abida's house, Aliathra began to take her first steps into Metal Demon territory. Previously before her, she had casted several anti-demon wards that will dispel and push back any demonic influences that try to get a hairbreadth away from her but curiously to her confusion. They haven't gone off. Are the demons holding back? As she walked in New Albany's streets, the Romanesque structures she passed by were nothing that she has seen, heard nor read about ever before. They were built like finely carved out trees with sleek curvatures elegantly constructed by only of some owners skilled as one of Eth Island's finest carpenters. Yet instead of trees, 
Aliathra noticed that they were made instead of a mixture of steel and stone, materials that are extremely difficult to carve such incisions, and every building she sees are of similar designs with notable deviances for individual distinction between each structure such as giant signs that were posted next to the house's front doors that magically lit up in a variety of strange shapes and colors such as green, orange and purple. Another thing she noticed is that all of New Albany's houses were covered with glass window sills. Glass, based on her knowledge was a luxury item, due to the painstaking production process the glass blowers have to do. Only afforded to the highest ranking nobles and they were more of a novelty decoration, a status symbol. But the other worlders who look uncannily similar to the humans of Zanigrad, every one of them had glass windows on their respective buildings. Her only explanation she can think of was that these other worlders or United Federation of Earth were master mages who can control glass, metal and stone to allow them to construct such a sophisticated settlement in such a short period of time. Already, they heavily outclass us by the gods. I pray that I can get out of this place alive and untainted by the ruinous ones. Whilst once again deep within her own thoughts, the elf almost failed to recognize that she was already right in front of her destination. The Root family homestead. It wasn't that hard for her to figure out that this is where Abedia lives by the fact that upon the winding road that led to a simple two-story house that had a windmill and similar theme to the rest of the New Albany settlement, there was literally a sign that arched over the path saying Root Family Homestead. Slightly emboldened by her good progress so far, she walked inside the property to her awe. The structures that surrounded the homestead were built via a tremendous amount of glass which is worthy enough to honor a grand cathedral to the elven gods with its shimmering elegance. In these houses of glass, Aliathra noticed that they contained not people, but plants, crops, that were lined up neatly and being generously sprayed sprinkles of water that somehow magically reigned within the glass houses despite being a sunny afternoon outside. As she got closer to the house, Aliathra saw two familiar figures chatting with one another. And here's the last of the food the mess hall requested. Abedia said handing over a box to Vincente Diaz. Thanks Abed. Diaz nodded as he turned around only to be greeted by a beautiful feminine face of ethereal beauty that not even the most top-line supermodels back in the core worlds can ever hope to achieve, naturally or otherwise. Oh Aliathra. It's good to see you. I honestly thought you won't be here. Abedia greeted a warm smile. Greetings again bearded one. I remembered your offer and I have come to your farm for some food. I have ducats. She replied. Well I got plenty of food. Some familiar with these gleesons and some not. Let me just get it. Abedia said. He turned back to his house, disappearing inside the building for a brief moment before re-emerging with a wooden crate filled with a bounty of foodstuff. From what Aliathra can decipher from the mysterious box, she saw what she can best describe in the following, two varieties of red orbs. A yellow rod with multitudes of husk-like dimples that covered the rod and a bundle of tiny green fruits that curved into the shape of a crescent moon. Seeing such a delectable bounty before her made her almost forgot her mission, and that moon-shaped fruit looked so tempting. You sure about tasting that first? Abedia questioned. It's shaped like the moon. Aliathra said. That's a chili. Makes your tongue go on fire. Diaz said. Are you serious? She snapped. Yes and no. The last time someone tasted a chili she refused to eat anything else for a day. Abedia informed her. Oh the look on Iris face. I should have taken a photo of that. Anyway, elf girl. Instead of those how about this? Abedia removed the chilies from Aliathra's hand and replaced it with one of the yellow rods with dimples. This is corn, it's like your wheat grains but more resilient. Plus, it can be eaten immediately without the need of a mill, he said. Grasping the ear of corn, Aliathra had never seen such a crop in her entire long life. The cob was about the same length and size as her slim womanly biceps. She was so astonished that she had no idea how she can consume it. Abedia, seemingly knowing what her thoughts were, demonstrated to her by gesturing his hand adjacent to each other and grasping the air like holding onto a handlebar before reaching into the airless gap that represent the corn with his mouth and began to gnaw like a rat. 
taking his cue, Aliathra followed him and did what she was told. When her teeth and mouth contacted the corn's flesh, it was rather disappointing in terms of taste for the elf. It tasted like a cold wheat gruel a commoner would eat every meal sweetened with a small hint of honey to give an illusion of flavor. Additionally, the curls of the corn which that came of the cob with her gnawing teeth had an elastic mushy texture into it. It's bland, Aliathra said. Maybe this could help. Abidaya gave her a stick of butter and a butter knife to help spread the dairy produce around the cob. Grabbing the knife and plastering the golden colored saturated piece of fat on the light yellow flesh of the corn, Aliathra made her second bite into the cereal grain. Her tongue sensed to her surprise this time that the butter had hints of saltiness beneath its golden cream. It complemented well with the mellow sweet taste that was naturally embedded into it. She couldn't help but softly smile at her meal. Much better, Abidaya said. Yes indeed bearded one, Aliathra said. Hey daddy, is that Uncle Vinny? Abidaya's daughter April bursted outside, surprising everyone. Hey little April, you doing well? Diaz asked her. Mrs. Kerbapple said that I am doing good in school. April smiled before turning to Aliathra. Daddy, who is that? She asked her father. Oh just a new client of mine tasting some of mommy's plants. Abidaya answered her. She looks like a princess. Like from my fairy tales, she said. Aliathra's heart sank deep from April's armor-piercing declaration. She painstakingly made her royal lineage a secret among only the most trusted individuals in Senegrad when she left her homeland. Her parents, Alongside her brother and older sister were mostly in the spotlight in parties and social gatherings organized by the nobility. Although she was similarly dressed and groomed compared to her family, in elf society, most if not all the attention would be directed to the elder child being Lunafria who is being groomed to take over the crown when her mother is gone. She doesn't blame them. But she still detests her social isolation. She wasn't tired of her only companions being her handmaidens and palace staff. She was simply bored of her encaged life as an elven maiden of the Ethylon Entente. Yet to be called out right now by none other than a child only made her instincts scream to run. You do sure look beautiful. Tell me, are all elves as pretty as you? Abidaya said. Well by human standards we are as the birds would sing beautiful beyond any belief, but by my people's standards, I am average looking. She lied, faking a sense of humility. She couldn't risk standing out even more right now and she has to keep the attention away. Could these people recognize me? Well I'll take your word for it. Miss Abidaya said, the princess and the redneck promptly negotiated a fair price for three pounds worth of Abidaya's corn. She exchanged a dozen ducat coins that Abidaya can use for his own use or exchange them for the youth's credits in a specially made foreign exchange bank in downtown New Albany. That was close. So Aliathra, you still interested on getting that photograph that you're curious about? Diaz asked her. Photograph? Aliathra turned around in bafflement. You know, like a painting that can be made instantly? You said you wanted to get one. Besides, the local photographer is being bitching. I mean wanting to document so many stuffs here in Ben I mean Lee easier. Diaz stuttered. Ben what? Aliathra asked befuddled by the alien terminologies. Yeah long story. So how about this? I can give you a tour of downtown New Albany while I drop this box at the army mess hall. Then you can get that photograph if you still want it, he proposed. Absorbing the man's words, Aliathra could only convey even more confusion. How is this demon offering her a chance to fundamentally do her entire infiltration mission with at no risk of a cost like she was being pampered by some princely suitor in one of the Eth Island elite's prestigious parties? Tours, food tasting and fantastic sights. Are they even demons at all? For the first time in her entire race's history, a high elf began to feel how the words of the humans would say confusion for there is no word in the elven vocabulary that would best describe her uncertainty. Her people, even before their split were very sure of their supremacy amongst the younger races. They had the greatest collection of every knowledge imaginable in the great library back in her homeland. Could all of what she has known for her entire life be wrong? No focus. The world is counting on you Aliathra. 
The humans need to know everything about this place of incongruous structures. She stopped herself yet again. The elf continued to hear her own instinctual conscience behind her head urging her to continue when she was in doubt or unsure of what to do next. Perhaps it's the stress of her first assignment which was additionally been weighed more by the fact her homeland can't assist her due to heightened tensions at the borders of the Black Tree Pact plus she was assigned to the task of being sent to help the humans fight demons. Although she is equipped with the spells in knowledge to fight such creatures, she has yet to obtain any real knowledge on fighting demons. She regained her womanly posture in front of Diaz again to not risk tipping him off of her distress and turned around with a fake smile that she would practice to comfort the eyes of all the nobles of Eth Island. She is going to double down on her risky venture and by all of the elven gods, she will succeed. I would gladly take a tour of New Albany with you. Thank you for the kind of gesture, she politely said. Maybe April is right on you being a princess and all. My lady, shall we go? He sarcastically bowed while carrying the box. The elf couldn't help but chuckle at the demon's attempt on humor. Even if this one knows or not she really is the youngest daughter of the elven royal family, she could sense that his comedic gesture was surprisingly for a demon, genuine. The two walked out to the B. Dyer's farmstead with their purchases and left with them the waving farewells of the owner and his daughter as they departed for downtown New Albany. Dash meanwhile back in Herring Point Dash, the Emperor of Slaeja couldn't believe the courier would tell him such heavy bearing news. An entire garrison of legionnaires, some of the best soldiers who pledged themselves upon the arm doctrine of rapidly deployed defenses was completely obliterated by the steel demons. He had barely prevented his generals on calling a full invasion of Tyrian but he couldn't risk causing a panic amongst the citizenry lest the damage from their riots would cause even more damage than the apocalyptic charge of a demon incursion. Grandmaster Rowan had advised him on the matter that he needs to buy him and his mages more time to figure out what's their next move. From what he has heard, an agent. An elven woman from his fair weather friend the Eth Island on Taunt Elves is performing subterfuge actions throughout the area where the reports say the demons are. He couldn't believe that the other worlders were just several miles south of the fortress city of Tyrian. Yet surprisingly, he didn't have much panic coming from merchants who have came from the vassal state. In common, they said that metal people have been quietly sitting idly in the principality for several weeks now. He didn't know if Prince Klovich, a man who has his fair share of fighting off foreign invaders from the east are even fighting these demons. Do you think the prince and his city can hold long? I will need time to gather most of the legions and prepare our best exorcists. We will need to throw everything we got if the news about the destruction of the western garrisons are of merit. Emperor Alden cracked his fist. It survived the great Hawk Khan's hordes, necromancer attacks the civil war and gods know how many earthquakes. I am sure he can hold for more than a month at best, one of his advisors said, yet these demons are practically right at his doorsteps and they seem to be as powerful as the legends told. He needs help, right at the double, his advisor said, you are right. Alden stood up from his throne. Fetch me the royal scribe and my imperial seal. I need to make a letter immediately, Alden ordered. Everyone in his throne room bowed briefly before hurriedly running around to fulfill his imperial majesty's orders. Alden crashed himself back into the cushioned comfort of his brilliant throne and placed his finger on his head. His suspicion of the state of Tyrian and its puppet king irked him. Why would Prince Klovich not send out any distressing calls for help from him? He had just hoped that at best the demons had only been very efficient at cutting off communications between Tyrion and the outside world, at worst. He doesn't even want to think about it lest his aging body crashes through so much burdening stress. Dash back at New Albany, Dash. It is now 6 p.m. or around sunset at New Albany and the night lights flickered to life transforming the steel-constructed town into a luminous star in the middle of the slowly darkening Tyrian countryside. It is also said or more of complained by the Tyrian city dwellers who live nearby that they can see New Albany's lights from the citadel. From afar, it did indeed look like the youth colony is glowing brightly in white but upon a closer look, 
Thanks to the new energy reactor from the second wave colonists, electricity flowed throughout the settlement, allowing the inhabitants from the simple prefab homes lights to the flashy neon advertising signs that attract the denizens of New Albany to their establishments like moths. Next to the civilian enclave was the military base, the youth's main foothold in Gleesia. The soldiers with their black metal staffs that they called firearms secured the area alongside small-sized iron birds and boars that moved obediently to the whims of their emerald masters that which are known as unmanned drones. Aliathra espied from the iron fence that separated her from a large field that had the same asphalt road that she would see horseless iron carriages roll themselves around in. But why would there be another road that is separated from the rest? Her answer came in when from the distance, a dark shadowy figure in the shape like the great eagles from her homeland, it descended upon the isolated road from the horizon of the setting sun. The elf couldn't get a clear bearing on the giant bird due to the fleeting glimmer of the last few minutes of sunlight as it descended. That's one of our planes, Diaz said. He was earlier delivering the dinner ingredients for the mess hall and told the elf to stay outside of the military base whilst he finalized the delivery. Aliathra would have if she were anywhere else would try to infiltrate the base but she couldn't find any kind of discernible weakness that she can penetrate the perimeter. Every inch of the other world as barracks was equally guarded by soldiers who would stare at her with tension. She could do nothing but keep her distance from the men in green to avoid breaking her cover. A plane? She asked like a very big bird. Diaz widened his arms and followed the flapping motions of a flying animal. Only it can't flap though. How can it fly without moving its wings? Aliathra asked again. Diaz paused for a moment, dumbfounded on how to explain to the elf in order to match her primitive understanding of science and technology. It breathes a lot of air so it can blow it out. Really, really hard. Diaz awkwardly answered, like a balloon. She giggled at the look of his inelegant stature. Unlike the manners of the elf nobility that she grew bored of due to elves' practice in cunningness whether it's through the honeyed words of the flattering courtier to the political machinations of diplomats, she could never understand why her sister and brother enjoy such activities. Maybe because she was born the youngest and thus not expected much to be used as a playing token in the grand board game that is called elven politics. Yeah, something like that. Diaz smiled again letting his amateurish moment have its moment. So, you want to head to downtown? We can go to the photo studio now if you're still up to it. I can even show you the governor's palace where Jeremy White takes office. It's quite a sight, Diaz said. Hearing about Diaz's carefree disclosure of such an important sounding building made Eliathra instantly jump to his arms. In a fabricated act of ingratiation in similar vein to a wide-eyed broad being overly infatuated by a domineering paramour, I would love to go there. Her voice suddenly dropped coldly as she tugged Diaz's arms and torso. She wanted to show Diaz that she was deeply interested by his dashing cachet, but the moment her skin touches his body, she felt something uncanny within him. Oh the life-giving magics of this world, she sensed an unnatural presence within Diaz. Discreetly, Aliathra used a minuscule expenditure of her magic to detect the life of her host. To her horror, she found that Diaz's body is nearly completely made out of not the tender and delicate wrappings of living flesh, but a mixture of alien metals and undiscernible materials in a ghastly parody of a living creature. Her mouth unconsciously was left to gape by the abrupt realization of this human is secretly made of metal in the inside of its paper-thin husk. You seem shocked, Diaz said, forwarding himself at the elven maiden. Aliathra reacted with a fearful step back, not daring to move another muscle further lest the demon snatches her up and has his way with her. Your. Body. It's, she stuttered. Augmented? Is that what you're trying to say? It's pretty neat what Aparo Industries did to me, Diaz boasted, ignorant that Aliathra is not surprised but utterly petrified of him. Or Eggmented? She questioned the foreign term. Are you some sort of monster I never heard of? Monster? No, I am as human as everyone in this town. So yeah, I have some metal inside me so what? 
I am young and alive as ever. Diaz reassured her. Is everyone like you, flesh from the outside but metal inside? No, not everyone can afford or are brave enough to get augmentations. I have this because of my previous job. Diaz stopped himself to not give away his illicit background. What was your job? Aliathra pressed again in curiosity. Well you yeah. My job is. Diaz scratched his head as he collected within himself enough of the correct words to expel. I am a item fetcher. Diaz heaved his crude explanation. You collect things? Like some of those fetch quests back in the Adventurers Guild? Yeah. Mostly very valuable stuff from very hard to reach places like money, jewelry, rare consumables, data banks. Data banks? She interrupted. Something like tomes that contains words inside it. You set it up on a special machine to be able to read it. Like a memory crystal? Maybe, if that's what you call it. It's a very high risk yet lots of pay. I miss Marlboro. Diaz mumbled. Marlboro? My old muscle car. Think a horse. In fact, I have a photo of him right here. Vince reached into his hands and grabbed his smartphone. The very same one Aliathra saw him take a photograph of her. He twiddled his thumbs to the gallery folder of his device and scrolled down his wide collection of digital pictures he has taken throughout a span of a few years. When he was captured on that unfortunate police raid, his phone was confiscated. But after his conscription and a mandatory mobile data hack and wipe later, Diaz got his phone back clean off all his old underground contacts or, or at least for now if he can be resourceful enough to reconnect the dots again. Here it is, my Marlboro. Diaz turned his phone to Aliathra. She grabbed the rectangular device and held it firmly with her lithe fingers. She was initially amazed by the surface texture of the smartphone being of polished glass that is as smooth as a silk dress, as for Diaz's Marlboro picture. His horse had a metal frame painted like a tangerine dress for a summer festival with an intricately designed image of a mighty stallion in a speedy gallop. Marlborough's A's were completely white yet the potential of great luminous light made Eliathra suspect that there is more to those eyes than what she can see from the virtual image. Another distinct feature of Marlborough was its wheels. Unlike a normal steed, this horse ran on circular wheels for its movement. Lastly, the entire photo was garnished by none other than a smiling Vincente Diaz, arms spread out touching Marlborough's hood while wearing a dazzling biker jacket decorated by glittering roses in the cloth. I am actually very impressed. Aliathra complimented. Something an elf rarely would say to a non-elf. Yeah, I chose the car parts and paint myself. I meant the jacket. She stopped him. Oh, yeah that was limited edition. Glad I got the last one before it went out. Damn it, I know miss my nice jacket now also. He sadly sulked. Don't feel too bad. I am sure once you finish your conscription you can get those nice things back. She comforted him by caressing his arm. Her velvety skin collided with the contrasting touch of Diaz's rugged metal arm. She has begun to slowly understand these other worlders yet she still has her fears of them. She has remembered from her first time seeing what the other worlders can do, their superhuman abilities to move in such inhuman speeds, their tenacity against hopeless odds and lethal proficiency with their strange black staffs that they call guns. When it comes to her recent tour or more like a cleverly arranged stakeout in plain sight of the youth. Aliathra learned that their monstrous machines that made fools of the terrain from mighty flying machines to great wheeled plows that terraformed the earth with the strength of gods, if the human races, or any other race such as her fellow elves fought against these aliens, it would be like a single man trying to stop a landslide, they could all just squish every last one of them like ants. The very thought of all of that happening made her heart drop. Will you be making more of these places like New Albany? Aliathra asked him, no longer caring for subtlety. Initially yes, but after the discovery of native primitives, i.e. people like you, the bigwigs have temporarily halted any plans of expansion. From what I heard, they are cooperating with Prince Clovich to have his people and the entire Tyrian Principality land integrated into our way of life. He answered, What is your way of life? Who are you? My social studies teacher? He chuckled but his joke fell to a confused Aliathra. Sorry, you remind me of someone when you asked that. Values wise, 
we wish to turn the people of Tyrian into lawful, God-fearing and freedom-loving people just like us. As for material stuff, some engineers are working on completely covering the dirt roads of Tyrian into full-fledged asphalt to allow vehicles, our horses to move freely around them, which additionally, will be eventually used by the locals so that they can move stuff around faster when compared to those old looking wooden carriages. What's wrong with wooden carriages? We stopped using them about less than 300 years ago. In a way, you are all like us back then, Diaz said. We were just like you, Aliathra asked. Her head was now aching from the multitude of insights and new questions that stormed her head. We used to live farm, trade like you. We used to sleep under thatched roofs of crudely made wood that can be burned down easily. We used to fear for our lives but thanks to the power of guns we have the ability to fight back for food. We were once bound to the mercilessness of nature who kill our crops and make us suffer through hunger but now we have exponentially more food than any human can count on. Diaz said, and these are all true. Aliathra faltered in her speech. Her head began to feel so light-weighted. Yes, but it's only scratching the surface of what we are all capable of. We got ships that can cross through stars, video projection as accurate as seeing someone right in front of you, weapons that can kill entire cities in one move in the pizza. To die for. You still want to go to the photo studio? You don't look too good miss. He noticed the distress expression from Aliathra's face. Her ivory skin glowed pink in high blood pressure and sweat reflected from its surface. Inside her elven brain however, her mind, body and soul were being torn apart by so much eldritch knowledge being rapidly shoved down her. It caused her footing to lose balance and her breath to shut down as the elven princess turned spike collapsed to the asphalt floor to a horrified Vincent. Dash an unknown time later. Dash. Aliathra opened her eyes slowly to be welcomed in a bright flashing light. She could feel her body was lying down on a mildly soft surface that molded to her shape and bodily movement. The sounds that the elf hear were of the sound of voices of people in a state of impassioned pain. She quickly shut her eyes closed for the elf now refuses to believe the impossible. Am I dead? Did the demons killed her? Did some malevolent influence creeped into her heart when Vincent told her about all those spine-chilling accounts that caused her body to touch down in some twisted form of demonic corruption? Is her soul damned forever to whatever plane of existence that these other worlders come from? What will they do to her? The elf princess sobbed of the fact that she had just died alone, in foreign soil and not at the comforting grips of her loved ones or people. She began to fall into despair over the realization that she is now down in what her people would call Udanambar or the Hell World where those captured by the demons are taken and enslaved to. And to make it all worse, elves, especially those who can harness magic are prized for their affinity to it. Goddess save me. Her eyes, still wide shut, Aliathra shook violently from her spot as stress began to overflow inside her like wolves cutting apart their prey. No, she screamed as she thrashed her memory foam bed. Vincent, after seeing Aliathra fall down out cold, had barged in with her to the new Albany Military Hospital's emergency department. This is also the new post of Dr. Hannah Lee Hainanol where she was assigned to the lofty but very strenuous job of being the chief of the emergency department of NAMH, coordinating the distribution of medical supplies and implementation of emergency procedures to stabilize the critically injured. She was at first surprised the position was given to her, but the hospital director told her that it was her way of comforting the pain of the dying ailing and afflicted in their time of need is what got her in the position to begin with. According to her, she was like the reincarnation of Florence Nigthingale returned in the flesh of a kimchi-smelling Korean woman with double eyelids and a joyfully childlike smile that can warm the heart of even the coldest of individuals. Even from Major Holyfield. Dr. Lee Hainanul jumped at the panicking elf and tried to restrain her. But Aliathra stubbornly resisted. Get away from me demon. She shrieked. Calm down. Dr. Hana pleaded. Diaz and another one of the doctors in the emergency department assisted her by pinning down their weight on Aliathra, careful to not actually harm her. Was she like this when you took her in? Hana asked Vincent. 
No, she just fainted after I chatted some things to her. Diaz answered. What kind of things? Hana pressed. I just told her about our technology a bit. And how awesome it is. Diaz stiffly said. Are you an idiot Diaz? Telling the natives about our advanced technology? This poor woman probably fainted because she was horrified by what you said at best. And at worst? What if this woman was a spy or something? Hana scolded. I thought that if I impress her with some non-sensitive but juicy facts about the youth she would be more receptive to us. I mean remember the hearts and the minds campaign? Diaz said. Can you just leave that to the professionals? Hana spat at him before turning her head to their patient. The medical scanners attached to Aliathra's bed spiked in activity due to her frantic motions. From what Dr. Lee Hainanul can interpret, the patient, although not sporting any kind of physical injury or ailment has had a surge in stress activity. Her heart rate and blood pressure were through the roofs and the monitors beeped rapidly to show it. No, please don't eat me. The elf cried. Tears leaked from her closed eyes. Nineth, mother goddess save me. She desperately began to pray in her native tongue. I think she thinks she's dead or something. Diaz said. Hang on. Let her go. Hana yelled. What? Just let her go. She yelled again. Vince and the other emergency room attendant took their hands off of the elf, leaving the distressed woman in the hands of Dr. Lee Hainwell. The woman, after the invasive grasps of the men retreated from the touch of her body, shuddered fearfully but ultimately less vigorously than earlier but she could still feel a pair of hands holding her body. Now free to work her charms. Hana changed tactics. Instead of holding the girl firmly on her soft memory foam bed, she loosened her grip. This consequently decreased the number of violent shakings the elf woman had but her heart rate was still beating at an unhealthy rate. It's okay little one. I won't hurt you. Hana soothingly cooed to the elf. Nenith? Is that you my goddess? Aliathra asked embracing the doctor tightly while still sobbing from her imagined trauma. No, I am not. But don't worry you are safe her with me. She softly whispered. WH who are you? Aliathra asked. I am doctor. I mean. You. Cleric Hana Lee Hainwell. But you can call me Hana. You're in the new Albany military hospital. We are like a. Hospice. Only bigger. Hana answered. What happened to me? You fainted in front of Vincent and he took you to the hospital. You're actually fine. You just had a bad day from putting on too much stress. Hana said. I'm not. Dead or anything? Still in the land of the living right now miss. Diaz said. Aliathra opened her eyes to be then greeted by the same bright light from the moment she woke up. After adjusting her vision, she soon saw the familiar face of Vincent and the beautifully alluring baby face of Dr. Lee Hainwell. The state of distress she had dissipated from her as she examined her surroundings to see she is indeed still in the material living plane. How? Huh? Long was I out? It's around midnight at the moment here so I say. About six hours. I am supposed to let you go after you wake up at next morning. Hana said. So, do I have to pay for your services? Aliathra asked. Oh no, I will do this one for you for free. Hana smiled. That's very generous of you. The gratefully thanked her caretaker. Diaz. Vincent. I am sorry if we didn't go to that photo studio you said you wanted to go to. She apologized. Oh no hard feelings miss. We can always have next time if you're still at it. Although, I did want to still at least give you a lasting impression of new all beneath you so I bought you a slice of something special. Diaz reached in from his bag and pulled out a paper bag which he reached into again to obtain a plastic carton with a slice of pastry inside it. It's called Oreo Cheesecake. Got it from the hospital cafe. I don't know what you elves like to eat so I just went with my gut and got you this. I hope you like it. Diaz said. Giving her a spork and the carton. Aliathra, not wanting to be rude to him, promptly ate the dessert before her. She was impressed by the subtle sweetness of her snack thanks to the Oreo cookie powder and sweet milk cheese of the cake. She left a contagious smile that infected both Vincent and Hana who followed her. Well it looks like you're going to like staying here for now. I hope you don't mind the moaning from everyone who are next to you. They got injured pretty bad today. Hana said. What happened doc? 
Those guys are sentries judging from their uniforms. Diaz asked. From what I was told, a bunch of black cloaked men shot out some sort of machine crossbow whilst they were manning the checkpoints, unprovoked. Hana answered, God almighty, that's terrible, but why? Well so far, we don't even know why but judging from one of the natives who witnessed the incident they say that they are part of some secret society of sorts called the Crows. The Crows? That's Meter's group within the Grey Order. She recalled that Meter's special talents involved around the various fields of subterfuge ranging from sabotage, espionage, assassinations, and information warfare. She was, by the accounts of all espionage theorists and scholars to be a pioneer in innovating new ways to spy at all those who would throw the right amount of coin to her. If Meter's agents are behind these attacks these then she would most likely be kicking the hornet's nest rather than any significant damage to the other worlders if her discoveries are to believe. You bothered about something? Diaz asked her noticing the unconscious change in her expression. Oh no, I am just shocked that people would attack you, she denied. You sure? I though banditry is common here. Diaz rebutted. Normally, bandits target those who can't fight back. The savages. Where I come from, the bandits take risks. Well I hope you stay safe when you get out tomorrow Ali. Ali, I just shortened your name a bit, just to make myself easier to call your name. I mean, Ali Yifra. I hate stressing my words, you don't mind, do you? She was humored by that name, it sounded so playful. It reminded her of her innocent childhood before she was sent to ranger school where it was shattered to be molded back to a grown martial lady of war. I don't mind. I find being called Ali amusing. She blushed. Well, I got to go now. Ali. I have some stuff to do around the base tomorrow. I hope Dr. Hana treats you the best cause she's the best. I'll see you both soon alrighty then. Diaz stood up and began to walk to the exit. Oh. Diaz can you remind your friend Mudwin something for me? Hana interjected. Shoot. I promised him that I will give him an autopsy report by tomorrow morning. Why would he need an autopsy report? He's a mechanical engineer. Diaz's eyes widened in confused curiosity. You didn't hear? Ken and Iris are going to make a book. A guide book. Hana said. Guide of what? What else but the planet of Gleesia? He and Iris are going to gather as much knowledge about this fantasy world we are in. Geography, places, cultures, peoples, sciences and etc. I am in charge of the more physiological sections of the book, which also reminds me. Aliathra, since you are an elf would you like to help contribute to the collection of our knowledge? Hanu asked. What do you mean by contribute? She asked. Well, if you have the time tomorrow. I can perform a medical checkup on you, nothing invasive, just me probing some tools around you and asking some questions. And before you ask, don't worry, you won't feel anything, I guarantee it, if it makes you feel better, I can even pay you in some ducats and free food from our farms. Hana proposed. Alia threw a thought down deeply from the doctor's words. She is essentially giving the demons knowledge rather than her obtaining it from them. But she reasoned is that if she can obtain the finished copy of that guidebook the other worlders are working on, it might prove essential into how the aliens perceive the people of Gleesia. Additionally, if she goes on with this deal, she could gain more of the other worlders' trust whilst maintaining her cover as a spy. This would be the most logical of actions she would undertake for the sake of her world. Agreed, I will help you and your people learn more about us. She gracefully accepted. That's great to hear. Next morning after you eat some breakfast, I'll do that checkup of yours. Well, good to hear more of you nerds being nerdy. But now this boy needs some on after Tom Diaz tried to roguishly say his goodbye by exiting to his right only for the emergency wings doors to slam right into his face. This is a hold up. A crazed masked man in a green checkered polo screamed. His eyes were pink with cravings poked from his mask's eye holes as he raised his hands to reveal that he was armed with a pistol. This is a military hospital. Big mistake. One of the guards pulled out his pistol and began to aim at the intruder, but the robber was expecting resistance. He turned around and opened full auto fire at the guard revealing that his weapon is an automatic machine pistol. The guard, 
Caught by surprise and only armed with a revolver ducked down for cover, the thunderous noise of the automatic pistol caused the doctors and patients to scream and hide for cover to avoid the malicious man. Now that the area was at full alert, the wild-eyed man had to think fast if he was to get what he is risking a robbery at the military hospital for. Following his primal instincts, the robber turned his gaze to one of the hospital beds where Aliathra, shivering in fear and covering her leaf-shaped ears laid on. Get over here. The man grabbed the elf woman by her long blonde hair. Ah, she gave a cry. Let her go. Dr. Hana demanded but she was quickly silenced by the perpetrator's gun click as the man aimed his weapon at her. Make one more step and I get to see what your skull looks like from the inside, he threatened. The doctor was never a confrontational person. She stepped back in fear whilst the elf whimpered in fright. Aliathra's mental alarms went into overdrive when she felt the cold steel barrel of the gun aimed next to her elven ears. She sensed the brewing death that resonated within the weapon with piercing echoes of her untimely doom. Strangely enough, she couldn't sense any kind of magic in the device as all she could point out was that it was completely mechanical in nature with no arcane enchantments whatsoever. Whilst the criminal's back was turned, Vincent managed to stand up from the unexpected blow. To his horror the intruder's M09 machine pistol was placed right next to the head of the beautiful elven princess. What do you want? Diaz asked. The man turned to him, holding Aliathra firmly with his thick left arm whilst aiming his gun with his right. I want all of your fentanyl powder, now, the man demanded. Oh great, those people again. Even in the colonies these guys are always looking for easy targets. Diaz moped. It was obvious from the man's pink craving eyes that he was a degenerate drug addict trying his luck or perhaps since he is robbing a military hospital, is extremely desperate for his next fix. He knows this since his career as a criminal in the cyberpunk streets of Kesselheim's industry cities. When you ignore the glamorous neon lights and holographic displays, there's a growing underbelly of society's scum from drug addicts, freelance gunners, small-time gangs and the exploitive megacore that cover their pristine public image with mafia-like activities ranging from extortion, kidnapping, corporate espionage and sabotage. Diaz doesn't know that he should be a glad that he was out of the seedy districts of that planet or homesick. He loved the change of scenery of lush green pastures and unspoiled nature but he still misses his self-made material wealth he has accumulated as a thief for the Apara Mega Corporation. Let the elf go friend. Diaz calmly tried to negotiate. You think I give a shit about this knife-eared bitch here? He responded with agitation. Hey, I don't want the woman to be harmed in any way here. Diaz further pressed. Yeah, let woman go. The security guard emerged from his cover, aiming his pistol at the hostage taker. I will let her go if I get all them barbage you ate from this fucking place. Hand them over all little miss knife her gets pumped with lead. He threatened. If there's anything he knows about the desperate drug addicts, is that they will never follow through their end of the bargain. They were so far down off of their own depravity that they only care for themselves and won't give any two shits for anyone else. Diaz has to act fast, the man held the life of a native primitive and if word got out that she died in their hands, any hope of peaceful relations with the natives can go down the drain. How about this, take me instead of her? Diaz stepped forward to the gasp of everyone in the room. Why? The criminal asked. I am one of the assistant chief engineers of New Albany's water pipeline. He lied with a made-up position that sounded important. A brief silence followed, whilst the man absorbed his words. Get over here, he demanded. Roll 20 for charisma check. Oh yeah. Diaz smirked. He calmly approaches the man and in one quick split-second swipe of his hands, pushed away Aliathra to the ground in front of him. With his barbaric grappling the perpetrator hooked in Vincent at gunpoint. Little did the man know, that this is what Diaz exactly wanted him to do. Now where the fuck is my drugs? 
If I don't get my drug by the count of ten I'll blow this spick's head off. One, two. The man counted down. Whilst the hospital staff scrambled to fulfill his demands in time to save him, Diaz relaxed his cybernetic limbs, discreetly loosened his hostages taker's grapple hold from him to create space and took a deep breath for he only has one shot to make it right. Before you finish that countdown, I am a Filipino, not a Mexican you shut up piece of shit. Vincent snapped. With a quick activation of his rapid movement booster, Diaz quickly elbowed the man's pistol arm away to give take away the hazard from Diaz. But Vincent was of a smaller stature compared to the man's superior height of around 6 feet 3 inches to Diaz's 5 feet 10 inches. He dashed away from the man giving the security guards an opening to take him down. But as he dashed away, he noticed that Haleathra, still frozen in fear, stand right in the middle of the crossfire, and both sides were now beginning to pull their guns triggers. Duck Diaz yelled to the elf as he tackled her to the ground, their combined weight crashed to the ground mere moments when the military hospital's security opened fire at the crazed addict. A hail of gunfire was exchanged before all became silenced. From the moment she was tackled, Aliathra closed her eyes shut and silently prayed to Ninoth again for protection. She had always prayed to the mother goddess of the elves for throughout her entire life for guidance and protection. She was heavily devoted to worshipping her and even helped out carry out charitable healing services in her name with her restoration magics proficiency. She didn't dare open her eyes until she heard faint crackling sound of electricity Diaz, not wanting to her burden the elf girl any further, who is already having quite a first day already in New Albany, promptly pushed his body away Aliathra and went on his knees in pain beside her. To Aliathra's horror, Diaz had several bullet entry wounds from his back. He bled like an open tap of blood of both artificial and natural varieties with a mixture of exposed severed wires that disgorged loose electrical currents. The strange mechanical demon had just shielded her over a dozen bullets from the M09 machine pistol. You dot oh okay? Diaz softly asked her. I am. Fine. Aliathra said in relief. You saved me. She thanked her. Good. I need. A. Me. Shit. Diaz collapsed to the ground. His blood tainted the white floor in a mixture of his natural crimson and azure cyber blood that fuels his augmentations. In her thoughts, Aliathra couldn't believe that this otherworlders would willingly lay his life for her. Demons were supposed to be selfish, greedy and sadistic beings made of corrupted magic, but this Vincent person, or whatever he is exactly took a dozen bullets that would have landed on her if he didn't stand in the way. She wanted to thank him by healing him. She crawled up the bleeding otherworlder and tried to discreetly summon up her restoration magic to stop the bleeding but to her surprise, the man's flesh refused to close as her magic couldn't make the man's flesh cooperate. She feels so helpless right now as that she could see the man's life slowly fade away. All that Aliathra could do, despite her prodigious magics was redraw the blood back into the artificial blood vessels which she, leave it to me, Dr. Hana yelled as she and her team grabbed the moribund Vincent away. She could only watch as Vincent was carried over away from her but not before he let out a soft reassuring smile to the elf before he was beyond her sight. Dash the next morning dash. Dr. Hana walked out of Diaz's room heavily sweating but ultimately pleased. The rest of Strider group just recently heard the news of Diaz's shooting and rushed to NAMH concernedly. Is the bloke going to be okay? Crocker asked Hana. I never even expect Diaz to even do something like that. Samantha commented on Vincent's unselfish act of protecting a native. Yes. He is stable for now. Ran a diagnostics and found out that several of his vital organs were damaged when he took those shots. Thankfully most of his entire body is just orgs so they can be easily replaced. Hana answered. Aliathra, who was quietly sitting down on the hospital grounds took a peek at the room that the doctor got out of. She saw Diaz laying on his reclining hospital bed chest naked but instead of seeing his bare skin, to the revulsion. Diaz's body was opened up to reveal his entire body system. From what the elf can remember from her biology lessons, elves and humans are physiologically similar in almost every aspect. To her discernment however, 
Vincent's heart, lungs, liver were made of an unnatural wax-like material of light blue. They all acted similar to what should a living person's body should function, heart beating and lungs breathing yet everything about it was uncanny to her. Diaz insisted that he is human but the unnatural materials inside the man were contrary to what he said. Her otherworldly savior noticed her gaze and with a gentle smile he waved at her. Did I scare you? He told her. Your body. It's SHH. I know this is your first time seeing me like this. Hell. You're probably the first to see something like this for your people and all. Don't worry, Doc says I just need to get some parts of me replaced and I am good to go. Diaz reassured her. Why is your body like that? Aliathra questioned his augmentations. Well, my job before I got conscripted required. A lot of physical activity to say the least. The heart lungs, legs and arms had to get replaced with more resilient versions. Diaz answered her. You had parts of your body replaced? She flashed. I know this is a lot to take into but that is besides the point right now. You came were concerned of me? I noticed those spikes of unbinilium near me. You're a mage aren't you elf? Diaz asked. Yes. I am a restoration mage and illusionist. Aliathra answered. I noticed that when you help a bee dyer with his leg, that you have his thanks for. Consider what I did for you returned favor. Diaz chuckled. Vince. A bee dyer yelled followed by the rest of Strider group. Hey guys. I am sorry to let you see me like this. He apologized. No worries for this one private. I just want to let you know that despite your injury. You're still going to be assigned a new assignment. As soon as you get out. Samantha informed her. Well what is it? Remember that thing with Governor White promised to Prince Clovich about healing his sister from that brittle bone disease thing? Well we are going to escort the princess and some trusted escorts of hers to getting her legs back, Lieutenant Rose explained. Where? Kesselheim. There's a hospital that agreed to discreetly cure princess of her problems. Ken said. Cool. But why be discreet about it? Diaz said. Well. The governor and the Anusa director believe that Princess Aria isn't ready for the storm of press that she is going to bombarded with yet. Might scare her or worse. Oh yeah and Iris is coming too. Ken said. Snow White too? Why that? Well, I am going to meet a publisher of my new book detailing the stuff we find here in Gleesia. The publisher insists he meets Iris. And yeah, I told them about it with an NDA on top. Ken enthusiastically said. Heard about it from Dr. Hana. Can't wait to read it when it comes out. It's a digital publish not a traditional one though. Ken said. Oh. Well still good. Hey everyone. Please leave the room right now. The augmentation mechanic is here to perform the replacement surgery. Hana interrupted everyone. Oh. And Miss Aliathra. We can do that interview right now. Everyone left the room whilst an indistinct mechanic walked inside with his toolbox and new bubble-wrapped augmentations. The stranger closed the door and clicked the lock leaving him alone with Diaz. The ex-thief, based on his underground experience was alarmed by the unnecessary locking of the door. Normally, it was a mind game tactic for people to give an atmosphere of being entrapped inside an enclosed space whilst his interrogator would either ask karma piercing questions, torture him or both. Who are you? Diaz asked. Relax, I am with Don Aparo, the mechanic said. Don Aparo, it was the name of his old boss. The CEO and secretly the head of one of Kesselheim's largest organized criminal rings. He was one of Domenico's best soldiers before his untimely arrest from that botched weapons deal. He was honestly surprised on how his old boss managed to track him down despite the classified intel that detailed his exile. So, what does the Don require of me? You know I am probably light years away from the nearest safe house and I got conscripted so sorry. I can't desert them unless he got something crazy planned. Diaz told the mechanic who says you have to desert. The mechanic said as he passed him a sealed envelope with Don Aparo's family seal, that he only uses for personal uses when it comes to affairs outside of his corporate empire. You can read it while I work on your orgs. It ain't your old ones but you got to read the letter. You're gonna love what you got to say, the mechanic says as he got to work, picking up his tool and replacement orgs. 
Opening the letter, Diaz promptly and quietly read the contents of a letter. To his astonished contentment or at least judging how he wrote the letter and Vincent's memories of the old Don's voice, he was very saddened to hear of his arrest and shipment away from Aparo's reach. But according to the letter, thanks to several contacts of greased government informants, he was able to not only track down Vincent Diaz but also learn the existence of Unbinilium. Domenico learned from his informants that the colony of New Albany is looking for investors to help speed up the development of the fledging company. It was an open secret on all the prospective investors that Benham III housed sentient but primitive life that were the stuff of fairy tales, young adult fantasy novels and rebounds per game games. But Don Aparo was still partially reluctant to throw his hat in the ring unless he gets to see a live sample of an unbinilium crystal for the old man thanks to his slowly aging body would rather call, mana crystals. If he is convinced that unbinilium crystals are a worthy investment, he will provide several pieces of heavy industry for the colony to use, scientific staff and equipment to help Dr. Malona's research and a few hundred private military contractors to augment the security forces. Most intriguing of the offers over the rest was that he is also planning to expand one of the Don's criminal enterprises to New Albany which is the manufacturing of ghost guns. Details on how you can contact our master back at Kesseheimar in the letter contacts and all. Are you on board? The mechanic asked as he unwrapped Diaz's new augmented heart. Well, if the master is really going to step in and help this new place then he asked in the best time possible. Hostile natives, magic, unbinilium and undead, could have picked a better time, but, under one condition, Diaz negotiated. You know our master is not a man who likes to go to the table dare runner, the Apara mechanic said shrewdly. I just want my old gear, car and bank account back. I mean, I'm pretty much stuck here now so I might as well complete my moving in here. Once my conscription is over, I am free to buy property for myself, and I can still tag along with whatever Don Aparo wants me to nick soon after. I mean, this place is the holy grail of thievery, just imagine what kind of crazy fantasy loot I can steal. I am talking about enchanted swords, gold dragon eggs and hot sorceress babes a la warcraft you feel in me diaz explained well that i believe the master might consider now i need to sleep right now i am going to start replacing your heart now and i need you to be still the mechanic smiled as he grabbed diaz's new heart hopefully that standard run-of-the-mill civilian augmentation will be a temporary discomfort if the promise of getting his old augmentations goes his way. He can already taste his old powerful self all over again. And the people of Gleesia, whether it's new heist targets or crusading armies bent on taking down the demon invasion they will have no idea the power of Aparo Industries' bleeding edge in biological technologies. Diaz closed his eyes, and began to dream about his old glory days as the man unplugged the artificial arteries away of his old damaged heart. Chapter 15, Road to a New Tomro Aliathra, after getting discharged from the New Albany Military Hospital side in relief as she returned to the cozy hidden abode of her makeshift camp. She had also given this morning to the very kind baby-faced Dr. Lee Hainanul an educational interview on some of the many wonders and facts of Gleesia, especially the elves although she did take care not to divulge too much information lest the good doctor pressed her further about the rising tensions from her homeland between the Untunt and the Pact. She feigned the mind and simpleton stature of an elven commoner who is simply just traveling around the human continent when she was asked what is she doing in Sainagrad which is an ocean away from home. She could easily remember Hana's warm smile that for some reason according to her own judgment was surprisingly genuine, childlike even. She has begun to harbor doubts over the humans' insistence that this was a demon invasion but just the sheer thought of it being all a mistake was so outlandish that Aliathra refused to entertain any thoughts about it. It wasn't much for the elven princess which her abode consists of a simple sleeping mat, a cloth tent and a fireplace with a pot hanger. She inhaled the mesmerizing forestry that surrounded her camp. It reminded her of Alphil Nora's tree-filled groves that dotted her homeland. 
the previous smell of metal, which was overwhelmingly erected around New Albany had made her slightly queasy. The unnatural architecture and people, especially Vincent, and most especially him, were a lot to take in. Just thinking about the place also reminded her of her scouting duty that Aliathra almost forgot to do. She grabbed one of her cast iron pots that she has lying around and filled it with water. She placed the cooking ware on top of her fireplace and with some improvised sparks from her years of ranger survival training, set alight her campfire. While the elf princess waited for the flames to start boiling the water, she grabbed a wooden cup, a piece of paper and an inkwell pen in preparation to write her official scouting report. Now having a moment for herself where she can remove her espionage-related facade, Aliathra reached into her pockets and grabbed one of her favorite reminders of her home. Tea leaves from a rare Alphilnora plant that is the rage amongst the nobility and military for its healing, anti-stress and relaxant properties. Once she the pot produced the desired bubbling noises that tickled her ears, the elf dropped the herbal mixture at the pot, stirring diligently for about a minute until the remedying aroma of the tea leaves was released in vapors as they evaporated out of the water. She scooped up a cup full of the tea and sat down and dropped her prim and proper posture for her moment of peace. Ah! She released a sigh in relief as she indulged into her tea. Its rejuvenating contents made her body melt down on the log she leaned on. For a brief moment, she was in peace with herself and it was all that Aliathra just wanted after such a long hard time at work. Before she could indulge herself too much, Aliathra snapped back from her breezy state and reminded herself why she had a pen and a paper on her lap in the first place. She picked herself up and began to write down, in an address to Emperor Alden and the human nations of her findings, to Emperor Alden's Laeja, the most revered and beacon of human civilization. I Princess Aliathra Letha of the Royal Family of the Eth Island Elves of Alphilnora send greeting in the name of the gods. I apologize to you and your nation of my lack of haste on sending you my reports but I have due reason due to several unfortunate circumstances. I was set back, but I was resourceful enough to briefly infiltrate and scout out the location of where the demons have landed. If you may first recall the expedition that the Grey Order and I have undertaken to block the eyes of the Metal Demons in Tyrian, the Metal Demons have built their stronghold at the same exact location where we had initially first contacted the eyes. To my shock, the Prince of Tyrian, Clovich has been peacefully allowing the other worlders to live in his lands in exchange for boons ranging from groveling roads, staggering amounts of food that no farmer can even wish to be able to reap and most devious of them all. They even offered the promise of making Princess Arya, Clovich's sister whole again. It shouldn't be too hard to march out your armies against the metal demons once you planned out your assault, however. I must warn you Alden for the many freakish sights that I managed to see that the other worlders possess, I saw great metal eagles the size of wyverns that fly above the earth commandingly alongside their great floating boats that can pierce the heavens, they also have iron beasts of burden that tear the land apart with ease with their great large hands, but what could be worst of all among what I have seen from them? They all look almost perfectly like you humans and we elves. Pink flesh with a chance of tanning or heavily blackened skin, two arms with five fingers each and the same for the feet and toes. But what made them terrifying the inhuman was when I saw them get injured. They did not bleed but their bodies, whilst damaged, were easily replaced with new metal ones that work faster, stronger and better than what nature had given us. Neneth the goddess of life would have been disgusted as so the shrine servants of her temple. From my best estimate, I say there are about 6,000 of these other worlders as of the writing of this letter, but if we can move fast and annihilate them while they are still weak then we might be still able to salvage what we have failed and prevent the apocalypse. I will continue my scouting report as I write this letter and deliver any further news when I find some more. From Princess Aliathra Letha, she wrote as best as she could comprehend what she saw in New Albany, whenever her pen had to describe about the other worlders, their metallurgic architecture and strange beasts. It made her sweat profusely and heartbeat race upwards, yet to her own confession they were some charm into them. 
Just the thought of that metal demon named Diaz and his mysterious nature made her mesmerized, curious for more about him and his people. His demeanor reminded her of some of the dashing suitors that had flocked to court her sister Lunafria who took the approach of the mysterious stranger route where they entice their quarry to pay more attention to Ad by leaving behind cryptic aura that only opened more questions than answer. But she had the conflicting feelings about him for his metal flesh plastered around his body like if it was meant to be his skin. In her religious teachings, he would have been called a delic and anathema against the goddess Neneth and her children. She should show contempt to the demon but there was a charm behind him that she at times could not help but smile about. Is it being some sort of temptation to corrupt her or was he genuinely interested in her? She doesn't know. All she wants is to know more. She needs to know more. Maybe another trip to New Albany for another run in spying would not hurt. But she needs to recover from this culture shock she had just endured. How is that let to going elf? A foxy feminine voice sprouted from behind her. Alarmed, Aliathra quickly drew her bow and aimed it to the rear intruder. She saw a familiar woman dressed in skin-tight leather bodices with dozens of pockets attached all over her attire. Relax princess, it's only me. Me to the crow smoothly diffused the elf. You almost made me but an arrow between your eye. Aliathra scolded. I can't help it. It's how we crows do. You seem to be busy. Mita commented at the finished letter that Aliathra held in her hand. I just finished my report. Here, everything I know so far about the other worlders. Make sure this only gets to Emperor Alden only, she said. You actually managed to get inside that god's forsaken place? The glass and metal over there? What's wrong with good old-fashioned wood? Mita said. That's exactly what I said about the place. I did go in there. There's just so many things I simply never seen before, she confessed humbly. So, the elf now admits they are uncertain of something for the very first time in over ever. Meta teased much to Aliathra's annoyance. I didn't have much luck trying to get in. Keep getting chased of by their metal hounds of theirs. They even somehow spotted me when I used one of my invisibility potions when I tried to sneak into one of their giant metal boats. Mita said. You mean their spaceships? Aliathra asked. Is that how those demons call them? How do you know of this? Mita asked. I was able to. How do I say this? Talk to them. Aliathra said. You what? Mita snapped and grabbed the chest area of Aliathra's garments and leaned threateningly towards her. I managed to be able to get close to enough to actually talk to them. The elf answered. Shouldn't your, I don't know, those demon wards explode on their faces if they try to get close to you? Mita questioned. Curiously, the wards didn't go off. Hey, the same ones I casted are still in effect right now. She mentioned. Her spells not setting off upon the other world has caused the first cracks of doubt to seethe into her. The wards worked as both as a detector and as a countermeasure for demonic energies where once the ward catches a whiff of the corrupted powers, they would release an explosion of holy magic that should be enough to dispel completely lesser demons or weaken stronger ones. Okay that's something I cannot believe I would hear from an elf, but what did else did they babbled about? What if they are lying? Can you even trust them? Did you say anything to them back? Mita further pressed. Well I was just simply playing along as a traveling elf commoner who is just simply wandering around and stopped by a Tyrian for supplies. As for the words of the other worlders, I didn't take most of what they said right up front. In my own instincts, they speak not in lies but half-truths. I can sense it from the way they speak and breath. They are hiding somethings from us. Aliathra answered. She had no reason to lie to Mita. She is still here to help the humans, no matter how suspicious and xenophobic they can be to those not of their own. In my line of work, half-truths are still lying. She sighed. The crow walked towards one of the camp's logs and sat down. How did you manage to get into the other worlders' fortress anyway? She asked. I just walked inside from the front gate like everyone else. They just let me in. You just did that? She widened her eyes. Well I was being expected by someone there. This other worlder, who mind you looks like a human and keeps insisting that they, the other worlders, are humans named Obedia wrote. 
He was selling these strange foods that I bought for examination. From what I have seen, alongside his beard, he also has a very loving family that he supports. You bought demon food from one of them? Mita questioned, startled by Aliathra's statement. I have examined the specimen mind you to be free of any demonic inf. Aliathra was about to explain herself but she was quickly grabbed by the throat by Mita and a knife was shoved next to her throat. Tell me are you still even one of us? Mita growled threateningly. What has been up with you? The elf choked. First you said that you managed to get inside the other worlder's fortress where me and my agents had failed. Second you managed to be able to talk with the demons and third, you bought their food. Tell me elf, are you still even pure and loyal to the gods? To order? Mita asked. Her fearful breathing and gnashing of teeth reverberated on Aliathra's fair skin. I am still loyal. The elf answered stoically. Besides, if I were still corrupted then that trinket of Nenya of yours you always wear between your breasts would be shaking like a drunken fairy in a box if I was corrupted. Aliathra argued. Nenya, also known to the elves as Nenith is the human name given to the mother goddess of life. Elven culture held a significant part of the way of life for the humans of Zanigrad. The elves, Mostly the Athilanon Tond ones brought overseas many ideas and inventions that helped the Slay Aegean Empire built their dominion on most of the western side of the continent. This includes the idea of chivalry, heavy cavalry, the basis of many magical theories and laws for understanding and utilizing the energies hidden in the mana crystals and most peculiar of all their religions and beliefs. Many of the elven gods had their own names and interpretations by the organized religious groups native to the Zanagrad continent Nanya, Nenith being the best example. Mita retreated her weight and knife from Aliathra and stepped back. But in her eyes, she still maintained a degree of distrust from the elf. Who was she to make such a downplaying explanation on a demon invasion? I still have doubts about your sincerity elf. What would your people and family say if they find out about what you just said? Mita pointed with incrimination to Aliathra. The situation has soon descended into potentially lethal circumstances for Aliathra. So how can I prove it to you? That we are still on your side? Aliathra pleaded. Mita crossed her arms and twitched her eyebrows in a cocky display which is rare for a human to be in the high grounded side against an elf. Well then princess, I want you to go back into New Albany again, Mita commanded. And what? Aliathra asked back. You know those giant floating boats those demons have that always rise up to the sky and come back down? Mita explained which was promptly followed by Aliathra's acknowledgement. I want you to get a closer look on those boats and try to find out any weaknesses for them. Betcha wants to see how can the Sky Riders can take one of those metal beasts down. Check for anything to aim for, heart, brain, eyes you know, standard large beast weak spots. Mita said, that I can do. Aliathra nodded. She then forwarded her arm to pass her report letter to the crow for Alden's eyes only. She added before she returned to her comforting fireplace and relaxing cup of elven herbal tea. Mita turned away from the elven princess camp immediately afterwards, her job of recontacting their elven ally. Yet the Crow assassin still maintained her conjectures for the elf and her purity of soul and loyalty. When she was a good distance away from Aliathra's hidden camp, Mita carefully reads the classified letter. Examining the contents, Mita smirked. Interesting. Dash. The next day at the governor's palace at New Albany, Dash, Prince Klovich hugged his dear sister Princess Aria tightly, it was never easy for him to part away his family under such circumstances. Arya Tyrian plus a small entourage of bodyguards and handmaidens would be soon leaving for Kesselheim tomorrow when the sun rises at the middle of the sky or around 12 noon. At first, he was reluctant to go through with Arya's promised bone marrow reinforcement surgery which Governor White promised will make the feeble princess finally after so long being imprisoned in her chair, walk again. 
but after a well-timed compromise of a hostage exchange or more of just making several important be housed and confined to the Terriant Citadel and not be allowed out until Princess Arya and her entourage are safely returned home unharmed, and walking. Governor White painstakingly emphasized his promise to bring the young girl home with nothing but fun memories from her time in Kesselheim. Please sis, take this, Clovich whispered before passing a small brooch to her. Arya's eyes widened in shock when she looked into her palms and saw that the brooch was none other than the Tyrian family brooch worn by every ruling prince for generations. It was a one-of-a-kind piece of jewelry made from red dwarf gems and handcrafted by a master jewelsmith. I can't wear this. Arya refused. I am not telling you to wear this. Just keep this between me and you but. Make sure you come back with it so I know that it is you when you finally run towards me for the first time in ever, Clovich tenderly said. I will. Arya closed her hand on the brooch. Meanwhile whilst the Tyrian royal family were arranging the last of their luggage, Samantha and the rest of the Strider group were at Governor Jeremy's office where the colonial governor, alongside Major Holyfield and Colonel Jan Polonsky. They were all albeit mostly the honor of the assignment of being part of the security detail for Princess Arya and her entourage as she gets her reconstructive surgery in one of Kesselheim's most advanced hospitals where the equipment and expertise were present in. They have to also act both as tour guides alongside as their guardians throughout the duration of the trip. The ulterior motive behind it this is to impress the makeshift Gleesian delegation about the positive effects of befriending and seek deeper ties with the youth. The entire plan is supposed to be momentous for the guests but discreet in terms of security. There were fears coming from the Unusa chairman of accidentally scaring the otherworldly guests when unending hordes of forceful media press could cause hundreds of security and ease of life problems that both the Unusa office and the Gleesian colonial government would rather not go through such an inconvenience. First Princess Arya and company would be entreated with a small guided tour of Kesselheim passing by the planet's famous mega-industrial zone after touching down at the spaceport. Next, they would pass by the Orchard District where the many high abstract buildings were situated and the aforementioned high-tech hospital where Arya will get her surgery, as much as they could. The tour would have to avoid the more rustic and down-to-earth plebeian regions where the common folk live. Most of the buildings there are more akin to the architectural aesthetics of standard block-shaped buildings littered to no end with hundred upon hundreds of neon signs that blinded the unfamiliar eyes at first glances. That goes much more for the many ghettos that were littered with little, insert country or famous city from a country here, which most of the time don't get along. Both Louis Crocker and Vincent Diaz had differing memories of that place. For the sergeant it was one of the most tarduous tours he had written in his career and couldn't believe he managed to finish his tour without going out in a body bag. Or worse, many of the mega corporations, especially those who manufacture weapons, portable industrial grade tools, chemicals, cybernetic augmentations and computers would often dump their excess surpluses into the Kesselheim plebeian regions to wage corporate warfare amongst each other. Sabotage, espionage, theft and straight up murder, nothing was off limits. The Eden-like gardens of the Orchard District was all just a facade to hide the violent crime that sits behind the scenes away from the general public size and concern. His tour of duty in Kesselheim mostly consist of peacekeeping between the ghettos, crime determined in the more public scenes and at occasional bouts fight off the numerous criminal elements that inhabit the planet. In the youth military, being assigned to Kesselheim or having simply a short, read, two-year was the equivalent of being sent to hell. Unlike the mundane insurgency movements in far-flung colonial outposts scattered around the perimeter of youth space, compared to them, the Upfers were not normal people wielding either civilian-grade weapons and an occasional black market gun by. Instead they were highly skilled and experienced criminal elements with high-tech weapons and gear. Their reasons for fighting each other in the open streets were either as deniable assets for megacore, ethnic clashes or just simple gangland affairs. Crocker would sweat bullets when he gets deployed in the field, 
It is known by all those who served in Kesselheim that the criminals would often deploy electronic countermeasures to disable or straight up turn against the tech that the youth would use. Only business lobbying influences which is in the form of the explanation of they must have stolen this tech to use for themselves and rival mega core seeking means of one-upping their competition by offering their assistance is what keeps them all from both tearing Kesselheim apart and keeping them in power. When he is out there in his exosuit and machine gun, it was for him like having a target painted on his body with a giant cartoonish bubble that would metaphorically float on top of him say shoot me. I got a BFG. It was only his suit's armor plating and little bit of smart manipulation of the urban terrain did Crocker manage to survive where heavy machine gunners were shot at a premium by the vicious underbelly denizens of a rich mining world turned into a planet-wide megapolis. For Diaz however, it was a sci-fi nerd's wet dream come true. When you look beyond the heavily competitive mega corporations who wage war against each other like a big real-life game of Cyberpunk 2077, although the corporate warfare was an everyday hazard that many of the Kesselheim bourgeoisie have to live through every day, to scholars who have studied the sociological structure of Kesselheim and the influences of the mega corporations based there. They are a necessary evil. Thanks to the highly competitive nature of the mega corporations, it has caused Kesselheim to be one of the youth's most innovative and technologically advanced core planets in their entire interplanetary dominion over the stars beyond the Sol system. There were hundreds of high-tech inventions littered around the planet ranging from cutting-edge VR recreation centers, a sophisticated shopping scene, both white and black and some of the most daring criminals to ever declare themselves outlaws. Although the planet had a right to bear arm article written in the law books, having potential victims of the ability to fight back was in little to any deterrent to the ever bloodthirsty and ever so greedy Kesselheim underworld. And for Diaz, he is, or if judging by the time he is gone was on top of the criminal food chain. Being a top agent of one of the most influential mega corporations in Kesselheim which is Aparo Technologies under the code name Dare Runner for his propensity to pull off seemingly impossible jobs from breaking into secured areas undetected, leaving no traces on a mess and being Don Master's courier of very sensitive items. This was all in part with his custom cybernetic orgs and weapons plus a modified Ford Mustang modified to be able to handle off-road and survive scuffles with chasers. Being at such a high rank in Aparo he is showered with heavy amounts of cuts and compensation for his sensational efforts. But it was never about the money. His bank account was more of a high score that he can use the points to redeem items. It was all about the thrill and excitement of being able to get away something that no other person could ever believe could be possible. He still lives in an indistinct middle class residential condominium building a few block away from the garden district. It was still astronomical how Vincent managed to get caught in a trap by that botched weapons deal however. He was worried he might have gave Don Aparo a heart attack when his best agent got slammed for the rest of Strider Group. It was a standard op that so happens to be taking place outside of Gleesia for once, just to escort the Gleesians as quietly and securely as possible for the entire week they will be in Kesselheim. Colonel Polanski dismissed everyone after everyone got their mission parameters. In a disciplined manner everyone quietly left the office but just as Vincent, Ken and Iris were about to leave the office, Diaz, may I have a word with the three of you, alone. Governor White halted them. The three turned their backs on the door and took a seat as Jeremy commandingly spread his arms out on his desk inhaling the exciting yet equally disquieting news about a certain potential business investor for New Albany and Tyrion's integration program. Let me cut to the chase right now with all of you, Diaz. I don't know if this was your doing or if it's just a coincidence. Jeremy turned to Vincent. Governor, you, why does this have to do with me though? Ken raised his hand only to be quieted down by Jeremy's stern eyes. It's about a parotech isn't it Governor? What happened? Diaz asked. I am willing to take a risk and let Domenico and his company move in. White said much to the satisfied smile of Diaz, but Aparo is not some small-time indie company sir. 
It's one of the top 10 mega core said by Forbes and you know how aggressive they can be. Kane mildly objected. I had to draw several lines with them on the phone about their limits but then again, Domenico is surprisingly a very reasonable man for a megacorp CEO. To be fair with him, this is uncharted territory that his company is diving into. His proposal is a store for his company to sell their tech and boost up our utility capabilities with their team of engineers. For industrial expansion they are still in the works of what exactly to do but he says that we will cross the bridge when we get there. Jeremy answered. What is a megacorp you talk of? Iris asked. Think very, very powerful groups of merchants. Then give them all the guns, the money and political power anyone can dream of having. Kane explained Aparo got their hands on everything from corrupt politicians, organized crime and an army of thugs to wrap it all around. There was tone of disgust in him when he had to think of the autocratic megacorp bosses of Kesselheim. They were some of the most Machiavellian and ruthless individuals to ever have a seat of power. Knowing them, the Aparo Corp might hide some sort of ulterior motive behind their rather soft expansion campaign to the new world of Gleesia. They could not follow through with their tamed investment plan and simply muscle in with their factories and goons as soon as they get their feet wet or worse manifest their destiny in the new world at the cost of the natives' welfare. That sounds like a recipe for trouble. The vampire crossed her arms in distaste. She was no stranger to bullies, just ask Divico about it. I know it is at first glance Iris, but I weighed any complication or any kind of unwanted developments from their part when I thought of bringing them on board. You see Iris, Aparo Technologies has some of the best technologies that the youth can offer to us. I am talking about machinery, nuclear power, and robotics. All bleeding edge. White explained to her, you have my heartfelt gratitude. Diaz smiled, pun intended. Vincent's word plays aside Iris. Aparo Corp has scientists and technological know-how to begin researching unbenillium, the Mano crystals. Their expertise in nuclear physics is second to none. You can appreciate their help for your research you're working on if that makes you content about having them over. White conferred. She took into the about White's words. Having someone to help you in your research come over isn't necessarily a bad thing but Iris was weary of this Aparo technologies based on Cairn's words. The Nigerian was always nice and polite to her throughout her involuntary service to the youth as their guide and it didn't matter to him, at least not at first, that she is a vampire and unsanctioned witch. She always feels like that the nightman somewhat understands or at least try to understand her and with was the first warming feeling she had in her cold heart for a long time. I still don't understand why does this involve me and why should I go meet this Aparo person. He sounds no different than the burning horseman. Iris said. Oh, come on Snow White this isn't amateur hour. Diaz sulked. You don't understand where this is going Iris don't you? Ken asked her something for the first time. Iris was told that it was she who doesn't comprehend what she is in right now. Iris, you are one of the colony's most valuable assets and when it comes to understanding the properties of mana crystals, you are the best we could have gotten. Additionally. Your bravery with that enchanted grenade launcher would get you a medal. I ask you now Iris could a hag and the vampire witch. I want you to secure a paro tech's investment by personally, plus Diaz and Mudwin to talk to him at his HQ in Kesselheim. I need you to make the best impressions with him since he is holding back everything until he sees the magic. Governor White explained plainly to her. But you're telling me to board your spaceships and go to some place? I have never been to. I don't know if I will be willing to just leave. Iris reluctantly answered. It was a lot to ask for her to do. It's just for a week in Kesselheim. Besides Mega Core aside, they are lots of things to do while we are there. Shopping, food and the Rainbow Bridge. Kayan enthusiastically encouraged her. I second that. Diaz supported. You know I can get creeped out by all of your stuff you know. Those bright screens, lasers and guns. I am already comfortable right now just learning how grenades work. Maintained her hesitation. Perhaps. I should have told you this earlier. Governor White interrupted. He reached into the bottom of his desk and picked up a polished wooden box about the size of upper chest and placed it in front of his three guests with a heavy thud. 
Gently he unlocked the latch that weakly sealed the box and opened the box. Its hinges creaked with friction adding to the anxious excitement that Diaz, Ken and Iris beheld over its contents. It was a necklace laying elegantly in a soft pillow, but not just any necklace, it was Iris' family heirloom necklace made out of a Pumano crystal. Its brilliant blue glow illuminated the room with a faint hint of azure light. The men in the room were awestruck by the intricate designs of the Kadahagan necklace. In visually aesthetic similarities, the necklace was of an Eastern European folk jewelry design. The vampire witch in the other hand unconsciously moved her hand forward to grab it but she stopped halfway. It had to be too good to be true that it's her necklace being shown to her right this moment. Come on take it. Wear it. Governor White prompted with his encouragement. Iris grabbed the necklace from its lofty container and brought the shining gem right up to her face. It breathed of the same magical signature that her forefathers have harnessed centuries ago. She couldn't believe that it is now in her hands, the Kadahagan family necklace. Put it on. Jeremy urged her. She nimbly wrapped it around her neck and clicked it into place tying herself around like a bow in a gift box. She straightened her posture to a graceful feminine stature reminiscent of a Victorian belle of old earth. You look beautiful, Ken blankly said as he feasted his eye on the beautiful woman sitting next to him. His mouth left agape and paralyzed to say another word. There was something complimentary with a blue gem and iris apricot A's. I second that, Diaz added. Here's the deal Iris. Don Aparo wants to have an exhibition on the unique effects of unbinilium and who better else than to demonstrate but you. Your necklace will also play an integral part on convincing him to invest. And since I have to give you your necklace might as well return it to its rightful owner. But under one condition. Jeremy placed his hands on his desk and tangled them together to twiddle his thumbs. His eyes changed from upbeat to a stern stare, it caused Iris to snap back from her necklace induced joy. Another one of the youth still making yet again? She was now starting to get sick of all the verbal contracts and implied death threats. You better promise me, all of you that you get this Apara Corporation to invest in us and only to us or I will have to take that necklace back. Jeremy said. Why? Is it about Domenico? Ken asked. It's not him. It's his rivals. You see, I don't want to that corporate warfare shenanigans happening in my jurisdiction no matter how lucrative competition can be. If you fail, there is nothing stopping the other corpos on moving in with their people and machines too. Aparo is dangling us an exclusive rights deal of being the sole megacorp to set up shop here if he is impressed with Unbinilium, Jeremy said. Isn't that illegal? Ken asked. Such a very specific condition in a deal is considered unethical in the eyes of the public and straight up illegal in the eyes of the law according to various business freedom bills. He's a mega corporation. He can do whatever magical shit they want. Why? Cuz his magical powers are. He's rich. Diaz answered slouching down on the comfy chair with his arms crossed. Dash a few days later at the new Albany starport. Dash. Aliathra quietly and swiftly cut a hole beneath the lowest part of the steel fence that blocked from entering the premise where the other worlders keep their giant metal birds and floating boats in. She was left unimpressed with how easily she managed to breach the initial perimeter thanks to her elven dagger which when infused with a little bit of magic can cut through relative thin layers of steel. It was dawning that time right now as she could see the sun rise upon the horizon. Enveloping the gloomy metal crates that were scattered around the airbase. Using them as cover, she narrowly avoided the detection of the drone patrols who were about to be relieved by their living counterparts. She has a brief window where the security is at its weakest to get as much useful information for her infiltration. Goddess, protect this fair maiden from the horrors of the underworld. She whispered a prayer before continuing onwards. She only packed lightly for this incursion. A quiver of arrows, a food ration for one day. Her water skin, a few liquidized mana potions and her own courage was all she had under her clothes. She scouted around for an opportunity to study and to her luck she spotted one of the other world as metal boats lying alone in out in the open field. There was a red carpet that was rolled out towards the base of the boat as if it was expecting someone very important to walk towards or into it. 
the elf broke open one of her mana potions and drank about halfway through the 500 milliliters bottle and casted a spell. Her body began to refract the approaching morning light turning her invisible. She has to move slowly for her to be able to make it towards the distance between her and the lone metal boat with her cover intact. She stopped out in the exposed air and walked silently towards the alien vessel. When she was now an arm's length from the boat she lightly caressed its ebony skin. It was cold to the touch when her smooth ivory skin brushed along the plated surface. The metal boat was devoid of any life signs, no heartbeat. No breath no consciousness. You're such a strange yet interesting contraption. She whispered. Aliathra planted her ears onto the ship's surface and began to listen intently inside if there were any faint traces of anything she could discern, despite the thick platings between her that the inside of the metal boat was indeed hollow as if there was an enclosed space containing the faint echolocated detections of objects being stored there and a few faint murmurs of voices too faint to be discerned comprehensively for her. Quite puzzling however, the elf wasn't able to spot any kind of door hatch or opening of any kind that would allow anyone to store or withdraw the contents stored within. Then just as she thought of it a loud but smooth moaning sound growled the ship from its dormant state, erupting the metal boat to life. Aliathra stepped back slowly, still under the influence of her invisibility potion marveled at the metal boat's awakening. She saw four giant furnaces that were implanted by the stern of the alien vessel erupt in a brilliant blue flame on her right like the star metal forges that the elves crafted their enchanted weaponry from. The noise the furnaces emitted blanketed the sounds of rampart that its broadside perfectly blended with the painting and metal curvature design of the metal boat. She barely dodged out of the way as it descended to the ground laying perfect right in front of the pre-made red carpet expectantly for a lavish guest high importance to board the vessel. Aliathra looked beyond the ramp and noticed that she was blessed. The ramp gave her an entry point to explore the inner sanctum of the metal boat. She discreetly, after making sure she is still in the clear, the elf princess quietly ascended the ramp and snuck herself in plain sight. The first chamber she saw was a large room made of metal of a light shade of grey compared to the ship's ebony exterior. It had yellow streaks that was plastered around the room that were designed in such a way to give information and highlight work spots rather than give any aesthetic value. Dozens of large container boxes that were locked by an invisible lock that the elf cannot find to use her lock pick on. It looked like it is a cargo bay that doubled as an entrance for the metal boat beyond the horizon. There was a large arch that was placed right out in the open. She slithered further into the next room. In contrast to the cargo bay, the room was designed to look like some sort of observation room. There was a large window over 20 feet wide in length that gave the elf a beautiful view of the Gleesian sunrise with a selection of comfortable seating arrangements that allows anyone to relax and watch ever display that the giant window presence. There were even several articles of food that were lazily placed around the observation deck for the crew of the metal boat to indulge it like chips, fruits and drinks. For Aliathra, she could not help but conclude that this very room is cozy for one to waste their time in after a long hard day. Such an establishment reminded her of the royal parties back at her homeland that would involve observing rare flower blooms and rare astronomical phenomena like eclipses and shooting stars that the elves loved to watch from the comfort of their opulent spires. Then, a loud series of thumping noises alerted the elfses. There were people approaching her position. Despite being invisible, her spell was now waning and she can't just waste her mana potion again until she is in the clear and left metal boat. She swiftly hid behind one of the chairs below the observation room and buried herself silently as the first people unveiled themselves from the doorway hoping that they simply pass by. It was Prince Klovich's sister Princess Arya. She was being escorted by a small entourage of handmaidens and bodyguards alongside several familiar people that the elf recognized. They were Vincent Diaz, Abidai Root and Dr. Lee Hainanel to name a few. They were soon followed by a big burly man in a strange metal armor with giant arms tucked behind him. 
He fitted the description by the Terrian populace of the famous ogre breaker who held a giant gate from closing with his Herculean strength. Another person that passed by were a contrasting couple of black and white. A man whose skin is dark as the night sky who walked confidently alongside a woman in a richly made dress whose skin is almost dull like in its paleness, like a vampire and their age defiant physiology similar to the elves. Another man then lastly three commanding figures walked out of the arch, it was a woman in red hair and two other large men who has dark black skin. One of the black men carried a large strangely shaped backpack with a stick coming out of it while the other was decorated in, in glistening gold and precious metals. The packages have been secured inside the manila, the red-headed woman saluted. Excellent. Everything should be in order for your team's departure Lieutenant Rose, the decorated black man said. Aliathra recalled from Diaz that he answers to a Lieutenant Rose. She is surprised that his commanding officer is a woman of all things. May I ask a question before you leave Major Holyfield? The Lieutenant asked him. Again, if this is about the investigation on that plane's incident with those Legion garrisons, don't worry. I got one of the best we got on the case. Your job right now is not that, but it's making sure the packages have a good time in Kesselheim. Holyfield answered. As you say Major. Rose saluted followed by Holyfield's. And Lieutenant, while you're there, enjoy the Raymond while you are there if you can. I heard it's delicious. Holyfield smiled. Farewell Major. She waved goodbye. I'll see you in the other side. Holyfield turned round and pressed his right hand on his ear. Captain, everything is in order. Prepare for takeoff. Godspeed, he said to himself. All passengers and crew on board the Manila please prepare for takeoff in one minute. A voice echoed out of nowhere. Lieutenant Rose jogged out of the observation room from another door to rejoin her squad. She was alarmed by the voice's announcement. She needed to get out of there before the metal boat flies off with her in it. The elf got out of her hiding spot and quietly yet hurriedly approached the archway leading to the cargo bay. The door she had previously entered the ship before was now slowly closing after Major Holyfield got outside whilst waving goodbye to the departing ship. Aliathra dashed towards the closing window of escape but it was too far for her and her elven swiftness to cover in such a split second. No. She yelped as her body slammed the now shuttered cargo bay door that walled her off from the outside world. The elf princess is now trapped, and we have lift off. The same voice from earlier announced again. Aliathra could feel her center of gravity invisibly pull her down as she felt the entire metal boat push itself upward. Without any way to secure herself, the elf was being helplessly thrashed around the cargo bay room. She quickly covered her head with her hands to protect it from any possible trauma that she might collide whilst in her helpless state. Ascending 20 kilometers, 40 kilometers, 60 kilometers, 80 kilometers, the Manila's captain's voice announced. Aliathra, after being tossed around like a ragdoll around the cargo bay soon felt her body slow down to a weightless state as she now for a brief moment experienced the lofty position of being weightless. 100 Ladies and gentlemen, we have exited Gleasia's atmosphere. Welcome to space. Enjoy the rest of your flight with us. Turning on artificial gravity, the captain announced before signing off. Aliathra's brief moment of weightlessness was cut short when she felt the force of gravity pull her down to the ground landing roughly on her backside with a great toe off. After scratching off the pain from her buttocks, the elf absorbed the words from the voice earlier. Was it all true that she is no longer in Gleasia no more? But now she is in this space that the voice said, is space the eldritch dimension where these other worlders come from? She had to see it for herself. She made her way back to the adjacent observation room and looked outside of the window. No, Aliathra sobbed. She saw a giant sphere in front of her that was slowly getting smaller and smaller as the ship continued its journey onwards. She could almost no recognize it if it weren't for the familiar shapes of Gleasia's continents gave it away that the giant circular object with blue and green splotches was her home planet. Aliathra's invisibility spell soon wore off as she collapsed to the ground crying, Neneth, protect me. She prayed fighting back from all the tears and broken panicked inhalations. Princess Aliathra Lytha. 
youngest daughter of the elven royal family is trapped inside one of the other world's spaceships and is slowly drifting off to the void of outer space away from her home to God's nowhere for her. What will happen to her now? Will she be able to come home safely or will the ruinous powers of this strange and dark void turn her mind inside out leaving her broken forever? Chapter 16 The Space Between Worlds The dark void of space was set alight to my dots of burning stars as it painted the glass viewing window of the Manila's crew lounge. The room, unlike the observation room below deck was cozier for one to sit back in relax thanks in part of a small kitchenette equipped with ready-to-eat, microwavable food and a refrigerator stocked with drinks of both alcoholic and non-alcoholic varieties a small 4K television that broadcast satellite TV channels for the crew's viewing pleasure. Strider Group was given the privilege of using the lounge for the duration of the trip, although one crew member did mention not for anyone to touch his sandwich. For Samantha at that moment, it was her opportunity to have some much-needed alone time. Despite being quite a sanguine person, the lieutenant is only human after all and in some cases, she needs some time for herself alone to reflect and simply just sit off the worries of her numerous command responsibilities. She aimed her eyes at one of the soft and cushy chairs that littered the room and crashed her behind on top of it. She let out a sigh of relief as she sunk her body down the chair. Thoughts of the events that have transpired earlier circled through her mind. At first, they were buzzing annoyingly like flies to an exposed cadaver but slowly they stopped pestering her besieged brain off of their stressful infections and now have become more coherent for the lieutenant to reflect upon. Earlier that day inside the ship, Samantha was called forth in the communication room of the Manila by the Honorable Anusa Chairwoman D. Popho to be given the responsibility, alongside Sergeant Crocker of being tour guides for the Gleasons to Kesselheim. With Lewis' experienced knowledge of the industrial planet alongside Samantha's valuable people skills, they should be able to make a lasting impression on the other worlders upon the benefits of befriending, and consequences of being an enemy, of the youth. A quick tour of several of Kesselheim's many tourist attractions such as the foundries that fuel its economy the metropolitan megacities that house the billions of its workers and finally end it all in the most serene and the bleeding edge of youth technology, the Kesselheim Garden District where Princess Arya will get her reconstructive surgery. There was only one problem that Samantha couldn't get out of her head, this was also her first time being in Kesselheim in the flesh. She had heard of the sprawling industries the city has as its trademark image from only books and the television. She can easily explain away most of the simpler machinations that the myriad workings of the industrial planet have to offer like holograms, digital advertising, and canned goods, but she fears she could crack under so much social pressure. She was a soldier, not a public relations officer. Rose throbbed her head back as she continued to let out an angry but shrill roar before she sank further into her chair. E.R. You fucking scared me LT. Crocker's cockney voice spoke behind her. The half Brit and half Maori automatic rifleman wore a sleeveless shirt exposing his brilliant muscles in their tribal tattered glory. He carried with him a single glass cup and a bottle of whiskey with him. He quietly sat on the chair beside Samantha on her right side and placed his bottle of whiskey and cup on the coffee table. He kicked his feet on top of the table caring less of what any of the ship's sailors might complain of his slight abuse of their hospitality. You seem to be roughed up eh? Crocker asked her. He splashed a few milliliters of his whiskey onto his cup. Yeah, Croc, I am having been roughed up. Samantha sighed. It's about what the chairwoman said earlier. She confessed. Really? Just that? A simple hearts and minds job? Come on LT, really? Crocker questioned with a dismayed face, his hands still swirling the golden water on his cup, stirring the alcohol to release its rice scented aroma for him to inhale indulgently. It's not just that. It's who we are playing tour guide to, Samantha argued. Crocker maintained his capricious mask as he shot down and once strong gulp the whiskey through his mouth. He exhaled a relaxed ah his breath now reeking of alcohol. You sure you're cut up to this? LT? I can talk to some of the HR people right now about you right now if you want. Maybe we can have someone else do. 
No don't, I can do it. Samantha exclaimed, no bloody way Rose A, eh? I can see it in you. Lieutenant there's something wrong with you. Crocker pointed out. Samantha was taken aback by her previous impulsive stature, she had to admit it was rather boneheaded of her to say she will do something but regretted it and tried to pull her statement back. It was emotionally defeating for Samantha that she collapsed. I I just feel stressed out right now. On what? On everything. Work, Diaz's antics, combat stress and now being a tour guide. I can't say no. I just can't. Samantha exclaimed before she dropped her voice in a sullen tone. She thumped her breast repeatedly in self-loathing as she leaned forward in a semi-fetal position and pulled her crimson hair, undoing the neat donut bun in the process freeing her flowing mane to beyond the boundaries of her shoulder. You sound like you're addicted. Crocker consoled. I don't take drugs and the last time I drank was four days ago Sergeant Rose addressed Crocker by his title resentfully. Resentful of her hectic first days of military life, she hadn't mentally insulated herself for the harsh psychological and physical demands of being an NCO in the youth military corps. No, you're addicted to work. Crocker diagnosed her. Have you been looking at yourself in the mirror lately? You were the greenest lass I had seen in a long time when I first saw you back in the EO dem but now look at you. Your sags got fucking sags on your eyes. He pointed out to her face. She had to admit, she was very neglectful of her sleep lately. Sometimes she would escape out of her bed and do several activities under the conk days of her sleep colleagues such as writing down reports early, performing physical exercise workouts and even cleaning her rifle in a display of obsessive compulsiveness. The young lieutenant would recall back at West Point that she should always as any self-respecting NCO should routinely do, the recollected echoes of shouting drill instructors who ruthlessly evaluated on all of the cadets' overall performances tearing them up a new one for even the most minute of errors. Sam, in a machine-like trance, would do all of the standard drills and tests with high-speed precision. By sheer muscle memory, it was meant to mentally prepare the cadets for their jobs as commanding officers in the military. It was no wonder that the youth NCO cadet training program had an 80% dropout rate and the lieutenant was lucky to make it over to the right side of the fence. You. You're. Right. She conceded, raising her posture up slightly so her arms that rest on top of her bent knees can support the weight of her body. Look Sam, I may be technically a rank lower than you but ultimately it's the seniors regardless of our rank job to make sure the next gen is prepared to take our place when we are gone. Lewis counseled. We are enslaved to the whims of our brain and the pain stress. The trick is to master it. He continued talking while he poured another few drops of whiskey on his glass, but instead of taking the vessel to sip up another round of the intoxicating brew, he slided the glass across the coffee table to Samantha up to an inch of her knees. Take a round of the bourbon. My mates always say you will never know a lad till they get sloshed. Crocker prompted. Sam took the round of bourbon with her hand and raised it up to her mouth. She could feel the distilled stench the alcohol emitted that shivered her spine. She placed the rim on her lips and after a slight moment of hesitation, she shut her glass down in one gulp. Already her feminine and albeit more fragile frame was now hit with the rousing influences of the 50% alcohol content of her given beverage. Her mind felt the tight knots that cramped her loose and like silk giving her a serene moment of lucidity. Where? Where do I begin? Samantha began to tear down her walls that barred her from showing her true self to others. My dad died a year ago before I could graduate. Mom still isn't over with it. And I just found out fairies, dwarves, not midgets mind you. Elves and magic now exists, the lieutenant told Crocker. You're under some pressure, aren't you? Crocker asked. Damn right I am, the child of the hero of Bel Aviv in the military, I get it. The good old fashioned military brat, you trying to live up to your father aren't ya? Yes. Samantha nodded. Here's a tip but first sip another round for me will ya? Crocker requested. He poured another few milliliters of whiskey at the glass for her. Samantha took another shot of liquid courage before collapsing down on the chair, eyes reddened but mind released from the pestilent grips of heavy mind. All that pressure. 
It's how the Chinese would say bad Jujikai, ignore all that shit LT, Crocker said. But why? I have a legacy to fulfill, she replied. You see, that's the problem with you Rose. This is the problem with legacies. Your father is your dad and you are you Rose. Crocker sternly argued deep down inside. You're trying to get out of it. Your father's shadow? Crocker deliberated. Yes, I just don't know how. Samantha briefly paused. Do you? She asked him. I'm afraid I cannot answer that. You can though. You just haven't found Lieutenant Samantha Rose, the great pioneer explorer of Gleesia yet or something like that I mean. Come on, it's like we have been inside one of them stuck in another world stories that were popular in the early 2000s. Heck, maybe we should like say this after we manage to survive another battle with the aliens, Strider team leveled up. With the final fantasy ta 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 Music. Crocker smiled. Samantha couldn't help but drink to that. She gave the most heartwarming of smiles she had ever expressed herself to anyone for a long time and downed another glass of their whiskey. She was felt much better about her own predicaments when having a one-on-one -on -one session with her more experienced subordinate than just simply reflecting on an easy chair alone. Dash meanwhile in another section of the ship, Dash. The voices. They just keep rattling her head in their incomprehensible whispers, their language as mysterious and as chilling as the legends of the demonic echoes her people repeatedly tell stories about to their children to make sure they remain good and faithful servants to the gods. Far from home, stuck in a literal belly of the metal beast and hungry for who knows how long, Princess Aliathra, the once confident spy for the forces of order is laying down in a fetal position within an inch of her life and sanity. Nenith hear me. Nenith hear me. Nenith hear me. She prayed while she rocked back and forth slowly. Her hiding spot was a small gap in between two giant metal crates that was big enough yet compact enough for someone to discreetly lay low in between. The silence was nothing scarier for the elf as she began to cry tears of desperate prayers to the goddess of life. She begged for a sign, any sign that Nenith is still favoring one of her most faithful of maidens. A whiff of a homely flavor reached her nose. It was a soft smell that was inviting for the panged stomach of the elf. It was pulling her, tempting her to follow it. With her options decimated to the most basic of instincts. Aliathra crawled out of her hiding spot and walked entrancingly towards the source of that sweet smell. She passed by the holes of the spaceship aimlessly each limp of her malnourished legs wobbled ever so weaker for every inch of ground she gained. As she got closer the source, sailors walked past her with second glances on the strange knife-eared young lady who made her way past the door of the ship's mess hall. The said source of the tempting smell? A plate filled with over three dozen freshly baked chocolate chip cookies made with love, passion and Cadbury semi-sweet chocolate. It was laid neatly on a checkered table with glasses of milk set next to it, not caring if it was some sort of eldritch illusion or some form of physically manifested temptation by the powers that be. Aliathra aggressively grabbed the cookies and gorged half a dozen of them in her mouth like an animal who hasn't find any meal for days. The sweet chocolatey taste of the cookies exploded into her taste buds like a musical orchestra that stimulated her brain with the pleasure of indulging in one sweet tooth. She could have easily lost herself into that moment if it weren't for the sudden eruptions of light that came from the room's nearby window. It was only half as large as the observation deck's window but it still gave a crystal clear image of the beautiful void and color palette canvas that is outer space not caring again for the stunned look on the sailors who were all turning their eyes on her weakened stride, Aliathra looked onto the window. They were gigantic, judging from the depth of field. Massive metal boats that soared through the celestial skies, cutting down the void of space like a knife through bread. They swept through space as they made their way onto another group of metal boats of similar but more crude design compared to the aesthetic features of the approaching flotilla. From what she could count, there were about twelve of the contemporary ships. The contemporary space ships had long snouts that turned as instantaneous as the sharp curve of a doe-eyed elven woman looking at a brand new curiosity when she's off at Earth Island's bazaars. 
the snouts let loose a rapid-firing barrage of energetic magic bullets that shot through the field across them. The shots had visible blue tracing that Aliathra could see with her own two naked eyes like arrows as they rained down on the obsolete-looking ships. The magical shots exploded upon impact and tore through them to scraps of dismantled scraps of burning metal. The shooters. They simply just stood there in a stoic display of their awesome power over their adversary. And it terrified her. If this is just a small glimpse of the power these demons have then no weapon, mythical monster or even gods can do to stop them. She could see it now. Tyrion twisted into a parody of itself in demonic architecture, Slaeja in flames and worst of all Eth Island and the rest of Alfelnora's lands being raped, pillaged and burned to the ground. Her people, her family and herself enslaved to the despicable whims of the other worlders, and she's just right in front of them. Their eyes widened in alert that an intruder, an elf has trespassed inside their ship. Aliathra was alone, cut off, exposed and hungry. All the long years of investment of her time and efforts in ranger training. Learning the healing magics of the Neneth Hospitalia priestesses and tutoring of all the known knowledge of the world. It's all worthless now. She's dead, good as another screaming soul enslaved to the madness of the ever-hungering ruinous powers of the demons. Lionel Ramathed in Albone Inchilla. She spread her arms out and whispered what she believes are her final words as she embraced the firm grasps of the youth sailors as they took her away to her fate. Dash an hour later at the Manila's brig, Dash, tensions were high and question flew around over the mysterious stowaway. It was supposed to be a very entertaining naval exercise about an hour ago. The ship so happened to pass by a shooting drill for the youth navy and the Anusa deemed it helpful that in order to impress their Gleesian guests, they get a front row view of the military might of the navy ships as they test out their various weaponry ranging from railguns, lasers, and torpedoes. But the whole event was thrown into chaos with a spanner in the works. A lone stowaway of Gleesian origins of all the that somehow made her way inside the ship. Rather expected for someone who stowed themselves away, the young woman who had elvish leaf-shaped ears was hungry and twitching with fear as she sat down in the interrogation room, her eyes sullen with a still sadness that stared nothing but the empty grey table. Samantha couldn't help but empathise with her. Being somewhat dragged away from her home and just simply fathoming the circumstances she is barely able to comprehend, this lone woman is at best, had the same look of a space-sick passenger on their first time on a spaceship and at worst, she doesn't even know what a spaceship does or do. That's all I know about her okay? She was one of most recent buyers of my fruit. I can't imagine her being a spy. A bee dire testified to the captain of the Manila. I'll take your word into account private route. The captain nodded. Lieutenant, standard procedures say we have to take her into the Bureau of Intelligence. He reluctantly informed her. That's too cruel. Samantha protested. Having the Bureau take care of the poor woman would only worsen her now already fragile or in a better description, further shatter her psyche. But then again, the captain has made a point. When news got out to Major Holyfield and Colonel Polonsky of the extra passenger, both men, despite their differences agreed that she should be turned over to the BI for interrogation. It was way too coincidental for some random native to just walk right inside a restricted access logistics ship for no reason more than getting lost. Yet Samantha wasn't so sure about the intruder's demeanor. Real spies would have been much more stoic if they were in the unfortunate to be captured by the enemy. The blonde-haired and ocean-eyed woman was way too emotionally despondent to be truly harmful. Hell, the search on her belongings only brought up an intricately created dagger half a dozen of arrows and about to shoot them with. There was more to this story than what meets the eye. If anything, this could all be just a misunderstanding of some sorts. If Diaz and Abidaz were of any merit to her character, the elf's name was Aliathra that she can be sure and she was just a traveler passing by Tyrion based on their accounts. Captain, may I request something? Samantha asked. I need you first to delay reporting her into the bureau. That's against standard procedure lieutenant. The captain shot down. Please. There's just something that doesn't add up. She defended her hunch. Again, 
This is against the procedure. Let the bureau based in Kesselheim take care of her. Would they appreciate if I can get some information out of her before they get their hands on her? You know to make their jobs easier? Besides I am a great people person. Talking making people do what I want them to do is just my thing. She coaxed. You can be stubborn you know that. I like that about you. Diaz complimented. I can't believe I am actually thanking you for that one. Come on. Pass me the lie detector and give me about at least 10 minutes with her. I can get her to spill the beans. Samantha appealed, clasping her hands and swaying them forward to beg the captain to let her do what she believes is the correct thing to do. Fine. Here's the lie detector. Should work on her like anyone else. 30 minutes. If she doesn't say anything useful, I will have to call the BI and then this will look bad on your record. The captain warned her. The lieutenant was taken aback by his warning. She knew that any wasteful actions of insubordination of any kind could spell a giant permanent mole in her career at best and a court-martial at worst. If her little hunch failed to bear fruit then she would stain the heroic legacy of her father and military family name for years to come. But deep down, Samantha took heed to both her own beliefs of there is a larger story to everything around her and the words of her unofficial on-field mentor Sergeant Lewis Crocker, that she thinks that this elf woman was somewhat innocent. She just knows it. That is a risk I will take sir. Samantha saluted. She was handed over a small portable electronic device that could detect the heartbeat and breathing of an individual to see if they are hiding the truth or in emotional distress. Additionally, she was also given the key to the elf's holding cell. Hope you're right about this boss lady. I can't stand seeing such a nice looking woman go to the bureau. I hear they don't fuck around, got the scars to prove it. Diaz said. He pulled down the neckline of his shirt to reveal several slash marks on him. A souvenir he obtained from the BI when they captured him. I swear by you. That I think you're on to something LT. She's just way too doy to be harmful to anyone. A B Dyer added, after listening to her attending subordinates' comments. Samantha unlocked the door to the interrogation cell to finally meet face to face with Aliathra. The elf intruder remained sitting quietly on her cold bare steel chair with her arms laying on top of the matching metal table. Samantha quietly attached a padded wire on the woman's chest and another one below her right wrist for the lie detector. Being so dejected from her own reality and some sort of bubble to shield herself from the threatening conditions she was in, Aliathra blankly stared into the nothingness as Samantha finished attaching the wires to her, she sat down across the table and faced the elf, her dark brown eyes contacting her as your colored ones. It's a nice day is it not? Samantha greeted. Aliathra could only continue her blank stare into her interrogator unresponsive to her salutations. You seem to be quite nervous, aren't you? Would you like me to get you anything? Samantha politely asked. Again, no outward physical response, yet the lie detector sensed that her heart palpitation alongside her sporadic breathing indicated that she is getting very anxious. It was most likely the contentious atmosphere of the interrogation cell that is withering her away from reality. Samantha had to reduce all of the built-up stress she had accrued throughout her long stowaway journey inside the ship. The poor girl could really use someone to talk to after being alone. It could drive even Samantha crazy if she were in the same predicament as the elf. She needs to know that she can trust her. You know. Miss Elf. You seem to be quite scared of being here in our spaceship. It's your first time in here if I can guess. Samantha softly probed her while keeping her friendly tone. Yes, was the single word response that Aliathra quietly answered. Well, you look terrible right now hungry even. Nobody would be sane if they were hungry. Me too myself even. I can get you some food if you like. Some very warm food just to tone down all of that a negative energy you are having. Samantha said. Aliathra nodded yes. May I have a glass of two glasses of hot chocolate and two grilled chess? Samantha requested out loud. She didn't want to face the one-way mirror where the captain, Diaz and Abidia were observing the interrogation from less the elf is alerted that the seemingly out of place the large mirror is in fact hiding a trio of observers. A few minutes passed until one of the sailors walked inside the room and served their freshly made meals. 
The hot chocolate had steam smoking out of its rich and creamy body whilst the grilled cheese had both the subtle aroma of the cheese and the burnt ashes of freshly pressed toast. They each had one of the two requested items. Samantha took a bite out of her sandwich, sipped her drink and maintaining a smile throughout her snacking. You know, whenever I feel anxious over something I always would go for a sandwich and drink like good old grilled cheese and hot choco. Samantha began to converse. Which reminds me myself. May I get to know your name? It's awfully rude for me to just call you Elf. You have a name. Do you? Samantha broke the ice by a simple question. The real questions will have to wait. Aliathra, she answered. The lie detector showed no signs of any abnormal activity in her readings which mean she is telling the truth that it is indeed her name. Taking the signal from both the friendly demeanor of the red-headed lieutenant and her own instincts, Aliathra took a bite of her food and drink. She gave a evanescent smile after tasting the warm meal on her tongue. It was a small glimmer of progress for now. Samantha must press forward, hoping to gain more ground in winning the elf's trust. Samantha pushed away the table gently that had separated her and the elf between a grey cold space. She needed to connect not only emotionally to her quarry but also physically. Eliafra, that's a beautiful sounding name. Samantha smiled. She slides off her chair closer to the elf maintaining her eye contact and warming smile. It means truthful light in elven. She began to get out of her shell. That sounds very nice to hear. Tell me, since your name sounds rather scholarly, what do you think about this ship you're in? Samantha challenged her. Well it's like a boat made completely of metal. It could also fly into this black space I saw. Aliathra answered hazily. Her emotional dam still holding firm whatever secret she has locked up inside her barely holding mind. That's because we are in the void of outer space. By my calculations we are about several light years away now from Gleesia. Samantha said. I'm how far? Aliathra jumped from her seat spilling her hot chocolate on her robes. Oh no. The elf began to cry. Don't worry. Let me clean that up for you. Samantha offered her a towel she kept on her pocket. She proceeded to wipe off any of the excess spilled liquids from the elf's roguish garments but the brown stain stick stubbornly at the cloth ruining its aesthetic value. Samantha had to admit, she only seen those types of clothes before in those medieval fairs and comic book conventions during her more innocent days as an adolescent youth. You must be scared of your first time on a spaceship. A lot of my people have that experience before. Samantha consoled her. Look at me. Take a deep breath and count 1 to 10 slowly then imagine a drawing the number 8 slowly. That always helps getting rid of your nervousness, she instructed. Aliathra closed her eyes and inhaled. She counted to each number from 1 to 10 for every time she can finish mentally visualizing the number 8 being slowly drawn. She opened her eyes and realized that her initial shock has initially died down to marginal deductions. You will get used to it Aliathra. It takes some time, she congratulated her. T thank you. Ah, uh, ah. Uh. The elf tried to give her gratitude to the stranger but she wasn't able to give her name. Samantha. You can call me Samantha or just Sam, she said. Thank you, Samantha. I feel better now. A bit. But better. Aliathra said the lieutenant's name. You know, you're lucky we found you today than later. You looked like you haven't eaten anything for the past five days. Samantha said. I have been in a demon world for only five days? Aliathra asked. He faced painted with astonishment. Demon world? Samantha asked. An equal amount of surprise was also plastered in her emotions alongside the agape expressions of the captain, Diaz and Abidai from behind the one-way mirror. Did the Gleesans think that the youth are demons? How? Huh? Was it because of their incessant usage of metal which the natives often associated the substance with an infamous villain figure from their legend? Samantha could have sworn that when the sailors apprehended Aliathra, she could have heard her say the word all bone. They said Steel Butcher who according to the legends was either someone who sold his soul to demons or is a demon himself. You must be mistaken. I am. We are not demons, Samantha explained, but all of those metals your monsters, your magic, they, I, 
It defies all logic. Aliathra questioned. Well anything that's sufficiently advanced enough can be mistaken for magic I can tell you that. Are you scared? Samantha asked. The elf nodded quietly yes. Her face betrayed a sense of anxiousness that grew within her, she shivered and covered her knife-tipped tears in fear of hearing the faint roar of the spaceship's engine like a child who cowers under his bed when lightning strikes. By empathizing with her, Samantha couldn't help but conclude that her seeing the youth and all their machines and equipment is akin to a child fearing rush and rumbling sounds of loud and giant equipment that with their scary shapes tore through the ground molding it into what they see fit. I can understand you. I was scared of them too once. Those beasts or machines we call them can look scary. Bah. When I was a child I would always hide under the table when they did their work. I would cry, scream, among other things whenever I hear them. Samantha reminiscence her childhood. You say it like it no longer scares you anymore. How did you conquer that fear? Aliathra asked. My father would gently pick me up from the table and held onto me tight while I cried. I would ask him dad. Why do they destroy the dirt and make those noises? He answers to me you see my little red riding hood. They do that because they want to build something in its place. A house cannot stand without its foundation. The bigger the whole noise they make the bigger the house it will be. He explained to me. In short. The more machines that do more of their job the bigger the place they can build it from. Samantha explained. A soft smile was made from the memory of her late father. What do you build? I have never seen nor heard of such architecture in all of Gleesia. Aliath repressed. Her frightened demeanor lessened as she relaxed her posture, replacing her fear with curiosity. Many things that help us expand. Homes for people to live in. Farms to make our food. Schools for learning. We are all just like you but better. Samantha answered. But demons. Cannot create. Just. Destroy. Aliathra whimpered in befuddlement. Do you really think we are demons? Why is that? The fallen meteor. The eye. It was just like what the visions say. You even fit the legends. Beings of metallic skin. We have to stop you from destroying us by destroying you. Aliathra explained. I? Fallen Meteor? What are you talking about? What do you mean by we? Is there more of you? Samantha zealously asked the elf to explain her cryptic statement. But the elf sunk her head down in shame over the sudden sitting there silently. Too scared to give up whoever her compatriots and masters were. Samantha knew that if she can crack who Aliathra answers to. She can strike a bargain with her in return for not being dragged away by the Draconian Bureau of Intelligence. Hi Elfie. Aliathra threw a look at me. Rose picked up her right hand and held it firmly with both of her hands. Their lithe feminine limbs connected with each other as Aliathra, astonished by Samantha's desire to connect empathetically with cause her to rise her head back up and looked at the red head with her own ocean blue eyes. If Rose's body clock can sense the time, Samantha knew that her limited time to get a confession was about from the elven intruder is almost up. There are people outside this room who will take you away and do horrible things to you if you don't cooperate. Samantha informed her. Then you are indeed demons. I was almost about to be wrong about you. I thought you and Diaz were different. Aliathra scowled. But I can help you. Don't you want to see your home again? I am the only one who stands between you and a one-way ticket to Guantanamo prison. And believe me, you're too soft for Gitmo. If you tell me right now I can assure you that you will have safe passage back to Gleesia. Samantha answered, but Aliathra continued to scowl silently at the betrayal of Samantha's hospitality and compassion. She couldn't believe that all of those small talk and casual chatting was just a way to degrade her resolve in order for the metal demon youths to siphon valuable information from her wayward mouth and naive mind. Then suddenly the door of the interrogation room opened. It was the ship captain followed by two of his sailors that entered the room. Time's up. Take her away. He coldly ordered his men. The two sailors with their burly arms grabbed both of Aliathra's arms and lifted her up from her chair, spilling her half-consumed chocolate and sandwich as the elf kicked and screamed. No wait. I am so close. Samantha protested. Too late lieutenant. Men. Take her away. The captain shot her down. Despair and hopelessness filled Aliathra as she struggled in vain to break free of her bonds. 
the sailors dragged her away from Samantha as they closed into the exit where her doom will be. As she was being carried away she looked at Rose again. To her bewilderment she saw a genuine sadness in her face as if she had failed her somehow. Her sullen eyes and a single tear escaping that trickled down her cheeks convinced the elf that perhaps there was truth in what the red-haired lieutenant said. She advocated for their destruction yet all the times she has met the youth, they showed nothing but kindness and even bravery. The time Diaz and Obedia saved her from the sea devils was a selfless display of their willingness to protect strangers coupled by Obedia's hospitality. Dr. Hana's kindness and Samantha's empathy for her was the exact opposite of what demons would do. In a slowly emergent moment of clarity, Aliathra remembers how concerned her parents were regarding the humans and their vaguely prophetic visions of a coming end days where all of Gleesian civilization would end by the hands of outsiders. Was Grandmaster Owen wrong about his prophecies? Aliathra reflected on the technological advancements they have and although the tall buildings of glass and steel were alien and not to her aesthetic affinity. She does appreciate how they can construct such large buildings in such a short period of time which was impressive to her standards, and it's hard to impress an elf due to their well-established notions of technological and cultural superiority. Being on top of the food chain however can be boring and even stagnating. The last great scientific breakthrough was through the discovery of mysterious precursor ruins in the southern deserts of Zanagrad which was sponsored by Ethylan archivists and lawmasters. Other than that, the constant warring amongst the peoples of her world compared to the relatively peaceful coexistence that the youth enjoy amongst themselves and the Terrian populace which have begun grassroot projects to uplift them from their medieval stasis was an idea long thought impossible progress. All this time, I thought they were here for our destruction. Maybe. Just maybe. Are we the demons? Wait. She screamed right before she was about to exit the door. The captain halted his men giving the elf her moment. She had nothing more to lose from then on, but yet, there was a feigned hope that grew inside her that maybe, just maybe these demons are in fact angels in some sort of twistedly humorous reinterpretation of the comet's prophecies. I dot it's. It was Emperor Ralden. Slaeja, she answered. Aliathra began to explain all the lingering questions that she was thrown at by Samantha. She told them how she was assigned by her people to assist the dominant human civilization, the Slaeagians in investigating the Jeltogar's comet omens, while omitting any fact that she is in fact the crown princess of the arcane bloodline of the Lethas. She also informed them of the time they blinded the eye from seeing life on the planet. That must explain the missing probe. Samantha exclaimed. Probe? Aliathra asked. Like what you said? It's like a scout of sorts. An eye you keep insisting. The lieutenant explained. And we were scouting out the ground that will be the location for the new Albany colony. The captain added. Then by your own logic. We didn't stop you from coming to Gleesia. We emboldened you. The elf realized. She cupped her cheeks and began to shed soft tears of lamentation. Weeping for the bleak future of her world. Don't be too hard on yourself Aliathra. You just had no idea. Samantha reassured her. It's just so satirical for me. An elf of Alfel Nora to be actually found in a state of callowness. We are supposed to be the greatest keepers of knowledge in the entire world. She complained. From where we come from. That's a damn lie. You will always learn something new every day. Samantha crossed her arms. Well everybody from the humans, the dwarves, the elves, the orcs, the Dampiri and even the beast folks are going to learn about you in the most blood spilling inducing way possible. Aliathra warned. Her tone had an air of accusatory branding. Blood spilling? We would never deliberately try to attack you unprovoked. Samantha defended her nation sternly with her feet put forward in the ground. I am not saying your people are psychopathic murderers if it's the Slaeagians who are going to crusade down to Tyrian in their desperate bid to stop the apocalypse. Aliathra forenamed the big military plan the Empire is secretly concocting. Crusade? What crusade? Samantha's A's widened. They are convinced you are the metal demons of Allbone coming back to devour the world in steel and fire. 
They also think that Prince Klovich and the rest of his principality have fallen into corruption by your hands. The elf explained, My God if this is true, then I need to call some people quick. Captain, patch me to Inspector Leon Reed. Samantha requested on it. The captain ran out. Dash meanwhile back at New Albany Sheriff's office, Dash, I will see to it. Inspector Leon Reed nodded before disconnecting his video conference screen. The inspector absorbed the scent of Lieutenant's latest findings which is the reason the SLA agents attacked them was that they somewhat mistaken the youth colony's landing and foundation of New Albany to be the return of the demons that had once terrorized the planet hundreds of years ago. At first such a ridiculous statement would have been brushed off as deranged ramblings. But ever since the existence of fantastical creatures existing in Benham 3 slash Gleesia, such fantasies might have to be considered as realities. He walked out of the communications room with the biggest yet most outlandish possible lead in this most convoluted case he has ever undertaken in his career as an inquisitor of the law. An ex-sheriff of a small colony town in one of the more underdeveloped planets of the youth space. The inspector throughout his 33-year-long career was more used to the petty crime and civil squabbles your average backwater settlement would entail. He had never expected that instead of the usual desk jockeying and the typical petty crime case would be paranoid citizen living in fear of the new world the colony has faced. There were many notable individuals who expressed concern over the fact instead of the expansive empty land that the Anusa claimed that Benham III entailed were now forced to coexist with the natives who out of their own justified disbelief are straight out of fantastical pop culture. The news of magic, which the phenomena has been looking for a rational scientific explanation underway by Dr. Malona. Existing has caused the ugly little monster known as xenophobia to take root among several residents such in the case of several businesses to refuse service to the Gleesons unless proven otherwise that they are not having any undesirable affinities. The inspector couldn't blame them for it. People will always fear what they could not understand. Turning away from the communications room, the inspector quickly went back to his current work interrogating the survivors of the ill-fated Slay Agent attack on the Eastern Plan's excavation. Now turned prisoners of war, Reed had a sizable pool of interviewees to interrogate. Keyword had. The prisoners have barely refused to eat nor drink anything for the past week and some have already died due to malnutrition. They have kept stored in only responding with their full names, military rank and no more but the former mentioned. But now armed with Samantha's demon invasion theory, the inspector will try a new strategy. Inside the storage room of the sheriff's department are the decorations for the various seasonal earth holidays that the office would paint their workspace in the mood for. There were decorations for Christmas, New Year's, Valentine's, Labor Day. Foundation Day and most important of them all for Reed's unconventional interrogation strategy, Halloween decorations. Scavenging through the dusty boxes, he looked for the one box that indicated its purpose for Halloween decor until he hit the jackpot. He brought it out of the shadow of the shelf and lifted the flaps and began to unpack its contents. Where is it? Where? Aha! Uh -huh. The inspector pulled out the one item that could help him confirm Samantha's theory on the possible motive of the attack on the youth that fateful day. An adequately made silicone devil mask, its crimson skin alongside its monstrous fangs and ebony finishing would make a perfect demon disguise. He will take advantage of the Gleesian superstitions if he has to get what he needs. He tied around the crude plastic fasteners on his head and walked out of the storage room. After ignoring the perplexed gazes of his peers, he made his way to the interrogation room where his latest attempt on extracting information from was held. A Vorbrun Brunke, a regular foot soldier of the 8th Eastern Legion based in Tyrian who had the unfortunate fate of being captured by the youth and taken with his fellow surviving comrades blindfolded to the holding cells deep underground of the sheriff's department. Throughout their imprisonment they were quiet and selfishly neglected virtually all food passed to them that the rotten stench of expired nourishment could be scented inside their dark dingy cell. Vorbrun, arms bound on the armrests of his chair sat quietly inside the single lit interrogation room. 
His head was lowered down and his eyes closed as the keenest observes can examine that his mouth was murmuring an unintelligible tongue like if he is praying to whatever he and God, s he worships. In his own bubble of comprehension, it seems like the Slaeijin was dragged to the darkest pit of hell where the punishment is the silent and eternal separation from any form of graceful salvation from his God, s. Read. Wanting to exploit playing into the Gleesian superstitions began to beat with palm of his hands the steel door of the cell. In the rhythm of menacing ambient rhythm, the poor prisoner was broken out of his placid state as he was alarmed by the dreadful beats. Vorburn's eyes began to express panic as he sweated bullets down his malnourished and pale face, gently pushing the door open, read, under the cover of the dim shadows that the lights couldn't reach, began to in a rather amateurish display, careened intimidatingly towards the prisoner with explosive steps and misshapen positionings of his body. It worked like a charm as his target was now trembling in fear. Why hello there, Vaubrun. Reed provocatively introduced his bedeviling persona. He stepped into the ceiling light with the Halloween mask on his face. No, no, no. You are him, aren't you? Nenya protect me, the prisoner cried. Reed faked a sinister laugh, mocking the man for crying out to his deaf deity. Oh human, Tumi, Tumi, Tuman. She cannot hear you. Reed leaned on Vobrana's ears and whispered with graceful manipulation of the prisoner's degrading mental defenses. I know your name demon. Stand back and face the Holy One's wrath. He pulled out a last-ditched effort to protect his still untainted mind. His heart began to race yet his posture betrayed fear as he shivered upon Reed's clever disguise by the inspector's intuition. If knowing the name of the demon is such an important thing to know when facing them, then perhaps such in the similar vein of horror movies whose themes. You claim to know me yet do not bother to say my name. Even in hell this is rude, the inspector refuted. Although he doesn't know the demon who he is impersonating's name, it would help if he gets to know who he is impersonating just for the sake of knowledge of it or it's just his own intrusive curiosity of the culture of the Gleesons that teased the inner fantasy nerd within the inspector. I might as well devour you whole. Reed curled his arms to shape them into claws to shock his mark into thinking he is about to eat him. Stand back Hawkhedron, horned defiler of souls. Vorbran yelled. Ah, you, you, you. Reed recoiled backwards feigning injury by placing his hands on his breasts as if he were suffering a critical heart attack. Yet the prisoner continued to be fooled. He heartened himself thinking that he could overcome this trial of faith. You. A such a pathetic fool. He turned back up from his wounded gazelle gambit and diabolically moved up close to Vorbrun, dropping his hands on the arm's rest and his masked face just a mere inch away from the prisoner. The Slay Egan's heart plummeted to dangerous levels as all of his hopes were dashed by his insidious interrogator. All hope is lost for my soul. But not for the nation. He sunk his head down his body slowly shutting down by the extraneous pressure that the inspector pushed him to. It was the emotional opening that the inspector needed to break through. Reed has to capitalize this opportunity now before it slips from his fingers. A grossly malnourished man when put under heavy exertions of stressful activity. Like mentally offensive torture could spell potentially fatal results. You sound like you still cling to a few scraps of hope. The quintessential human delusion. Already that emotion is overwhelming your logic and reason. Reed grinned. When Slay Eja and all the forces of order descend upon you from the Cambervale Valley to the west, we will purify Slay Eja of your wretched filth. Mark my words. Vorbran swore. Again, you demonstrated both your greatest strength and your greatest weakness. Hope which is blinding you from the simple truth. They will be crushed and there is nothing that anyone can do to stop it. Oh, how the inspector loves to quote the Matrix. The architect was just one of the most compelling one-scene wonders in film that Reed had savored through the classical movie archives online. You are wrong demon. We have studied your kind before and we have been exceedingly well in banishing you to whence you came hellspawn. I may perish here in this abyss. But my faith is resolute, my brothers will descend down from the valley to surround you. Then their blessed arms will come for you and we will beat back the darkness and cancel the end times. 
We protect the burning light of civilization that had brought order from this pandemonium that Mother Nenya in all of her love created. It is finished. The man collapsed as he faded into an anorexic collapse. Reed quietly walked out of the single lit room with his mission accomplished whilst an emergency paramedic rushed to the aid of the dying Legion heir. You know, you're lucky that the Gleasons aren't part of the Geneva Convention Inspector. Colonel Polonsky said, he awaited alongside with his colleague Major Holyfield outside of the door the inspector exited from. But now this case is moving much faster now. I commend for your rather unconventional method of questioning. Tell me, what did prisoner number 785 AWN said again about seeing us as demons? Holyfield commented on Reed's mask, taking off the Halloween mask. Reed inhaled as he readied himself to speak his findings. From what I have gathered, these lie agents have prophesied some sort of future where bring out some sort of apocalypse upon them. They see us as these demons coming to destroy their civilization in fire and steel kind of talk. They also have taken our probe that we had sent during the scouting stage of the colonization effort and fooled with some sort of illusion spell to think that Gleesia is empty of any souls to eat. Reed reported with Lieutenant Rose's findings. I got the news from Strider Group. She didn't explain though how she got the information but judging from what I heard with the prisoner, the theory might actually be on point. Polonsky nodded. I can agree to that. Holyfield added. Yes, talk about such a self-fulfilling prophecy you know. If they hadn't tried to blindside the probe we wouldn't have been here like this. Reed said. Indeed. But now to more pressing concerns. That prisoner said that the Slay Agent army is gathering in some sort of place called the Cambervale Valley and unfortunately we do not know where that place is. Polonsky regrettably answered. Maybe there's some people back in Tyrian that knows where it is. Polonsky said. Then I will leave for the city at once. Reed saluted the two commanders before turning tail and heading off to his car. Wait before you go. Can you stop by and check on further Bishop Holyfield asked of the inspector. Why, he is there on our hearts and the minds in Tyrian. I heard he's been teaching basic education to people about us and our knowledge but some of the local powers down there see him as radical. Onuzu is growing concerned for his safety. Holyfield answered. He should be in somewhere inside the dwarf Luya Amirian's trading company HQ. The major directed. I'll stop by. Reed acknowledged. Godspeed to you. Polonsky waved the inspector off. The two commanders turned round and walked together back to their command center. But on the way, Major Holyfield whispered to Colonel Polonsky, I want to understand from you militiaman. Did you understand clearly what that prisoner said? What is most likely inevitable with these lay agents at this rate? What do we do? Polonsky asked. Two things. We organize and dig in. He sternly advised. Both the commanders gulped apprehensively at the mere thought of a war with a medieval empire. Although the youth has the technological and in some way a home field advantage, what the Slay agents make up for their lack of guns is their potentially massive manpower pool that they can tap into. And that's not accounting the unknown factors of magic which is still being carefully studied by the science team asymmetrically speaking to the Gleason's much more studied research on the Unbinilium mana crystals and their arcane powers. Dash about a few days later at the orbit of the industrial planet Kessaheim Dash. Aliathra stared in awe at the brightly lit surface of the dark side of the planet Kessaheim. The surface was brightly lit with thousands of dots of lights that come from the sprawling megapolizes that dotted the planet. After changing her stained Elven Ranger clothes, with a more down-to-earth casual shirt, she sweated slightly nervously as she could feel the gravity of the ship shift downwards as it makes it descent to the planet. Don't worry pointy ears you're going to love it here once you get off of the ship. Diaz walked in next to her. He was smiling like an excited child whilst his cybernetic arms twinkled with delight. In an unusual way, Aliathra found the metallic fingers, who in such lifelike imitations to the real living tissue wants to be delightful like seeing newborn pups making their first steps into their new lives. You're very ecstatic to be here. Why is that? Aliathra asked. I, used to live here. Vincent replied. Really? Tell me what is the place like? 
How long will we be here? The elf asked. About seven days. Diaz answered. Will you be staying in ship or are you going to go with Samantha? I rather actually see this than stay in the ship. But why can't I come with you? The elf asked, perplexed by Diaz's evasive grammar. I got some business to attend to for Sammy. I can't let you come, but it will only take a while. If you like after I am done I can take you around with Cain and Iris. With the vampire? Can you trust her? With our lives. He leaned over the elf's shoulder sternly. But then again, after all of this work we gotta do we can play around for a while. I can show you the shopping streets, the fine restaurants and to end it all, a visit to Cabahan Gardens to stop and see the flowers. You're gonna love it there believe me. Diaz smiled. Are you courting me? Aliathra asked. Yeah. Somewhere in between a yes and a no. I just really love to be in the company of beautiful women such as you. Diaz flirted. Well I am flattered to join you later on your expedition. Good luck with that business you have to do. The landing was smooth and methodical as the captain of the Manila safely landed the logistical ship at one of Kesselheim's starports, one designated for military vessels. Samantha had to steward their official Gleesian guests when they grew concerned over their first time flying concerns. The lieutenant expertly expounded their guests about how their meta boats worked with antimatter engines which can propulse their ships at great distances in such a short amount of time. Princess Aria and her entourage were shocked to hear that in terms of distance using the approximate sizing measures of Gleesia, they are about several trillion Benham 3s away from home. She had to console the young girl on being such an exponential distance away from her brother and country. Remember, you are on a mission princess, to prove to your brother as an act of goodwill that we the United Federation of Earth are your friends, don't you want to see your brother happy when you can finally walk? Us being friends we can perform wonders together almost like miracles, Samantha said. The princess wiped away her tears softly as she rose up from her knelt position. You are right. I have gone too far to give up now, Arya courageously said. Indeed, we all are my lady. Samantha bowed down to the royal. You would make an excellent courtier in another life. The princess smiled. Where did you learn such manners? She asked. From some experts on royals like Tolkien, George R. R. Martin and C.S. Lewis to name a few. Samantha answered. Well I hope these manners experts come to Gleesia one day and teach the peasant folks how to be decent with one another. She eagerly requested. Yeah. I'll see what I can do about that. No guarantees that the youth can bend over for you. That far, Samantha chuckled at Arya's ignorance. We should wait here for our bus to arrive. It will take us to the orchard district where the people who will make Princess Arya walk again live and work in. Samantha told the Gleesons who were all eager to venture forth in one of the youth's most economically important planets in their empire. They oozed with anticipation after learning of the fantastical technologies and magic that the youth are capable of harnessing with ease. For people born from a medieval castle town where water, food and other basic necessities are enslaved to the whims of nature and human hubris, it was like they just entered to the gates of heaven itself. But that can't be the same said for Diaz. Ken and Iris who were just told that starport luggage handlers couldn't find their belongings in the ship's containers. Although not initially understanding the distress, Aliathra approached the cybernetic Filipino. She didn't any money, or other valuables due to them being confiscated and she would only get them back when she returns home to Gleesia. What's wrong? Aliathra approached Vincent. My stuff. My stuff. Diaz murmured. Don't forget ours too. Ken and Iris said. My god if it's somewhere else but here then it's going to be like finding a hay in a needle stack. Diaz exclaimed. That sounds painful to just dive into a needle stack. But I would actually love to see you bleed a bit for some of that blood of yours. Iris snarked. No. He didn't mean that literally snow. It's metaphor. Ken said. He invented the nickname for Iris due to his trouble pronouncing her codename Sakagoya. He won't dive in. Shame I actually wanted to have a taste of him. Iris sulked. What is Amy Tar for? Aliathra asked. 
It's like a figure of speech, an analogy to describe something but not in a literal sense. When I said finding a hay in needle stack, I was describing the painful search of looking for my belongings in a pile of other people's bags. I mean there's millions of them. Diaz exclaimed. Oh, I see. Like those bards would sometimes say. I remember this one time the bards who would sing back at my father's home during parties. They would sing to the maidens on how the doors to their souls is a great poem of radiance. She poetically recited. That's a good one. Kane smiled. I got another. This one is coming from my mother. Iris be ready to listen to this. You learn more when you lose than when you win, he said. What do you mean by that one? Iris asked. Well if I hadn't beaten you in that fight we had when we first met you wouldn't have known about us and now look at you. From a reclusive witch to one of the most important experts on Gleesia, he said. And also, I would have never met you. Cain gently brushed some ill-positioned hair from Iris that had fallen down her forehead. The vampire could feel butterflies in her stomach as the Nigerian engineer curled his hand around her gently. The man. Her nightman had been pushing to be nice around her and whenever she had a question about the youth's technology and superior knowledgeable awareness of the many mysteries of how the world works by carefully explaining all the details in a natural and almost childlike use of grammar during his tutoring. Unlike those scholars who lock themselves in their opulent academies where they speak in tongues alien to the common words everyday people would use. She had loved every moment of being with Cain whether it's through his unofficial tutoring sessions and more personal casual conversations. The vampire couldn't believe now that she is actually developing more intimate feelings for the nightman. Excuse me, Diaz. Vincente Diaz? A sharply dressed man approached the four. He was accompanied by half a dozen or more men behind him in similar clothing. Yet their elegant clothes that could give an image of professionalism was betrayed by their gun holsters that the men sported openly on their torsos ranging from shotguns, rifles, and pistols. Their faces were uncannily sober with their eyes pointing to Diaz, Aliathra, Ken and Iris with dagger-like malice. At a glance, it was a menacing scene of intimidation. They were all unarmed and out of money to pay off these thugs away. Elf shook in fear at the sight of these men. Afraid they might hurt her in her mana deprived state which she has noticed within herself some time after being stowed away inside the spaceship earlier. Her spells began to fizzle out or miscasted due to not enough mana she could siphon off. They could easily have their way with her if they forced themselves upon them with their guns and brutish mechanically augmented body parts. I am scared. The Aliathra shivered. Stay behind me and don't say anything. Diaz whispered to her as she shielded herself behind Diaz's body. Who are they? Ken asked. We are a Paro Corporation. Madame. The mysterious man unsheathed his pistol and cocked it to be ready to fire at a squeeze of the trigger. My colleagues. Everyone. Diaz confessed. Chapter 17 of modernity, megacorps and life. Hello again Diaz. A man pointing a .45 pistol in Diaz, Aliathra, Ken and Iris general direction affably greeted. It didn't also help the fact that several of his associates also aimed, yet discreetly to not avoid a scene in the public starport terminal. Their weapons to multiply the amount of force they can apply on them. If Diaz could remember his old boss M.O. when it comes diplomacy, Speak softly and carry a big or a lot of sticks. Aliathra throw hid behind Cain and Iris fearing the worst after her harrowing time being stowed away and nearly driven mad with the isolation and all the demonic corruption dismissed as severe case of hysteria plus Clark's third law according to Lieutenant Rose. Cain shielded the blonde-haired elf as he stoically stared down on their hostile welcoming party. Even Iris took up a faint combative stance ready to unleash all sorts of magical missiles at them if they dare twitch their trigger fingers. Well if ain't dare runner, how's your little exile going on? The lead gunman asked Diaz. He was a stout man in an intricately designed polo shirt that was completely unbuttoned to expose his sleeveless undershirt beneath it. His hair was slicked backwards creating a low dropping fade lined up to create a shiny top for the semi well dressed man. All sorts of crazy shit, some usual some you won't believe. Diaz answered. You know we have all been in this business for years Vinny. Try us. 
He challenged his disbelief. Well there I was in shitty prison garments and all the fucking second there's some crazy Harry Potter shit flying around me. Then I got conscripted, saw some more crazy Harry Potter shit and Diaz tried to explain briefly the events that transpired before his arrival until the soft click of a cocked pistol alerted his ears. Now he is staring down the dark empty barrel of a .45 ACP pistol. You expect me to think after all this time since you left which is, I don't know, three months. You come back here and save the day? He told threatened him. Whoa, what the hell happened when I was gone? Diaz diffused the slowly escalating tensions. Ever since you got booked the other gangs and corpos been trying to muscle in now that one of Aparo's best men just got out of the equation. One of the triggermen said, damn, three months and or already the competition is stepping up? Was I really that important? Diaz asked again the lead triggerman. Pretty much. But that's besides the point boy. He said before slowly asserting himself forward and pushing his pistol closer to Diaz's forehead. You now work for the Federation now, conscripted or not. A likely story. How can we trust you? I mean Harry Potter? That old fucking kiddie book? So, you saw what? Dragons, fancy schmancy lasers and unicorns? I call bullshit on that, the trigger man said. His finger began to slowly inch towards the hair trigger of his pistol ready to blow the penal soldier's head clean off. For the cane, Iris, and Aliathra, the situation couldn't get any worse. Their sweat began to trickle down their foreheads as the two female magic users in instinctual self-preservation conjured their magic gradually ready to rain fire down on the triggerman, but Diaz smiled comfortingly to them in contrast. Would you dare say that when I am holding this? Vincent said as he held up a white-colored smartphone from his hand. Cain observed keenly that the device is not Diaz's own smartphone. The leader's eyes widened with alarm as he quickly checked his pockets until he reached out and revealed to his hands to everyone's horror. A grenade with the pin removed. Shit. The man reactively yelled as he threw the grenade away from them. In a panic motion, everyone quickly ducked in cover as they covered their ears for the grenade to explode. Except for Diaz who was standing confidently at the same position with a prideful grin painted on his lips. Relax Bobby. That's a dud. A training grenade. Diaz diffused. Besides, I needed to get back on your fat Italian on that tic-tac prank you did to me. He scolded. But that was three years ago. You still never forgave me for that April Fool's prank I did? Bobby questioned back. Relax. No one is supposed to get hurt today. I know the master wants to see Iris and the crystal on my little bag righty here. Diaz waved around the briefcase containing the unbinilium sample. You know could have done anything but make me play hot potato with. That's a Gen.5 Militech frag I see. Or a model at least. Bobby said wistfully. As if disappointed. Hey, Bobby, Bobby, Bobby. Don't worry about that. That one may be a dud. But these Diaz unzipped his jacket to reveal a whole cluster of Militech General 5 fragmentation grenades. These aren't. Diaz smiled. Ha ha ha. Classic dare runner. You didn't change one bit. One of the trigger men laughed. Holy shit. Do you know how much the boss has been pestering everyone to get their hands on those shits? They've been stepping up in the security lately and we thought it was too late to grab them when they were being shipped out for deployment to the military. Bobby said in astonishment. How did you manage to get them from the armory? Kane asked frustratingly. Earlier during the trip, Kane helped the sailors inside the ship secure a batch of next generation military gear from the Militech Corporation. Oh, that's actually a very interesting story to say, but a good magician never reveals his secrets. But since I am your friend I might as well tell you a bit of how I did it. Pornhub. A glass of lemonade and a smashed bottle cap. I have seen seek grocery stores with better security than that armory. Diaz explained with a hint of sarcasm as he passed over the bleeding edge weapons technology to Bobby before cordially slamming his hand behind Bobby's back and shoulder in a display of fraternity. This fatty right here is Robert or Bobby to his close friends, Chef Yongchen. Diaz introduced his colleague to his companions. Ah. 
Pleasure to meet you Mr. B. Yankin. Aliathra mustered the courage to emerge from Cairn's back and shook the hands of the stout man with gentle grace. It is a pleasure to meet you Iris, Robert said, but I am Iris. Iris interjected. What? You're the witch girl the reports have been saying? Robert exclaimed. Yeah the black haired one is Iris and this is. You. Aliathra. An elf girl that we. A. Eh? brought along. Diaz explained sheepishly, I was only told that a magical lady from that Benham 3 planet is coming here to meet the boss. Damn, that leak must have been way off, Robert said. Leak? What leak? Diaz asked. Keep this between us. Some hackers managed to breach through the youth military comms and got some word around about an iris coming here to meet with boss Aparo and that you, Diaz is coming. All the gangs and corpos paid a fortune to get what data they managed to decrypt, but the net runners only managed to get only a fraction of the whole email out. Robert whispered to him, Damn it, well I'm only going to be here for a while though, let's get it over with. Diaz replied, Wonderful. Please everyone, come in here to this limousine. Robert waved his hands backwards to point to the elongated vehicle. The other men, now relieved of any form of worry, retreated back to a small escort flotilla of luxury SUVs behind the limousine and revived the roar of their engines. The sudden sound of such a mechanical beast reminded Aliathra of the roars of manticores and other similar perilous beasts that roam the wilderness of Gleesia. What a long carriage, Aliathra commented. Well you will love the inside of it too my lady. Robert smiled. Oh, you are too kind. The elf politely blushed. The four entered the limo and comfortably sat down on the luxury leather seats that the vehicle had implanted on its passenger compartment. The limousine interior was in a powerful coat of black. There was a small refrigerator that stored drinks alongside glasses meant for a variety of alcoholic drinks ranging from beer mugs, wine glasses, and shots. Alongside that is a 24-inch plasma TV that can display in 4K graphical settings on all TV channels under the youth sun complete with a theater-style sound system. Driver. Take us home. Robert ordered pull down the driver's compartment window. After taking it back up the window to ensure their privacy, Robert reached into the refrigerator and grabbed a bottle of chilled red wine and five wine glasses. So please, Entertain me this moment Iris, is it true based on Dare Runner's accounts that you are a witch? Robert asked as he poured a couple of milliliters of Cabernet Sauvignon onto Iris cup. That is correct my dear. I am a witch in practice of the arts of the school of destruction, enchantments, and conjuration. Iris answered. Well, Miss Kadahagan, I believe you know a little bit of why you are here now. But not even one of our best field operatives of our company can fully explain to you the sheer magnitude of a Para Corporation so now takes this opportunity to ask several questions, because Diaz here can be rather distracting in his conversations. He slightly snarked at Vincent. It's just muscle memory Robert. I wouldn't be here today if I couldn't be a bit. Bipolar. Diaz shrugged. How large is your company of yours and Diaz really is? Iris fired her first question. Apara Corporation is the third largest mega corporation in all of the United Federation of Earth. We specialize in building industrial equipment, pharmaceutical. Pharmaceutical? Iris interrupted with a question to an unknown word. Medicine and doctor equipment. You know Diaz's augmentations? The artificial metal looking stuff he has all over him. Yeah that's our work. Robert answered. And I can't wait to get this piece of shits out of me. I need some real power. Diaz commented as he one shot did his red wine down his throat. Back to what I am saying. Pharmaceuticals and civilian grade weapons. Robert said. Is there anything you would like to ask? I got one more. Why is Diaz so roguish? Iris asked. Roguish? Robert replied with a single word question. Bamboozled and gashed by such an armor piercing question of a paro call more unethical business practices. Even Vincent himself could feel his artificial heart fidget. Well you see, we can be very competitive but it's only because our rivals here are just as equally competitive. Robert tried to tactfully deflect Iris' statement. Aliathra meanwhile sat quietly on her part of the limousine however. 
her sensitive instincts could feel the intentional side-tracking of Robert's statements about the humanoid abomination that is Vincent Diaz, a man who insists he's alive yet deep down, what forms a human is not been molded by the warm caring hands of the Creator Mother but through cold machines produced in mass quantities and putting a price tag on such gifts of life. It honestly made her feel disgusted yet she was equally as curious on how such artificial creations made from the ores of rocks and the blood of trees can imitate life in such a detailed manner so indistinguishable from the genuine counterparts. Yet such existential philosophical conundrums can easily hurt the young elven princess turned spy from her fish out of water experience in another world. She looked over to the window of the car and quietly observed the myriad alien objects that flew past her. She saw great tall trees made of the reflective surface of glass that reminded her of the graceful architecture the elven spires would incorporate in their cities, although in her case usually due to the limitations of raw materials and manpower output, such a project would only entail once, but in Kesselheim they were all everywhere as common as trees to a forest. What also dazzled her were the thousands upon thousands of moving bright images of people foods and other objects that advertised their businesses upon the walls of said glass spires. Yet most disturbing for her were the people, men, women and even children walked the Kesselheim streets dressed in all sorts of apparel. They wore a huge variety of clothes of differing fabrics from soft cotton to tough tanned leather which looked worn out compared to the more refined cotton ones which came in clothes of sleek black or creamy white. Yet despite their humanoid shapes, what the elf found uncanny were the large discolorations and anomalous bumps found scattered among their bodies. Each person had a differing cybernetic augmentation ranging from the simple limbs all the way to the more complex optical eyes. For a devotee of the creator Mother Nenith, they were all mockeries of natural creation yet somehow, the more the white mage observed the mechanical body parts, the more she thinks that they were not abominations but nigh perfect imitations, or even superior copies of the real thing if the way how these orgs made people like Diaz perform superhuman feats. But what horrified her more is that she also remembers Diaz mentioning of getting better orgs when they arrive back in Aparo Corporation headquarters. Just what could be even better than superhuman agility from Diaz or Herculean strength from Crocker, whom Diaz and Cain would often tease behind the brute's back with his cockney accent. We are here. Pull up now. Robert pulled down the driver window and ordered. The limousine parked in front of a large opulent tower in the middle of a very affluent commercial district filled with classy restaurants, haute couture boutiques and luxurious condos. For Cain. When he thinks about his squadmate Diaz, this was expected from the mega core controlling the youth economy from their high sprawling buildings. Money? They don't need to worry about it, people. Their very names alone can rally people behind their domains. Power? They are power. It was always about power, money and people to the corpos. They were practically overflowing with excesses of all three. Just a phone call word or even a simple finger point and the economy shifts, or an army can be deployed, or a troublesome individual becomes incapacitated. Just the unscrupulous thoughts of what the corpos are capable of doing made Cairn feel uneasy and sick to his stomach, but in the end, corpos are a necessary evil if things back in New Albany, Glesia are to be developed into a thriving extension of the youth reach through the stars. So many untapped resources like the unknown but possible unlimited potential of the element 120 aka Unbinilia more mana crystals might be just what the colony needs to get some much needed development. This better go our way. Ken spoke to himself as he grabbed the briefcase containing the mana crystal sample from Dr. Malona and exited the vehicle. Diaz felt like he could kiss the opulent Kesahai mayor with open arms as he was finally back in more familiar grounds. Excitement rolled into his smile as he turned to Aliathra. You are going to love it here Elfie. Once this is all done, I can take you to a nice restaurant and even a boutique to get rid of those. Dirty rags you have there, Zara, Marks and Spencers or maybe Dior, I guarantee you're going to love everything there, he said to her. You're so very kind to me with such lavish gifts. But may I ask why? Aliathra asked. 
She was never so sure why such an affront metallic parody of a living thing can be so attractive to a serene elven maiden such as herself let alone an elven princess. Well you see, you're such a pretty girl and all. And then there's that thing that happened to you back in the ship and I just wanted to make it up to you. I hate it you know when. People, like a beautiful thing such as yourself go red teary eyed all over me. It gets me weak. Vincent blushed at her response. Before barely returning his own. An adorable moment for Diaz that Robert and even Kane, who shared a minor disdain for Mega Core, couldn't help but crack a small grin to see Vincent in a position like that. It was indeed a moment of weakness for such a Byronic individual. Well, I have no reason to refuse, and you are indeed correct. I could use some new clothes. Aliathra nodded, before the group was ushered inside the Aparo Corporation. HQ urgently by the security guards but not before Diaz pumped his elbow backwards in a silent triumphant yes. Score. Feeling in his heart. The entrance to the corporate headquarters were of a classical Roman architecture, with marble floor made out of the company's colors of black and gold which swirled itself into its solidified form like two contrasting colored flavors of ice cream that have melted and allowed to collide with one another. The next there were the Corinthian order columns that are more of a decorative item than having any form of functional purpose. Complementing the classical themes of the reception hall was several vases of flowers and classical statuettes in blank white color. Iris was heavily impressed by the elegant change of aesthetics. She could almost feel reeled in by the pretty roses that dotted the flower vases but as she went up for a closer look. She realized that the flowers were fake and didn't have even soil underneath the vase's cavity. Quite beautiful isn't it Cyrus? Ken asked her. I am just disappointed by the fake flowers here. Iris sulked. I just hope you don't get hurt or worse while we're here. Ken said. Why hold such concern on yourself? Is it maybe because of me? Iris questioned back with a flirty tone. No, it's not you it's them. A para corporation. You can never be safe with these corpos, they are profiteers above all else. They won't hesitate to do unsavory acts just to be able to make a penny more for their pockets. At worst, this Don Apara might try to cheat his way for a deal that only makes him win and us lose and at worst, some private time with you in exchange for investment arms. Kane warned. So, you do care for me. Iris called the Nigerian out. Yinn, yes. Just let's get this over. With now, Kane deflected. Mr. Mudwin, you know I will remember that forever you know? The vampire witch smiled as they boarded the elevator. It had a glass framed window that shows the headquarters' luxurious welcoming hall from the outside and its marble floor reflected the noon sun that shined down on them. The lift soon got to work as it closed the door and immediately the machine's pulley system spun to life as they were raised up to the ground. Aliathra was caught unprepared by such a sudden burst of climbing force that she fell down bottom first to the ground, slightly jolting her tailbone. Careful there. We got a long way up to go. Diaz gave out his hand pulled the elf maiden up. Touched by the gentlemanly gesture Aliathra took the cyborg's hand. Her lithe fingers bade contact with the cold metal synthetics of the Kesseheim native. She still had trouble balancing herself up but as she regained her footing, she accidentally pushed her body close to Diaz's chest awkwardly cupping her hand on his breast. In contrast to the cold surfaces of his skin. His torso and core were warm to the touch like a furnace being burned brightly within him. Aliathra's cheeks reddened as she recoiled back. She cannot believe that she, a practitioner of the magical winds of life and devotee of the Creator Mother is slowly falling for a metal abomination. Was it because it almost perfectly replicated a human which shared many physiological properties with elves? You can save that for later baby. Once we are done, you're going to. Okay. I got no fucking flirty catchphrases. I am so used to just insulting people who aren't me you know. He laughed. The elevator rang a sharp bell indicating that the lift has arrived at its destination. Don Aparo's rooftop penthouse and office. They promptly stepped out of the elevator and laid their feet on the Don's domain. 
It was a radically different setup compared to the reception hall that instead of classical decor it was more of a mix-up of modern interior architecture with several out-of-place decorations from all over the old earth world like medieval armor, a Chinese lion, an Arabian carpet, Japanese calligraphy portrait next to a Zen garden and a fountain, Sir Diaz, it's pleasure to see you again, and oh, you brought friends with you. I love meeting new people. A pure white fresh-faced woman in a maid uniform approached the new arrivals said. She was remarkably humanoid in shape when Aliathra observed her in face value, but a closer expectation of her was an uncanny valley that made the elf feel suspicious. Oh no. Your dress, the maid said as she gently grasped Aliathra's ragged adventuring garments. The moment her fingers touched the elf, Aliathra soon realized why she felt such suspicion. When her body made contact with hers, she couldn't detect any kind of life force within her. Unlike Diaz, who has a faintly human physiology, the maid had electrical veins that coursed around her body made of copper, and she didn't have a heartbeat for she was kept alive through a large container filled with even more veins that were bundled up together by an equally electrical liquid. The elf recoiled back. Her eyes widened with subtle horror leaving the inhumanoid maid confused. You don't want to have your clothes mended miss? The maid asked. Ah. My friend is a bit of a country mouse I'm afraid. Not used to seeing androids around. Diaz intervened. Just take us to where Master Aparo is right now please. He asked her. I see. The master is at his office like he has always been Sir Diaz. Follow me. The android maid told everyone. They followed her through the penthouse making pass even more luxurious furniture and other more exotic adornments that for both of the two Gleesian natives were downright palatial in terms of living conditions. Don Aparo was both living and maintaining such a home that his power and influence can be easily compared to kings. He even towers above the commoners with his rooftop penthouse giving one of the best mountainous view of his side of Kessaheim within a 60 mile radius. He's here, the android maid told everyone as she led them to a grand 15 feet tall black door with golden outlining. The robot pushed open the doors and lead the group inside Aparo's office. It was spacious with only a few scattered objects occupying the room. It was humble looking in terms of materials being laid out compared to the rest of the penthouse. There was a desk at the far side of the office with an office chair set facing a large screen filled with light that projected holographic numbers that randomly climb up or down in quantities. The group sat down on a group of chairs that the office had provided near Aparo's desk. Ken concernedly grasped the unbinillium briefcase nervously as the office chair rotated 180 degrees to face them. My dear runner. You walk up back here to Kessaheim with such the most outlandish things you know? Don Aparo said. To Cain's surprise, instead of a sharply dressed man in a nice suit, Don Aparo was instead in his bathrobes while wearing a pair of pyjama bottoms underneath it. His silver hair rather than slicked back was wet with his locks shining and forming sticky strands. It made him less intimidating than Cain could expect. Did I caught you in a bad time boss? Diaz asked. No, it's just that I was rather lazy today. My docs say that I need to let it go after some troubles happened when you were gone. Don Aparo answered. What kind of troubles? Vincent asked further. Leong Chin will fill you in the details later. But right now, let's head straight to business. Shall we? Aparo cut to the chase. I don't like the way he looks but I love the way he talks Cain. Iris whispered to him. I heard that. Vampire. Don Aparo told her alarming Iris. But I do not care if you drink blood for a literal living. What I am here for is something else. But first, please Miss Kadahagan. Do you know why you are here? Aparo asked. I. You. Here too. Iris stuttered. Come on let it out. Aparo said calmly and patiently but it could easily be reinterpreted as a very capricious aura of arbitration for the vampire witch. You're an unholy creature. Aliathra suddenly stood up and prepared her hands with a conjured spell of smite undead. Oh, another peon of Nenul again. Iris stood up and prepared her spells of her own, but as they were readying themselves with their magic abilities, Dozens upon dozens of red dots of light began to suddenly appear in front of both Aliathra and Iris's forms, 
There were upon about at least 50 fully armed cybernetically enhanced guards under Donaparo's employ that surrounded the two mages and aimed their rifles, shotguns and machine guns at the girls. You know it is very rude to suddenly start shouting and standing up so suddenly too in front of your host, Aparo calmly said as he laid back on his fancy office chair. He began to speak just like a stereotypical corpo. Cold, methodical but still somewhat artificially affable. Especially if he also runs one of the biggest private military corporations alongside his industrial business. Please ladies, ladies, ladies. Sit down and let's set your apparent differences aside, Aparo said. The two diffused their magic on the spot and immediately went back to their seats. The dozens of mercenaries rested their weapons back but are still on alert for any kind of troublemaking that the two mages could entail. They were obviously fearful what kind of magic the two can do to them, Don Aparo or anyone else here in Kesselheim. Diaz, I was told by you that you are only bringing one mage to see me. But I see two. Care to explain? Don Aparo asked. Well, she was a last minute entry. A. She's a princess from one of the far-off kingdoms of Vincent began to concoct a lie but he hit a speed bump when it comes to giving Princess Alie through a suitable cover story. He quickly scanned the vicinity of his surroundings for ideas yet his boss was an adherent minimalist that there wasn't much to work with. He looked back up to the holographic numbers behind his boss and took a quick look at the stock market section of the UI. She's from Ilzai, Diaz stuttered when he looked at the stock market Namo for Leusa Robotics, a company that had significant number of its shares belonging to Aparo Corporation. A. Luna Diaz continued to make up the name when he spotted the stock market name of Lunara Cosmetics, a popular Korean makeup company that is marketed towards women with very outgoing social lives. He even knows that Dr. Lee Hainanel has an entire cabinet filled with their creams and powders. No wonder she looks so angelic, Ills Luna Diaz exclaimed. You are stuttering there. Is something wrong? Don Aparo asked. No, it's just that these elven names. They can be hard to pronounce and remember. Well to be fair, Governor White has only just met her. Diaz cracked a fake smile before thrusting his elbow at Aliathra. Although her cover is slightly blown, the way the context of her situation is happening right now, Aliathra believes that Diaz is trying to help her albeit unknowingly maintain her secrecy. Since she has to play the part of the princess. She will gladly do since she was still raised above being a ranger to be the quintessential elven maiden. Of course, dear Vincent of the Diaz, I applaud you for trying to pronounce my homeland's name but you sir might want to keep practicing our very sophisticated accent. My name, my full name, is Princess Aliathra Silverinavils Luna. Aliathra said. She used her mother's maiden name of Silrin to cover her real last name of Lutha. Well it's a pleasure to meet you your majesty. Don Aparo placed his right hand below his chest and slightly bowed down from his sitting position. It's always great to have such powerful individuals come here to meet me. But I will get to you later Bella. That means beautiful girl in my mother tongue. That sounds quite beautiful sounding for such a short name. Aliathra complimented. Indeed, but let us go to the first Bella in the room which is Miss Quidahagan. So, tell me vampire, is it true on the accounts from Diaz that you can perform this magic? The corporate boss asked. Yes, I study under the school of destruction which is your fireballs and ice storms, conjuration which is summoning magic and enchantments which allow me to infuse magical properties to all sorts of objects. Iris answered. Interesting, he said. Would you care for a demonstration of your powers? He asked her. Well certainly, but I would have to use some of the Unbinilium's power to help charge my mana back if I may. Iris requested. Certainly. I already want to see how this new element 120 works anyway. Open her up Mr. Mudwin. Don Aparo turned to the Nigerian. Ken opened the specially built briefcase that was fabricated under the specified demands of Dr. Malona's initial research on its very energetic properties. 
Its brilliant blue glow when the container was opened filled the room in a marvelous azure hue. Even the mercenary guards that surrounded them couldn't help but marvel at the crystal's radiance. Here's also Dr. Malona's essay on his early research which also includes his request for additional resources and manpower to help fuel his unbinilium research. Kane presented a binder folder filled with papers of scholarly knowledge based on the lovable plump Hawaiian scientist's initial findings. Thank you, now as for you Miss Kadahagan. Let's see you perform some magic. Shall we? Let's start with some destruction magic, then conjuration and then finishing it all off with some of this enchantments you are so famous for. Aparo requested. Iris nodded and stood up from her chair and walked ten paces away from Aparo's desk where she can safely display her magical prowess to everyone in the room. She was nervous about failing to meet the expectations of this intimidating megacorpo. Ken quietly shoved forward the opened unbinilium briefcase. The vampire witch placed her hand on top of the ocean blue crystal and absorbed the powers within it. After taking a moderate sum of its energy, Iris stepped back and readied herself to clear her mind for her magical demonstration. She planted her feet sideward and aimed her hands to the ceiling and let loose a stream of fire from the palm of her hands, overcoming the azure filter of the room into a tangerine glow as everyone held their breath. Iris had to take care she doesn't let loose too much fire lest she lights the someone or worse the whole room on fire. Good. Molto bona. Don Aparo smiled as Iris dissipated the jets of flames. It was a sign of good fortune and relief for Kayan to see the Megacorpo actually being impressed by something quite mundane as a glorified magic show. Let's see you do this conjuration summoning magic you speak of now, Aparo said. Certainly. Let me think of what I should summon. Iris requested as she took in the moment to breathe. She needed to think what she can summon. Her best spell was summoning a young dragonling but it was often hard to control and the last time she did it, the beast nearly wrecked her old home. She also needed bones to summon up some skeletons, although she doubts anyone in Aparo's personal guards would be a willing subject, and then there's Vincent too but his body, due to the heavily used cybernetics in his body would make him incompatible with any form of positive or negative energy channeling, until she remembered the armor sets. She passed by on her way here. This could take a moment my lord. Iris said as she pointed her hands towards the door of Aparo's grand office. For a moment, everyone looked at the Snow White Femfort illegally but nothing of significant excitement happened. Disappointing everyone in the room. Well, where is it? Aparo asked impatiently. They're coming. I am just trying to get them here. Iris answered. Another moment was given for gracious purposes. Until... A knock rang on the door disturbing the peaceful quiet of the room. Iris promptly walked up to the door and pulled it open and out came two animated sets of armor walking, rather awkwardly, inside. Their march towards Aparo's desk and as they were about one meter away from the table, they knelt down in honor to their owner even though by mage standards and rules it's technically Iris who is the animated armor's master. Isn't that your 14th century bohemian and samurai Euro, sir? One of the PMCs asked. Indeed. Wonderful. I love it. Don Aparo applauded. Now my dear, one more demonstration before we talk business. Show me some enchantment. Specifically with a weapon. Aparo instructed. Iris snapped her fingers to let go of the magic that was being channeled into the armor de-animating them back to their original defunct form of decoration as they fell down to the ground gently to avoid damaging the centuries-old collector items. You give her your rifle. Aparo pointed to one of his mercenaries who without question but with a reluctant face gave his gun to Iris. Good luck. You're going to need all of it. The PMC whispered to her. She was handed over the weapon in a reluctant manner. Remembering the weapon's training from Kane. She made sure that the safety was off, the rifle chamber is properly loaded and cocked and proper shooting posture. The PMCs near her were impressed by the non-earthlings familiarity with their weapons. Did you taught her how to use that? Aparo asked Diaz. No, Ken did. He answered as he crossed his arms and grinned with a smug excitement. 
He can't wait to see the look on his old boss face when Iris demonstrates what he and the rest of Strider group has seen. Closing her eyes to feel the essence of the inanimate Euphosol trifle on her hands, Iris thought of what kind of enchantment she will implant on the rifle. She doesn't want to repeat her earlier fire storm so she had to think of a new spell for her performance. Awful Iris spoke in an eldritch language as the weapon's frame began to glow white in light and cold to the touch. She had enchanted ice magic into the gun just like how she did the same thing to the MGL back in Devico's mansion. She presented the enchanted weapon to the audience much to everyone's amazement. I have to say, this vampire sure knows how can Moliath speak. Aliathro admitted seeing such an affront antagonist to her chosen goddess to be proficient in her fields. I can see it glow. Okay, let me have it please, Aparo said as he walked out of his desk and approached Tyrus with his hand reaching out for the weapon. The witch gave it to him and stepped back as the Megacorp CEO took aim of the gun and opened fire. He shot several rounds of the magically enhanced weapon which when it impacted the empty walls of his office exploded into a burst of ice as frozen solid and potentially lethal doses of dried up ice. Then something uncharacteristic of your standard CEO happened. Don Aparo began to shed tears of happiness. You reminded me of me 60 years ago. Don Aparo said as held the rifle by his barrel and grabbed a cigar from his bathrobe's pockets. I was such a fan of magicians. My father would every birthday would send in a magician to entertain me and the other rich kids. I was fascinated by them and always wanted to learn the secrets of their power. But as I grew up, I soon found out that the magic they all did were all fake. Prestigitation they like to call it. I felt betrayed, I rarely smiled much. Until now. Don Aparo placed his right hand on the barrel of the rifle and let it hang down as he smoked with his left. The reason I insisted you come here was that I wanted to know, that there really is such a thing as magic in this world. You made this old CEO feel like a child again. He gave a soft smile. Everything that the new colony needs, money, materials, people plus more under one condition. I get an exclusive contract for building some of my businesses in Benham 3. Sorry, Gleesy Ear, he said. That will be up to Governor White for that. But I think you can work something out. Thank you for investing your time and resources to us. Ken gratified. No thank you. It's not every day you see a brand new element with an extra neutron on its atom. Now, Vinny my boy, let's get rid of those shitty orgs you are given into something more comfortable. Don Aparo snapped his fingers as his servants took the guests away with their boss in tow whilst a group of scientists obtained the unbinilium briefcase for their own research. Meanwhile, one of Don Aparo's guards backed away from the scene. He grabbed his cell phone and dialed in a number with shady origins. Dare runner is back. Track them. Tail them. Then kill them. He said before dropping the call immediately. Dash meanwhile back in Tyrian. Dash. And that everyone is how vertical farms work. Father Rudy Bishop said to a group of students and onlookers. Much to the applause of everyone in the room. Being a Salesian priest, it was expected of him to be a charismatic speaker and also an informative teacher due to the ideal example of the two founding paragons of the Salesian society, St. John Don Bosco and St. Francis de Sales. In the eyes of the medieval people of Tyrian, the priest was a revolutionary in the art of education. He insisted that his classes would allow both rich people to attend and poor people to also attend his lectures free of charge, and for his said lectures, the priest demonstrated several basic scientific knowledges of many practical fields that can jumpstart the citadel into a modern city that the youth can be proud of calling civilized. Even Prince Clovich would attend his lectures for some of the scholarly knowledge the priest possessed. Class dismiss everyone. Same time tomorrow and don't forget to keep what I said in heart. Especially you farmers. I hate to see another famine you guy keep being so worried about. Rudy said. Just as everyone has promptly left their chairs. Inspector Leon Reed approached the holy man. Greetings father. He waved hello. Oh inspector. I assure you there's nothing to worry about for me. So far my reception has been very warm in a most unexpected way. Bishop reassured the inspector. That's good to hear from you. So, 
You'll be going back to your house in New Albany now? Reed asked. Oh no, not yet. I have to go to the library nearby and fetch some books while I am there for my classes. Going to do some research comparing Gleesian magics to our science books. He explained. Well I'll be I am actually going there myself. Would you like for me to accompany you? Reed asked. Certainly. The priest nodded. The two went off of the makeshift school of further bishop and made their way towards the Terrian library. It was a rather humble establishment which was more of a glorified scribe's office than an actual library with scrolls, books and more importantly for Reed's mission, maps. But as they arrived at the scene, the pair spotted a gathering commotion of very concerned townsfolks looking at the library with fearful eyes as the scribes who were in office to that building were being evacuated by the Terriant city guards. What happened? Inspector Reed asked one of the guards. The scribes report of an undead white of sorts suddenly appearing inside the building scaring away the scribes and visitors. We are trying to dispatch the holy priests of Nenya over here but they are going to take a while to get here. The guard replied. There's still the chief librarian in there. Yelled one of the evacuated scribes. Damn it. There is no time. I need to get something inside that building right now and the youth does not want to wait. Reed readied his carbine. And I can't let some unholy mistake of God desecrate a center of knowledge. Even if your said excuse of science is. Aristotle Ick in comparison. Inspector, I will come with you. Bishop added as he carried over his shotgun that he keeps for self-defense. They ignored the warnings and pleas of the guards as they entered the empty library. Reed made sure that he radioed in backup to arrive as soon as things escalate into chaos and they are going to help in an ETA of one minute. For now. The two or at least just Reed is scouting out the building with Bishop to identify the perpetrator of the disturbance of the peace. Fallen books and scrolls fell down from their shelves when the occupants ran away in their panic. Bishop took great care not to accidentally step on the books but Reed in the other hand simply pressed forward stoically with his hands on the trigger. Stop. You hear that Bishop? Reed asked. The shotgun-wielding Salesian preacher focused his ears and he began to hear the faint sound of paper being flipped repeatedly. Is that the white? Is he? Trying to read one of the books, Bishop asked. Stay behind me. If I go down, don't act brave and run. Reed ordered. Yes. Bishop nodded as they continued on their slow trudge on the ransacked establishment. This is it. All of it. The histories. My. Lord. A feeble voice rang out from the silence. Leave me. I demand to be alone. A commanding but ghostly voice said. Out of the darkness an old white-haired man in simple brown robe ran away quietly until he was stopped by Reed. You're okay. What happened? Reed interrogated him. By the gods. You won't believe me for this. But the white is none other than King Martin. It's not much of a panic. The chief librarian informed them. Oh. That ghost guy that Stider group met. What's he doing here? Reed asked. Ever since you earthlings as you call yourselves opened his tomb. King Martin has been wandering around the principality lately. He mentioned to me that a lot of has changed for hundreds of years and he's having a tour of his lands. And this is one of his stops. The librarian said. Oh, he should be able to get out of this peacefully. I think I shall talk to him. Get out of here for now you. Reed dismissed the librarian and quickly ran away. The pair walked further into the library until they reached the middle point of the building where readers who visit can sit down and read upon a table provided by the librarian. And lo and behold there stands, or floats, King Martin of Old Tyrian. Greetings your majesty. Reed introduced himself. I got to say. I wasn't expecting that reaction when I got here earthling. Martin said as he flipped the history book he is reading. I got to say, the Slay agents did introduce some things I like such as the water wheel and roads. Too bad they chose to fight me rather than talk all because I practice necromancy. So, what brings you and that bald looking man here? Martin said pointing his bony index finger to Bishop. Oh we were just here to see that one. You are not causing trouble and too we wanted to look at a map of the principality for research purposes. Reed said, for a moment. I think I spotted a scroll of a map of my home right here somewhere. The ghost king said. 
He began to rummage his undead hands around the stacks of books and scrolls much to the impatient foot tapping of Inspector Reed. Here it is, I found it. So, tell me, Earthling if you want I can explain to you what I know of whatever you point on this map. Martin eagerly said as he placed the dusty map on the table to the view of Reed and Bishop. One place only in particular. I am looking for a what you call Camberville Valley. Do you know that? Reed asked. To their surprise, King Martin the White stepped back. His skeletal face, for lack of a better word looked like he had seen a ghost as his face stuttered to make a proper expression. Is something wrong? Reed asked. That's where I died. I fought there with my men, but I was struck down by the slay agents there. Why would you want to go there? Martin answered. I heard from some prisoners that some of the slay agents or some sort of some people are planning to do something in that place to will descend upon us and surround us the colony and or even worse the entire principality. Reed answered. Oh no. I think I know why they wanted to go back to that god's forsaken grazing grounds. They are most likely going to pull of the same thing that they did to me centuries ago. Martin exclaimed. Do what? Bishop interjected concerned. There's an abandoned Cyclopean underground tunnel network that is used to bypass the mountain passes and other defenses that can take us by surprise. I was foolish to think that it was a myth until it was too late. We must stop them before they can manage to reopen the tunnels. Martin said. Well we can easily fly in and Reed was about to reassure Martin before the Ghost King interrupted him. It's not that simple. The valley is to consider its lay agent territory and it's very narrow and treacherous for any of your flying birds to be able to reach without alerting the border forts or being torn away by the strong winds. Martin said, you make a point, do you know how we can get there quickly? Reed asked. Well, Cambervale is a shepherd's grazing ground known for its rich and very wholesome grass that any cattle or livestock that grazes upon it is guaranteed to be healthy and bear delicious meat product and offspring. The path is treacherous to climb and you will need a guide. A shepherd who has been to the hidden valley before and had his flock graze upon it. The ghost suggested. Well do you know where we can find one such man? Reed asked. We can start at those livestock farms outside of the citadel. I passed by them sometimes and they seem to be some good folks. Bishop said. I will come with you. Tyrion's safety is also a new Albany's safety and I'll be damned if I cannot protect either of them. The priest swore with his shotgun, glad to hear. I'll call in some backup and we should be able to form a company of men to make the expedition. King Martin what about you? Reed asked. The ghost king pulled out his ethereal sword and raised it up to the air before digging the tip of the blade down to the ground. If there indeed there are slay agents who are trying to strike my lands with the same way they did to me, then I will gladly join your cause for revenge, my sword and all the ancestor warriors in my command shall accompany you and avenge the Cambervale massacre. Martin swore too, good to have you all here. The fate of our homes rest upon us, Reed said as he grabbed his radio. He has some calls to make with the Major and the Colonel. Dash back in a para corporation HQ, dash. The sounds of drills, hammers, metal and all sorts of artificial noises could be heard at the secret underground forge of the Apara corporation HQ. It is a sprawling complex about five floors deep below the dark Kesahim Earth. Diaz was taken in by the in-house Sapporo Corporation, engineers to an operation table where, supervised by Robert Byongchin, began to remove the obsolete hand-me-down augmentations that he was given as a downgrade from his old build when he was still a penal soldier. To Aliathra's cold antipathy towards Diaz's metal body, she saw them take out his limbs and replace the white but worn out by dirt and aged cybernetics with sleeker and much more state-of-the-art parts on him. And now for the most dangerous part of the operation, the hearts and lungs. Dr. Robert explained to Aliathra, Cain, and Iris. The vampire and the Nigerian sat together in their own corner of the operation room's theatre whilst Aliathra sat next to Robert as he coordinated the engineers to proceed to the much more complicated section of the, in its most formal of terms, the full-body cybernetic augmentation transplant or in medical jargon an FB cat. 
It is perhaps one of the most dangerous but also the pinnacle of human medical achievement even since the first successful head transplant. It had all the logistical complications of a transplant, multiply it by the number 10 but minus the fact that donor parts don't to worry about rejection in addition of not having the need to be stored in a fridge like the olden days but can just be put inside a box and then sterilized before attaching the part inside the recipient. D as it is time. Shut down all vital functions. Doctors attach the avatar systems inside now. Beyond Chin ordered. Named after the act of a divine being incarnating himself in a material form to walk the earth. The avatar prosthetic vitals systems is a mobile machine that replicates the functions of the human body's vital organs. The heart, lungs, and kidneys. It is used by all transplant recipients to have a temporary lifeline in order to keep the most important part of the body. The brain function normally to avoid any permanent neurological damage to it due to the cybernetic augmentations can only be as good as the mental will of its recipient. They attach the avatar's pipes and wires at Diaz's emptied body which so looks so similar to a living human, and Delph's organs in physiological structure in a metallic parody of a living person. The obsolete heart and lungs were taken away by the engineers and are placed inside a plastic box for disposal. Mr. Yumbi Yankin. May I ask you something? Aliathra asked. Go ahead my lady. Robert politely nodded. May I have a look inside that box? I want to see the heart. The elf princess undercover as a fake elf princess. Robert walked up with Aliathra following closely with him as they approached Diaz's old heart. It was a nigh perfect replica of a human heart if the elf remembers her biology lessons from her tutors. It was as light to the touch of its weight, it had four pipes that go direct the blood flow through the chambers that would have pumped the blood all throughout the body if it weren't removed from its place earlier. She tried to squeeze the man-made organ to try and mimic the beating of a normal heart and as she does, she saw to her astonishment that it does indeed beat like a heart in similar fashion to how she, with some practice from her life priestess training be able to see the vital organs movements of any living thing around her. But for Diaz, due to his heart being made not by the tender love of a mother's womb, or scientifically speaking, cellular tissue formations, but were mass produced to be sold for profit, putting the gift of life. And you pervert it by placing a price tag on it. Aliathra placed the heart back in its box in disgust as he clenched her fists. Tell me, if you think like that, what is life according to you? Robert asked her. Nanith, the mother goddess of creation one day wanted to have. I am not here to discuss religion but I respect your beliefs but let's leave any preconceived biases for now. I ask you again princess, what in your own definition is life? Robert repeated. Aliathra engaged her thoughts now. For a human, as seen by elves fleeting and culturally backwards had given her a question that challenged her. What is indeed life? An entity that breathes, grows then dies, and can create offspring. Aliathra answered. Then by your logic, Plants are alive. Yet are they truly alive? Robert asked her. I don't understand. The elf shook no. Does a plant? Let's say does a tree can be able to have dreams, desires, fears and can see itself in the mirror to say that hey, that's my reflection? No of course not. What is being alive mean your world's knowledge then? To be able to think? Animals think too. Are they really alive? Aliathra answered her philosophical conundrum still trying to comprehend Robert's definition of being alive. No, for if you are listening to my earlier you will understand that, we as sentient beings are separate from all other forms of life by our heads. We can reflect. Robert tapped his forehead with his index finger. An animal eats to survive and live another day, but we as humans and other sentient beings such as yourself can eat for pleasure, comfort and in some cases, self-inflicted masochism if you're eating chilies. In short, animals' only purpose in life is to survive but we are alive because we transcended from survival to thriving for greater heights. It took us about 8,000 years to escape our caves as primitive familial communities to this very metropolis thousands of light years from where we come from today. Why do you do? Aliathra asked. Because we saw what is beyond the horizon, and we chose to chase for it. Tell me now elf, princess girl. 
Can you trace your own origins? You should learn to learn more from other people's perspectives. The whole world isn't just your fancy castle and Rapunzel Tower. Learn to get down to earth Miss Aliathra. There's more than what you see in face value. He pierced her soul with his words. And done. One of the operating engineers exclaimed proudly. The operation is a success. Waking up the patient now. He continued with his body faster and stronger than before. Diaz reopened his eyes and felt the new parts already integrating themselves into their host. TLD Army Robbie and explain like I am five. I don't recognize these systems, they're newer than the last ones I had. Diaz questioned. New Aparo Corporation. Augments. Faster reflexes. Hand-eye coordination. More efficient rapid movement boosts. Recoil control and much more important is a new military grade overclocker that can boost the performance of your orgs but it will chug your biocell batteries like a German in an Oktoberfest or you can drink blowout. Use only when absolutely necessary. This thing is also known to even break orgs so be careful not to get caught once the effects wear off, Robert said. Noted. So, guys. How do I look? Diaz said as he stood up from the table and presented himself to his friends. You look the same. Ken commented. You are very shiny. Iris put in her two cents. You smell. New. Aliathra said. I do. Like a brand new car. Car. Robbie. How's my car? Marlboro? Diaz asked. She's fine. Relax. He grinned. We kept her in the garage after your arrest for safekeeping. But we did have to do some jobs with it though while you were gone. Don't worry, she's exactly how you left it. Robert admitted. That's okay. She's a fast horse after all. You own a horse? Iris asked. It's called a cabot in terms of function yes. It's a horse. Can carry things and people around quickly. Her name is Marlboro and her manufacturers. I.E. Breed is a Mustang. Luckily. It's a four-seater so we can all fit. Peace. Diaz explained before turning to Robert. Was about to give you them and your jacket. He tossed the colorful red jacket covered in red roses designs with sparkling glitter that dazzles flamboyantly to all who sees it. Diaz probed the pockets of his outerwear until he found his Mustang car keys from his left pocket. He curled his finger as a gesture to his companions to follow him as he led them to the garage. There his car. An orange painted four seater Mustang with a charging horse decal in pure chromatic black paint, whose hairs were drawn like raging fire as it charges through the roads and terrains the car sets its dreads upon. Ken took shotgun whilst the women all took the back seat as Diaz entered the right side of the vehicle to where the driver's seat is located. He laid his body upon the chair, but before he could set the ignition on, Diaz searched his driver's compartments. Where are you? You should be here if they said exactly how you left it, he muttered. So, where are we going now? Iris asked. Where all the fun happens here in Kesselheim, Manhattan Plaza. Good food, fun entertainment, and the malls to bring something home with. And to get rid of. That for you, Ailey. Diaz pointed to the elf's tattered clothing. Oh. I heard of that place. Public scene. Neon lights and the hard light gardens. Ken said. Might as well we all enjoy ourselves today. We got my boss on board for the colony and his money is going to pour in any minute now. Let's celebrate with dinner and a bit of a shopping spree on me shall we everyone? You guys especially you Iris deserved it. Diaz smiled. As he finished his speech, he finally found what he was looking for. It was a pistol. A large hand cannon as big in length to his biceps. Hello Ruina you miss me? Can't wait to light up some bad guys with your lasers ha ha ha. Diaz kissed the pistol then promptly holstering it on his right side. With optimism he placed his keys onto the ignition and turned it on. The car roared to life as the speedometer, radio and head. Tail lights illuminate the darkness of the garage. The radio played kicks by the late great music legend Barnes Courtney. A favorite for free-spirited men especially those who get their thrills driving on the road in high speeds. It's good to be back, now Marlborough. 
Let's see if I still pull off those splits. Diaz smiled as he shifted his gears and sprinted off from its stationary position. Damn it feels good to be a corpo. Vincente reminiscence his old career as the Mustang jumped out of the underground entrance of the garage like a child ready to take on the outside world. Chapter 18. Why We Say Poro Terra. The Magalef sped through the Kesselheim cityscape casually as the Tyrian delegation sat on one of Kesselheim's most efficient public transports. After disembarking from the starport and then taking a bus to a monorail station that will directly take them to the Orchard District where they will arrive to the St. Luke's Medical Center one of the most sophisticated hospital resorts in all of the youth space. They boast state-of-the-art medical equipment self-sufficient organic produce farm and even their own pharmaceutical factory. Some of the youth's greatest medical triumphs were found in that very place from the cure to cervical cancer, the first successful full-body transplant and grape-flavored antibiotics. They did have to reassure their guests that the giant metal snake that they will be entering isn't going to eat them as it was only a means of transportation like a really long carriage as Samantha awkwardly tried to explain. Princess Aria looked on from the Magalef window and saw the Kesselheim cityscape. Tall pillars with volcanic smokestacks breathed out to the grey sky as neon lights twinkled from the distance like fairies swarming around their shire homes. The place was devoid of any natural life except for the people who live there yet even then. The Kesselheim earthlings looked contrastingly different compared to their more down-to-earth cousins. Their bodies were from head to toe covered in sheets of metal that all looked indistinguishable to human flesh. Mechanical humanoids walk freely and just as lively as ones who remain purely organic in physiological nature. Those people? Are they all golems? Arya asked. No princess those are people like you and me. Samantha answered. Why do they injure themselves to the painful processes of having metal forced into their bodies? Arya continued. Her legs quivered over the stories of the primitive healthcare of Gleesian society. They had no sense of sanitation, anesthesia, germs, bacteria and diseases. All utterly alien concepts to the medieval people. Plagues could develop into full-on epidemics and surgeries can be just as lethal as simply letting a disease slowly kill the patient. It isn't painful at all princess. When we get to St. Luke's I can assure you that the surgery won't be painful. You won't feel a thing, Samantha said. But, I am scared. Arya whispered softly. Of what? Samantha asked. I never went to another doctor before other than my physician. I saw what Dr. Lee Han Newell did to you. Those needles. And knives. And potions strapped above your beds in your big healing shrines you have back in New Albany. The princess admitted. Her blood began to pulse up as her mind lingered on the hundreds of unknown aspects of her journey to finally walk again. It's called a hospital my lady. Samantha corrected. She then reached out her hands to Arya's and held both amply as she looked in a comforting manner. I was like you before Arya. Samantha said. You were? When I was just a little girl around the age of five my mother took me to get my first vaccine shot. At first, I had no idea what it is until I saw the nurse pull out the needle from her pockets. Samantha softly said. I cowered behind my mother's legs, refusing to let go until my mum dragged me away from there. The lieutenant continued. So, did you leave or did you get the needle? Arya asked. Her attention hooked on Sam's snippet of her life story. I got the needle eventually. Sam replied. How? Huh? You were as scared as any child when he sees something scary. Arya questioned. My mother, took me by the arms and told me about what is fear to me. She says, their fear monster is an invisible monster that crawls into your brain when you feel that everything is not within your control when you should. It can go away by retaking control of what you see. You want me to hold you when you get your shot? Maybe but some ice on your arm where the boo-boo will be? I let my mom hold me while the nurse put cold ice on my arm before she pierced me. It was not as painful as it should be, Samantha said. She pointed to the spot on her left arm where she remembered where the nurse injected the vaccine. Will you be with me? When I get my surgery, Arya stuttered. If the doctor lets me, but if I don't just let you know, think of me and your brother. You want us to see you finally walk right? Especially your brother? 
Don't you want to run and play like all the other girls? Samantha challenged. Yes. Arya optimistically smiled. That's the spirit. Ding. Next stop is Orchard District North. The monorail's PA system declared. That's our stop LT. Crocker whispered behind her. All right. Everyone remember to protect the VIPs. Diamond formation as soon as we get out. Samantha ordered. The monorail station will be a very crowded place once the group touches down. Hundreds of people, going out for their daily mass transit can easily be a place one can get lost to. It is paramount that the youth escort shepherd their otherworldly guests to the awaiting vehicles at the roadway at the other side of the building. The last thing they want is one of the Gleasons to get separated from them and be like a lost child in the middle of a foreign land like every jet-setting mother's worst nightmare. Crocker, Clay and Abby die alongside the other youth soldiers and military police attached to them that the lieutenant couldn't remember their names form the diamond formation boxing all of their guests with Samantha taking the leading point. The monorail's door opened sideward and immediately their feet paced the busy station's floor. For the Gleesians they got an up close and personal on the daily life of a youth human. There were stores that sold a huge variety of goods from foods to their shock, books that were being freely sold from children buying the latest comic books to adults getting their daily gossip and information injection from the newspapers. It was such a cultural and technological shock to them due to the fact that back in their world, books and the ability to read them were both expensive to produce and learn to due to the lack of a printing press and an organized public education system. All such knowledge was reserved by the rich and powerful. Another observation that the other worlders noticed is that the way the monorail district was the design of the interior. It was like one great wave that flowed from the unfurling of a blanket on a dry summer's day when the light reflected upon its surface. White lights gracefully illuminated the building. Advertisements such as the smart billboard that had artificially intelligent facial recognition devices to determine the age of the immediate observer dynamically changes to the appropriate advertisement. When Princess Arya took a look at one of the smart billboards it initially hid an advertisement for an insurance company only to quickly turn to an advertisement for a high-end women's fashion store which the Gleesian could only imagine wearing the ultra-glamorous dress she saw the supermodel strut her body in. Then one of Arya's attached principality bodyguards walked in and looked up at the smart billboard and immediately the advertisement changed from a well-dressed young blonde woman to a scantily clad brunette holding a mug of beer for a prominent beer drunk all throughout the youth nation. After a brief pause by the smart billboards that Samantha had insist for maximum immersion scores with the guests, the group continued on to their awaiting bus. It was a much more sleeker design rib shape than the more practical box shape equivalent. It was a perfect analogy of the huge wide gap in cultural and economical disparity between the people of Kesselheim, the bourgeoisie of Kesselheim workers, conservative old money oligarchs and middle-income independent entrepreneurs favored social harmony but they tend to stay together in ethnic ghettos due to their own old earth ethnocentrism. The Navapa classes of artists, inventors and businessmen combined with the latest batch of young adults fresh from college favored individualism and were adherent to an evolution of globalism called neo-humanism. It became a powder keg of ideological strife that separated the classes into a cold civil war of reversi where the needs and desires of many clashed with the ideas and plans of the intelligent shears. Mega corps such as Apara Corporation that Iris and two of her subordinates were sent to, if Samantha can remember about them were more of an old money oligarchs type but the rumors were spread that their philanthropy is just smoke and mirrors for their clandestine activities. These conflicts of culture had been a hot topic of debate among the humans of the youth for over the past century. It was no wonder that instead of pointlessly fighting amongst stubborn hardliners that they just pack up their belongings and families and join the colonization programs that were so rampant during the time. 
But now the youth spacefaring nation is at the peak of their possible reach at least for the moment due to overexpansion ergo overextension of their authority throughout humanity's distant star colonies. There were debates and pushes in the Congress and House of Representatives for administrative reforms in the form of more extensive autonomy amongst the many star colonies, especially the likes of which of Kesselheim. Samantha, at least in her own self-reflections when she observed the contrasting images of Kesselheim's orchard district with every other district to be somewhere in between, she favored communities of people cooperating for a common goal whilst she also respects the individual desires of every single person. And after her experiences in Gleesia, every living sentient thing from vampires, elves and even undead ghost lashes. But ideologues aside, the Orchard District residents sure knows how to build some of the most aesthetic architectural designs known to man. Taking inspiration from the old earth city of Dubai, the Orchard District was like an ocean of bony white sculptures with wave-like bodies that twist and turn heads in every angle complemented by shimmering windows that refract light like insect wings. To the Gleesians, they looked as if it were designed by the graceful hands of an earth weaver which back in their homes often were not using their abilities for war and quests will often take jobs that involves construction engineering from humble abodes to mighty castles in their own judgments. The skill and magnitudes it would take to build all of this was astronomical. The streets blended in a perfect amalgamation of nature and urban concrete with the strategically and aesthetically placed flora that dotted the orchard district in a rainbow of flowers and blankets of jade chlorophyll. As the streets passed by the bus soon came upon a grand building of brilliant blue hue. Its shape was in half spherical in visuals like a turtle's backside and at the front entrance a great big red cross sign proudly welcomed the sick inside the building. To the Gleesans who were born under a medieval feudal world of swords and sandals under harsh toil for meager returns, it was like they ascended to the celestial sanctums of heaven itself. Welcome to St. Luke's most esteemed guests, Samantha introduced the spearhead of all medical, I mean healing ventures in all of youth space, everyone exited the bus as it parked on the grand entrance, the Gleesans marveled at the sheer size of the medical center for its scale rivaled even the greatest of fortresses in all of their known world, but now their knowledge of the fact that they are no longer alone in the wide vastness of space has expanded to the youth. They still couldn't quite yet comprehend how truly titanic the expanse of the United Federation of Earth really is. The VIP patient, Princess Aria was immediately provided with a wheelchair that was provided in the hospital for her weakened body and had one of her handmaidens push her forward. By Nenith, this healing temple is so magnificent. Aria commented as she entered St. Luke's, the welcoming chamber was crowded with people. The patients and nurses wore uniform baby blue robes whilst they stride with medical equipment or were carried by their automated hospital beds which can autonomously control to direct people traffic around the hospital. Doctors in white robes as clear as snow with their stethoscopes, medical gear, bags and other items can be occasionally spotted running around the hall minding their own business in stark contrast to the visitors who stood idly at the corners or sat down on the soft velvet furniture reading the news or twiddling their hands on their gadgets. For that moment, they felt lost to the overwhelming vastness of the facility until a kind tanned Asian face wearing the white gown uniform of St. Luke's many medical experts approached them carefully but heartwarmingly. Princess Arya the first presume? The man asked. I am her. Who may you might be? Arya politely asked from her wheelchair. I am Dr. Huang Pimi a nuclear medicine specialist, which if you're going to ask, to best explain it to you, I am the man who is going to make you walk again, the doctor introduced himself, he will help, I filled in the details about you and your special circumstances, Samantha explained, now let me have you prepared for the surgery now, the youth wants you in and out of here as soon as possible. He curled his finger as a duo of nurses took over Arya's wheelchair and pushed her onwards following the doctor with the rest of her entourage close by on her tail. 
dash, later at the surgery preparation room, dash, stripped naked and her chest facing down and her backside exposed to the air, Arya felt her meager courage plummet in such an awkward and degrading position, if the other noble girls in Tyrian found about this she and her brother wouldn't hear the end of it. The state of her buttocks exposed to a man who isn't her husband is often associated with prostitutes. Yet Lieutenant Rose smiled and held the back of her bare back lovingly. Don't worry. The youth will help you walk again. Just close your eyes when the doctor puts on the sleeping mask on you, Samantha said as she explained the general anesthesia that Arya will be in a moment wearing to put her asleep for the surgery. This youth kingdom of yours Lady Samantha. What is the youth like? Arya asked. Indeed. I also want to know more about your people too. One of Arya's accompanying handmaidens said. Me too. What type of king is your ruler? He must be very rich and very loved to be able to build all these resplendent palaces you will live. One of the Tyrian knight bodyguards added. Well let me correct you on that. We are not ruled by a king. Samantha rectified. The United Federation of Earth is not a monarchy where one man has so much power to do anything he wants. We rejected such kind of rulers a long time ago. We have an interplanetary assembly of the many. You state saw. You Nations and other groups like that convene together and discuss and look for a solution to the many problems they face. Samantha tried to explain as simple as she could for the guests to be able to digest. She knew that she might have modified some of the facts in the form of half-truths for the sake of comprehension. In truth, the United Federation of Earth does indeed have an interplanetary assembly that the colonies convene in to discuss matters of state but it was best described by many political satirists to be more akin to screaming children running to Mother Gaia that they can't stomach the disciplinary planetary edicts that the Earth-based centralized government enacted to keep their multicultural peoples from collapsing into civil wars over resources cultures and other myriad reasons. It was considered one of the many factors of the great human diaspora which consequently caused colonial fervor that expanded the youth from their origins to the soul system to glee easier today. According to the rules as dictated among setting up new interplanetary administrative unit sectors under the banner of the youth it must be made outside the borders but no more than ten light years away from the nearest youth planet. The rationale is for ease of expansion and logistical purposes. Must follow the youth constitution which is based off the American and French constitutions with rights such as free speech, bare arms and most importantly the freedom of assembly. Must achieve a minimum level of civilizational development which involves a standard of military standing, industrial capacity, and infrastructure. Otherwise the government will be directly governed by the Earth-based Youth Colonial Administration, or as of Amendment No. 24, one of the larger administrative unit sectors such as Kesselheim, Alpha Centauri or any that is approved by the Youth Colonel Admin. We used to live in one place before but we found a way to fly out of our world. Many for reasons as resources began to wear thin in our planet and others for simple wanderlust. You remember how got out of your planet to reach here? That's how we do it. Samantha said, how can you make your giant metal birds fly in such great distances in such short time? Arya asked, well we use these machines called hyperdrives that connects to these road like tracks that connects all the star systems. I mean worlds of ours to each other. These hyperlanes allowed us to travel such great distances of light years. And yes you heard me right, light years as in distance of light that they can travel in a year which is in our calendar around 365 days. And if there's one thing light is, it's fast. Light travels very fast. Samantha said. You are very knowledgeable about these subjects for a soldier. A soldier being so well educated such as you are quite rare, the princess commented. Well you see we have basic education for all citizens here. Unlike your people where education is for the rich only, even the poorest of us earthlings are entitled to learn. It is a universal right of man we say. Even despite our differences we always help each other, through disasters natural or man-made or when wars that divide our families threaten to tear us apart. We always step in and pull ourselves out of the darkness, Samantha said. 
Your people won't be here today without such spirit, Arya said with a snowed smile. The lieutenant had that type of aura on people, making them feel at ease in even the most critical of situations. She inherited such a sanguine personality from her mother who was a police negotiator, always finding a way to pierce through every human heart with her sympathy-filled face and tender words. But for Samantha who has yet to reach the level of experience her parents' shadow left behind, it is a juggling act however so far, the dice had rolled into her favor whenever she speaks but she had always feared that one slip up from her tongue could make the people she has to talk with descend into distress. And she had seen in so many first and secondary sources on how well that will turn out. That's why, despite our problems with each other, we earthlings still unite over a common origin, our motto Poro Terra which means in an old earth language earth moves forward. Samantha enthusiastically shouted the motto. She still had the upbeat state of mind of an idealistic humanistic patriot due to West Point upbringing. Even after all the politicking, many of the young generations, especially the more earth-based ones still hold optimistic views of a united but independently governed humanity where all peoples can be free to govern the way that is just but still can relate to their distant cousins. My lady, Princess Aria, it is time. Dr. Huang Pimi entered the room and informed everyone. Can. Can I. Have Miss Samantha with. Me? Aria asked. I am afraid I can't let her inside the operating room my lady. It's for doctors only. The crippled woman began to shake in fear over the prospect of being alone with strangers. She could feel her very stomach churn with anxiety as she clenched tightly the sides of her specially made medical bed. Don't worry Arya, remember that the doctor will give you a special air that will help you but you to sleep. Think of something happy. Find a happy place. Can you think of one? Samantha comforted her. She thought down hard on what will her happy place be like. She remembered the reason she was here. Existentially speaking, she was here in a goodwill diplomatic mood for her brother to open relationships with Tyrion, the Slaeagen Empire with the United Federation of Earth by showing them that the Ufar people from another world willing to peacefully coexist with their primitive natives. This goodwill is expressed by the life-changing surgery of allowing Princess Arya who was mockingly called the lame maiden to be able to finally walk. She grasped the thought of enjoying a nice summer afternoon picnic at the rolling hills of Tyrion happily frolicking barefooted on the flower-littered grass with her brother and her handmaidens. To be finally free from the chains of an unfortunate genetic lottery draw emboldened her to endure possible alien probing and incisions of the surgery. I have a happy place, Arya said. That's the spirit, Samantha said as the princess was pushed by the nurses and surgeons to her fate. Dash meanwhile back in Tyrion, Dash, the journey through the old Silopian tunnels was surprisingly fascinating despite the derelict ambience of the once thriving piece of an ancient civilization before the dawn of man in Gleesia. According to the stories of King Martain, the land that was Tyrion was once called home to a race of extinct cyclops who, thanks to their sizes can carve out a sophisticated subterranean network of roads all throughout Tyrion to their civilization's southernmost points to the dwarven clan holdings upon mountains north of here. The reason the Cyclopeans died out is because back then, plants and animals used to be much more abundant in size and numbers before their favorite prey and crops died out causing their civilization to collapse and make way for their more petite inheritors the elves humans, beastmen and dwarves to ascend up the food chain. Interesting lore aside, Reed and a team of youth marines have a mission to do. They had brought with them alongside their automatic small arms several packs of explosives ranging from the humble grenade, the small but powerful C4 explosive and the metal penis, at least according to King Martin's humorist interpretation which the marines let out a playful chuckle over. The small M3 a rocket launcher that is designed to not only fire your classical mechanical bunker buster rockets but the new and much more potent Melteplasma packaged rocket which can collapse even skyscrapers. 
Major Holyfield had given the Marines orders to cut off the Slay agents if such an invasion so close to Tyrion consequently New Albany is confirmed, but in a rare agreement between him and Colonel Polonsky they want to keep this conflict under the rug to avoid a public panic in the region. The team soon came upon the end of the tunnel network that King Martin guided them to. In his own war stories, the ghostly king lead his men through this very tunnel for the defense of their homelands. Yet he still remembered the defeat that was inflicted upon him by the Slay agents, but Inspector Reed comforted him saying that unlike before, the soldiers that followed him are as good an entire legion of Slay agents. There was an enveloping vegetation that the entrance of the tunnels that kept the place very well hidden from the outside world but thanks to King Martin's necromantic powers he was able to wither them away. You know, you're probably the first good necromancer I have ever known, Reed commented. What makes you say I am good? The lich asked. Well, you're not some nihilistic bastard who wants to enslave everyone and turn everyone into skeletons. I mean based on what Iris wrote about you, at least you ask people if it's okay with them that you use your bones as communal labor. Reed said his side, you think of us as heartless slave drivers, but the results of my communal labor force can almost speak for themselves. Some of the building projects I had left behind that the Slay agents improved upon after they took over are still enjoyed to this day. Back then Tyrion had a modest looking wall which was back and would normally take a year or more to build but thanks to my undead labor force I was able to build such a wall in only about six months of non-stop work. That same logic can be applied to some of the roads and other villages I had helped constructed. All of my necromancy as I told you were for the good of my community. We see death differently than most people during my day. Ancestors were revered and are often wise counsel to the rulers of Tyrion. Martin answered, taken quite literally. That is why Governor White sees some potential good in you. You're someone who gives more back than he takes. That's what being a ruler is all about he said about you in a meeting about the Um. Anthropology or you would call it study of the people of Tyrion meeting. Reed said. Well. Have that governor of yours say that about me in my presence, such an honorable opinion of me deserves to be declared in my presence. Martin haughtily boasted. I would say that in front of him if it wasn't for the smell he makes. The governor said also after that. Reed continued quoting. It's always the smell you complain about. That's one of the main reasons why I was invaded. You are to be pacified by the great Slay Eaton Empire for abominations against all life refusal to pay tribute and disgusting odor. They're just envious because I am worth a thousand wizards compared to them. The lich sternly argued. Well you should just take some old spice then. It will make you feel all the power. Reed snarked as his feet stepped on the rapidly decayed remains of the vegetation hiding the ancient tunnels. Old spice. Martin asked. It's like a perfume. Makes you smell good that you can feel powerful and confident around people. I'll explain more later. Reed explained the famous deodorant. They emerged from the tunnels to be greeted by the noontime daylight that pierced their eyes to its radiance in a fleeting attack on their visual senses. But as soon as that their eyes felt the sun's irritating light, their eyes adapted until they can see the other side clearly where Cambervale Valley awaited them. It was indeed the ideal place for shepherds to graze their flock in. A semi-isolated glade protected from a significant number of predators that terrorized from the Verdon River Valley forest thanks to the mountains blocking the south whilst lay Eju up to the northwest had fewer true predators to worry about. The grass had light shadings of yellow marigolds that made the glade like a mountain of treasure. According to their local shepherd guides, their animals absolutely loved to graze in this area due to its convenience and according to them had the blessings of Mother Nenya looking after here which in their experience has resulted in much healthier and fatter animals to be taken advantage of for their livelihood. Reed had suspected that there might be some faint traces of some sort of magical substance of plausible unbinilium nature at work in Cambervale. Maybe we should hold the unit football game and barbecue party here, said one of the marines. It's indeed beautiful here my otherworldly friend. One of the shepherd guides who cooperated with the youth took the gratitude humbly. So, you suspect the Slay agents will attack through, here right? Reed asked King Martin. 
They can easily go around the road passes littered with Tyrian fortresses and attackers from two sides if they manage to take control of this tunnel. It may not be wide as wide as the main roads but when I was around most of my soldiers were fighting the main force by the main road passes east of here. I had barely enough time to scramble enough men to meet up with the Slay agents who used the tunnels here. Martin said. I agree with that. A two front war is a nightmare to fight in. Reed acknowledged as he pulled out his binoculars to scout out the far sides of the glade. Other than them. The glade was virtually empty of any life except for the occasional bird and rabbits that call Cambervale their home. In addition to the lonely atmosphere, the wind brushed softly on the grass that gave a soft crackling whooshing noise that subtly disturbed the enchanted grass. Reed had to remind himself that whilst he is there, he should grab a sample of the soil he stepped foot to find a connection to the healthier-than-average livestock who graze this glade. We need to be sure that the Slay agents are up here using the tunnels to sneak attack Tyrion. But I don't see anyone here. One of the marines said to Reed. You're right, maybe that legionnaire we captured was just bluffing with you you duck. Reed ordered as everyone knelt down quickly following the inspector's sudden lead. I got movement. Reed whispered as he adjusted his binoculars. He observed over at first a dozen of humanoids in armor both on foot and on horseback in similar style to the Slay Agent Border Legion heirs. Then followed by a few hundred or more people followed by people in a mixed variety of non-standard looking armor and robes as compared Legion's black red uniforms. These strange people wore clothes that made them stand out amongst the rest of their entourage of medieval soldiers. Some looked like they could fit the description of your typical rebounds per game warrior, paladin, rogues, rangers and mages at the best of Reed's own observations. That's them, the Slay agents. King Martin growled softly, his animosity against them bearing. Okay, rules of engagement. Right now, at least according to Colonel Polonsky and Governor White, this shit can still be salvaged into a peaceful conclusion. The big wigs are hoping that what happened at that plane was just some sort of huge misunderstanding. Since we can talk to them thanks to Iris apostrophe dot M. Help. We can try to at least parley with them and scout them out peacefully in plain sight. Seals? Reed prompted the elite tier 1 team that accompanied them. The SEAL team had several raggedy clothes alongside some wooden articles of accessory with them that disguises them as pilgrims who were just passing by Cambervale Valley. They tucked their protective gear and weapons below the thick tunics their disguises afforded them with. The SEAL leader nodded to Inspector Reed as he began to speak. We got some hidden cameras on our clothes here that we can take videos, audio and pics of the Slay Eaton army on our 12 o'clock. While we keep them distracted have the marines plant demolition charges at the entrance of the tunnel and cut them off. We are also authorized to skirmish some of the legionnaires if they turn hostile. Priority targets on those fancy looking guys in the weird get up. The SEAL team leader said. Is there anything I can do to help? King Martin asked. I don't know. Make some skeleton laborers help us plant some bombs? The SEAL leader joked. The lich stepped back and to the surprise of everyone. His eye sockets and hands glowed dark purple colored conjuration magic as he raised his arms up to utilize his necromantic energies. Kodshfin. Vision King Martin spoke in an ancient language. Suddenly dozens of skeletal hands erupted from the jade earth, as Martin rose the dead of his former soldiers who had died in the valley. Their remains were a twisted mix of fractured bone whose gaps were filled with the purple silhouettes of what the human frame was supposed to be like if it were perfect in an amalgamation of bone white with ghostly lilac that glowed in willful power from the undead king's command. The youth soldiers were bewildered at the sight of the skeleton army as their bodies completely emerged from the ground to walk up to their master before kneeling to him to demonstrate their eternal service to him. Do not fear them, they are my soldiers and a friend to me is a friend to them. Now, where are those big boom boom things you earthlings said are fun to play with? I grow bored of the board games that I have inside my tomb, King Martin said. You mean the C Force? I thank you for the consideration, but I don't think that would be necessary, Your Majesty. Some of the men are still disturbed by the whole undead thing you do. Reed turned the lich down. 
The ghost king sulked with a frown on his decaying mouth muscles. He snapped his fingers and his undead minions were dismissed as they sank down to return to the earth from where their remains will wait again to rise to serve their master once more when he calls for their aid again. Are you sure your men will not accidentally miscast these C4 runes? Martain asked softly but in a concerned tone, his mind still thinking like an rebounds per game mage in the perspective of his youth companions. Reed placed his palm on his face and sighed in annoyance. He was expected to when interacting with the native Gleasons on terms that the youth humans take for granted which all those who handle such jobs like Strider Group and Governor White can say can be similar to teaching restless preschoolers on the ways of their technologically advanced civilized star nation. Yet he couldn't help but mentally also feel a meager humor behind the primitive natives. His respective supernatural state aside callow curiosity when looking at the modern military technology as if it were some form of new type of magic. If Arthur C. Clarke was looking down from heaven right now, he would have the smuggest amusement of his scholarly input in relations to his third law being demonstrated in action. Don't worry your majesty, these runes are triggered when we want them to be triggered. I have this special wand right here that allows me to trigger the explosion magic of these C4 runes now go set up the charges, one of the marines will supervise you if you're doing it correctly. Reed informed the lich using the king's substratal logic for his explanation, as allies to a mutual enemy and by my honor it shall be done, the lich said as he commanded his skeletons to go inside the tunnel with their youth marine allies. All right, let's suit up, Reed said as he grabbed his disguise. Chapter 19, A Dozen Ways to Die in Kesselheim False fairies or that's what Aliathra could see it when she saw Kesselheim's neon advertisement lights on one of their many commercial districts. Lesser men walked proudly in the streets displaying their augmented bodies of lifeless but super enhanced selves while their hands held gizmos the likes of which the Gleasons had never seen before. Not only visuals but also the smells too. There were street vendors who peddled food marketed to those of classical appetites like pizza, hot dogs and french fries that wetted their tongues to the more exotic sensations like Chinese super noodles, Korean bean pancakes and Eastern European kidney stew. Her overwhelming experience in such a different world made her hungry and she can sense it from the vampire witch who strode aside her too. Yet Vincent insisted that the girls meet an old friend of his before they go out for dinner. His shop is right over there, if you want to blend in with us you have to look the part, Diaz said. Is that a tailor shop? Ken asked as the group found themselves in the storefront of said craft. The big sign on top of the front window where to dresses, one a dapper suit for a male and the other a beautiful gown Maximilian's woven artisanship, the storefront is humble in width but extravagant in projection. For Aliathra who had her fair share of primped up dresses and impossibly long party gowns, she likes the ambience of the place. Whilst for Iris, it reminded her of the dream she had of walking on the strange earth human cities during her time of first meeting them several months ago. The dress on the window drew her eyes to most from the deeper workings of the tailor shop as she lost herself in its intricate designs leaning her hands and body to the window to marvel at its elegance benumbing her to the outside world surrounding her. Hey, don't lean on that, I just had that window replaced, exclaimed a bald tanned man in an effeminate long-sleeved polo with a purple vest on his torso and a matching pair of silken pants towards Iris, snapping her back into reality. Max Diaz smiled. Vinny Mandiorquist toy, it is you. Get in, come in. Bring your two lovely women friends and black friend in here. My door is always welcome. The man's sour mood turned over to a warm and accommodating smile. He held the door open allowing the mentry into his shop. It was a fanciful establishment with wooden furnishings that make up the shelves, counters, tables and chairs of the place. All of which were in contrast from mahogany shades with the vibrant rainbow of colors that make up Maximilian's products. From professionally black formal wear to flamboyant purple gold Americanas. For Aliathra, such craftsmanship was up to par with the tailors back home. For Iris, her inner fashionista was having the most pleasurable visual diversion of her life. She rubbed her eyes in disbelief in such chic accoutrement, 
The vampire witch fondled every fabric and dress of the women's section of the store as she thought over which of Maximilian's creations would she look the most trendy in. For the Gleesian, she was like a child in a candy store. Your dames Amos are quite feisty ones if I say so myself, Maximilian said. Yeah, you won't believe where I found them, Diaz said. I second that. Ken added, Oh try me. I have met thousands of female clients and I am confident I have seen it all. Rich heiresses, prom girls, socialites, fat opera singers and even a former prime minister. Maximilian boasted. Oh you ain't seen nothing yet baguettes. Diaz said as he called forth Aliathra to his side. You do remember I maintain this body through a strict paleo diet, right? Maximilian corrected him. But his haughty demeanor was replaced yet again when his brown eyes made contact with Aliathra's azure uns. Her face as he could mentally measure it from his face-to-face -face distance most certainly fulfilled the golden ratio of a person's perfectly sculpted face, and the hair, he was already internally singing serenades to her with such enthralling beauty. Max. This is Aliathra my. You, date for the day, Diaz explained. Such a magnificent specimen. Are you an up-and-coming supermodel? Only the finest clothes of my collection is worthy of you, Maximilian ogled. No, what I am about to show you is something only you and I should keep a secret for now. Until well maybe when it's more public and accepted into mainstream society. Diaz awkwardly answered. You are speaking in tongues Vinny. I do not know where you're coming from. Max's brows twitched in befuddlement. Vincent. Are you sure it's okay if he knows? Aliathra protested. It's okay. Because Maxi here knows the value of Omata, right? Diaz nodded to her before his gaze was casted towards the tailor in a subtly threatening tone. To Aliathra and Iris. They have never heard of a word called Omata before. In their hands they speculate into theories ranging from a sort of mental contract of obedience to a very subtle way of throwing out a death threat. But to Diaz and Cain. It was all very familiar in their historical knowledge stock of how organized criminals operate. Especially for Diaz. Fine. I give up. What makes this girl of yours so special to you and potentially speaking, to me? Max folded. Diaz delicately removed Aliathra's hood which hid more of her long golden hair and also her elven ears that peeked out of her side bangs like a mountain whose height was greater than the clouds of the sky. There. There. Real? Maximilian asked as he looked at the elf's leaf-shaped but pointy-ended ears. Yes, Diaz said. So, you're like those Tolkien elves? Maximilian asked as he carefully fondled Aliathra's ears. Tolkien? Who is this Tolkien you speak of? Aliathra asked. When her ears were being fondled by the tailor, she couldn't help but feel ticklish. Her ears were very sensitive to touch alongside its superior sound detection capabilities. She would remember the times during her childhood that her elder sister and brother would tickle her in the ears when they played together. A time where they were more innocent but oh how the decades had changed them over the years. An author who writes about elves. Max answered. There are people like me who live with you earth humans. Aliathra jumped into a question. Oh no. What he wrote was fiction I am afraid. A figment of his imagination that grew very popular. His books about fantasy worlds is still very influential to this day. The tailor explained. What does he think about ourselves? You want the polite response or the rude but better and accurate response? Maximilian asked with snark. I want to know the most prevalent image of elves that you earth humans possess. Aliathra daringly answered. Rude response it is. Diaz said. Oh. This is going to suck and be good. Cain facepinned to hide his grin. Elves are arrogant pieces of shit who look down on anyone who aren't as good as them in practically everything. And love to sit down on their ivory towers all day away from everybody. Maximilian blurted out with no signs of him mincing his words. To say Aliathra was shocked to hear that would only show the limitations of verbal communication of negative emotions. As I write in this chapter, to hear such a subversion of elves being high on their superior horses was insulting to her. The elves were the most dominant cultural and economic power in Gleesia with only their rivals from the West the Black Tree Pact and their cross-oceanic neighbors the Stla Aegean Empire, 
and vassal states. Many of their inventions and cultural concepts were adopted by the less developed nations of her world and her family throughout their entire bloodline were the most socially outgoing elves in all of Alfelnora, opening up embassies, consulates, trade agreements and all sorts of diplomatic missions all throughout the Gleesian world. She was beyond insulted by the tailor's stereotype that she almost impulsively wanted to slap his glasses as so she can hear the sweet-sounding crack of his spectacles, but she had to suppress such adversarial impulses due to her being a guest in this new world and it was in the elf's best interest that she behaves like a proper lady as her mother's disciplined instructions would say. She silently left the counter ignoring the tailor as she continued browsing the shop's wares which were the only redeeming factor in this diversion. You know, I would have actually loved to see you hit him, Iris whispered. How did you know that I would attempt to do such a barbaric act? Aliathra asked back to the vampire witch. Oh, I can see it in your face when the fellow there with the funny accent called your people arrogant pieces of shit, she snickered. You know for a vampire, I actually agree with you. The elf smiled as she caressed a silky blue dress from one of the shelves. Do you think I would look great in this dress? Aliathra asked as she pressed the apparel on her lithe body whilst staring at a nearby mirror as she imagined herself wearing it. You do? Tell me elf, what about this one? Iris shared her compliments before reforming it into another question with a purple jacket that she scooted over Aliathra to have her figure seen by the mirror. As the women played around with Maximilian's merchandise, the men sat down on a lowly circular cushioned chair that was meant for only one person to sit on. They uncomfortably tried to make do with the meager space that their tired bottoms can try to accommodate. I don't know if you know, but I know this, you got your eye on her. Diaz whispered to Cain. What? He turned to Diaz, who was smiling like an excited child. The way you look at Iris. You always walking up close to her and the change of voice you make when you talk to her. You got the cahoots for her am I right? Diaz smiled. You. No. Yes. No. I mean. Yes. Ken confessed in a defeated sigh. But it's unethical for me to think like that. Ken said. It doesn't have to be that way. It's only reprehensive behavior if you talk about it. Diaz said in a propositional manner. What are you saying to me mafioso? Ken pushed himself deeper into Diaz's slight under the mouth. You noticed the prices on the store correct? Yeah. The cheapest item in this place costs more than I can make in a month. Ken complained. Well, being a mafioso or my preferred term corpo, I can easily buy such extortionate items without burning my bank account. I still have my assets and savings from my runner days in Kesselheim and I am gonna withdraw them all out anyway for the new bank that will be set up back in New Alban. Diaz said, says the man who steals for a living, but in all honesty what are you proposing to me? Cain snarked. I give you money that you can use to pay for whatever Iris wants to have for herself in the store under plus some extra. Hush hush on one condition. You will have to do some extra mechanical work for the Aparo, Diaz said. Define these mechanical works. If it involves violence then count me out. He threw out a small fit. Oh, no not involving violence unless it involves crash test dummies. Then yeah it's violent. Basically I need someone like you to help out in some prototype weapons that my master has been developing on. Why can't he just do it here? Ken asked. He was still reluctant in going into this sort of agreement with Diaz. Spies everywhere from all the big weapons corpos. Patent stealing is a very popular excursion that we runners do normally. I have done some myself, Diaz said. So, you want me to test out some prototype weapons in Dr. Malona's place? What if he questions about it? Ken asked, as an old friend who quoted. Or more like paraphrase it for a modern setting would say. Dinero o fuego for the good doctor. Not that I would explicitly try to threaten him. I just tell him that he can either keep quiet with a few extra credits on his pocket for a little space rental. Besides, it's essentially free money. No sane person wants to fight a megacorpo correct? Like you? Diaz attempted to persuade. The way Diaz said his words were indeed persuasive. 
The proposition of some passive income was always something the hard-working Negro had wanted to try to obtain some for himself. He had previously tried to get such a passive income in bonds and stock markets but he decimated his post-college savings after several screw-ups and poor calls. He also thought of Iris. He indeed had a budding formation of affection and thoughtfulness to the vampire and wanted to show his affections for her in any way he could that would be guaranteed to be under the noses of his superiors who were very restrictive in any beyond professional relationship between their subordinates. Seeing her desiring to have herself wear the purple dress made his heart skip several beats. How much money are we talking about? Ken asked. 10,000 credits per hour inside that firing range, and also 50,000 right now. Diaz said. Deal. Don't make me regret this. Ken said as he stood up from the chair and walked towards Iris who was being mesmerized by the dress she was quasi trying on. Would you like that Iris? He asked her. I do. She nodded. For that one. I will pay for it just for you. But keep it a secret. Ken placed his index finger on his lips. Oh, you are such a dear aren't you? Iris smiled as she tossed the dress over Ken's wide shoulder as she walked towards the counter to check out her newly acquired piece of exotic apparel. Aliathra looked on as she held on to the several number of modern articles on her hand and turned to Diaz. By as much as you would like, you look beautiful in all of them. Vincent winked with a flirtatious tone. Dash meanwhile back in Cambervale Valley, Dash. Sir Petra the faithful Rookdorf's horse bucked as it trotted the slanted grounds of the southeastern hills regions near the Tyrian border. He alongside Carlia, Findrum and meter. Their job was to create a second re-entry point through the mountain ranges that naturally guarded the Tyrian Principality from her northeast. Emperor Alzin's generals all agreed that the narrowed down and heavily fortified mountain passes that connected the vassal state to its liege lords would be a ground in favor of the defenders who could easily dig in from the upcoming slage and onslaught. They are to go to an abandoned tunnel network that according to the historians can permit room for a large movement of soldiers to pass through, once the engineers attached to the Grey Order's party can clear up the rubble and reinforce the tunnel's structural integrity. Carlia Silverdane was assigned to be the one who would do much of the heavy lifting needed for the large boulders that they might encounter once they start the excavation. They all hope that they can finish the job with their 300 strong workforce of military engineers borrowed from the Slaagian legionnaires and levied laborers by next week. Protecting them would be up to the task of Sir Petra and Findrim from any threats. Petra had prepared several holy spells and coated his silver weapons in holy water in case the demons try to stop them in the off chance that they might find out whilst Findrim ready to fight off any of the underground or mountain dwelling monstrosities that might hinder the workers from their assignment. Meters reports thanks to her network of spies and the additional fact that, much to everyone's shock that Aliathra, the elven princess sent to assist them have managed to infiltrate the ranks of the demon's apparent stronghold of New Albany which reported to have been built within a few weeks yet its impressive range and size would have taken the Slaagian Empire and even the elves about five years or more of non-stop construction work. Additionally, the reports from their elven insider also reported that the demons sported arms and skins made of metal that shined like the reflection of the sun from a mirror in a more impressive resolution compared the likes of which of any Gleesian blacksmith. Not even the dwarves in all of their ingenuity nor the elves in their monopoly over the unobtainium star metal could match the craftsmanship and design of these strange foreigners. We have arrived. Petra gestured his hand upwards as his horse lulled her feet. His nose could smell the emerald grass of the valley's pastures that made the expedition's horses become excited with lustful salivation. He knew that this hidden natural gem had a edacious effect on grazing animals. Their horses are going to feed well today. Set up a camping ground and a foraging party at once everyone. Carly get ready to get to work on the ruins once we have all settled. Petra commanded and everyone obeyed. He was given the expedition's supreme authority by Emperor Alden himself and was given the responsibilities to see to the task's success.
If anyone can lead a crusade it would be him, as chosen by all the elders that judged him. And the magical knight swore not to fail them or his nation. Oh finally, I thought we would never get here. I was starting to get bored. Findrim smiled as he dropped down from the carriage. He sat down on throughout the entire trip. Carlyle wiped out the sweat from her forehead as she embraced her weary body of the cool mountain breeze at the nearby Doram Range, which was the natural northwestern barrier between the Slaeijan Empire and the Principality of Tyrian. She was not much of an outdoors person, preferring the shelter of shade more than anything else. Her magical staff imbued with some of the highest quality mana crystals money and effort can obtain. She flicked her wrist of her feathery fan to cool herself off as she looked out on the midday sun. Let us hurry on with this quest now, Carlyle said as she stepped down from the carriage and placed her hood on top to protect her shining silvery blonde hair from the demoisturizing rays of the sun. The expedition promptly began to set up their camp on the feet of the valley's hills as the workers picked up their camp construction tools and materials whilst also preparing their excavation equipment for the task ahead. Whilst the camp is being built, Mito alongside several of her best crows were assigned to scout the abandoned tunnels to ask us how much work they will have to do. The expedition was authorized by the Empire to be able to requisite a set number of additional manpower and material if needed be. Her party moved swiftly through the pasture lands as they observed their environment. From their southeast the Emerald Dora mountain range towered protectively preventing unrestricted access to the Principality of Tyrian. Behind them were the Mayo's timberlands a source of wood that the Empire greatly values in their strategic resource inventories and also the township of Vercourt where a stockpile of the Slaeijan legion's weapons and supplies are kept which the town procures materials for. If the demons were to break through from their mountainous confines inside the Principality, then Vercourt and Myos are the likeliest of targets. The underground tunnels of the old Cyclopean civilization that died out before humanity rose up from their ashes had a capacity when measuring upon the average humanoid size of fitting about 80 soldiers can march inside the tunnel comfortably, about 150 of them if they decide to pack them in tightly in case. They need to rush troop movements into Tyrian. As the scouts made their way up the steps that would lead them to the entrance, they encountered a group of twelve simply dressed individuals in long but thick flowing outer robes and carrying huge wooden walking sticks as tall as they were. Greetings and may the gods be with you. One of them saluted, You don't look like shepherds. What brings you here to Cambervale? One of Meter's crows asked. We are pilgrims who are here to admire their natural beauty of this pasture. We are devout followers of the god of the soil. The stranger answered rather haphazardly in Meter's experience. His tone was exposed nervousness and hints of ignorance. She didn't take down the possibility that these pilgrims were just obtuse-minded simpletons but she prepared herself in case the worst happens. She and her crows were trained to be efficient in singular hand-to-hand -hand combat but it wasn't as much as a priority to say scouting, espionage and assassinating their targets when they were their most vulnerable. God of the soil? Never heard of him before. Are you sure it isn't you Ares the god of farming you speak of? The crow probed. It's a preference sir. We are just humble shepherds who have taken upon the pilgrimage to kneel down and worship him here. The stranger answered. The crow re-examined the pilgrims. Their bulky forms were physically blocking any view the scouts could have to investigate the entrance of the tunnels. What brings you to this spot? Do you know that behind you is an old underground tunnel? Mita asked them. Yes madam. We are using the tunnel as a shelter for our little camp. Nothing much other than rubble and our fire we have been cooking up for super. The stranger responded. Well we are land surveyors from Slaeja and we want to go into the tunnels to see if they can be used for the Empire's use. Meters grow underling lied in an attempt to persuade them to budge. He tried to push through the crowd only to be blocked in the last possible inch before his eyes could move inside the hidden tunnel entrance. Oh no I don't think it's necessary. The tunnels are sealed up so badly no magic in the world can fix it. The stranger said with his sweat nervously dropping from his forehead. Move over, I wish to see it myself. The crow insisted as he pushed him aside as he peeked over the foliage. 
To his surprise, what laid beyond the emerald blankets, he saw dozens of men in strange green fatigues working with a variety of gizmos attached to wires that blinked red in light upon a small speck on their sinister-looking exterior. The crow could feel an overwhelming sense of abeyant power within those devices that was being attached to the tunnel's walls and support structures. What in the god's name are you? The crow had barely enough time to react when a loud bang from his left temple pierced through his skull killing him instantly. Go loud, the stranger said as he drew a handheld metal wand hidden from his cloak. He quickly pointed the wand at the crows and opened fire an invisible magic that when correctly aligned to its target, the person dies instantly. Mita, knowing that she has no advantage fighting these peculiarly well-armed pilgrims dropped a smoke bomb down onto the ground and then casted invisibility as she fled. Some of her fellow crows however were not as quick on their feet as she was. They were shot down by the strangers with their metal wands and staffs mercilessly before they could have a chance to draw their arms. Such treachery. This must be the demons from the old legends. I must warn everyone. Mita's thoughts raced in her mind as she ran back to the expedition camp. As rest of the crows fled with her or were gunned down out of their wounded misery, Inspector Reed took off his disguise and with a disturbed mask, walked back inside the tunnel taking caution not to trip over the crow that he had to kill in point-blank range, where the engineers and King Martin were. Our cover is blown. We need to blow this tunnel up now, he ordered. Fuck. I knew this won't be easy. The leader of the youth combat engineer demolitions team cursed. Skeleton King or whatever your name is. Summon up some hands here. We still got about a less than a click of land to work with. He ordered the lich, rise my undead servants. King Martin called forth. His hands conjure necromantic energies as the awakened dead rose up from the earth. They were given demolition charges and had engineers attached to them for instructional supervision so that the demolition team can cover more ground quicker. The charges, despite their unfamiliar nature to the Gleasons, were designed to be easily set up and armed. It's the wiring and proper emplacement in strategically important support structures which cost the engineers the most time consumed. As the combined undead and youth engineers applied the explosives with redoubled fury, a detachment of combat engineers and marines, armed with grenade launchers, anti-personnel mines and high-caliber squad automatic weapons ran outside as they prepared defensive formations readying themselves for their fight against any attempt of a siege. Their objective was clear. By time dash in a heavily populated Kesselheim commercial district, dash R. Fair Park. Home of some of the best shopping and pig outs known to man. It's like New York. Oh wait I forgot. You, Diaz at first enthusiastically introduced before sulking down in his own erroneousness, after a small splurge of several thousand credits in Maximilian's boutique, he had continued the unofficial guided tour of Kesselheim through the Ecumenopolis many shopping streets. They saw many more sights from the Kesselheim fashions, food stalls, and technology stores. To Iris, such a display of power with no trace of magic astonished her positively to the various benefits of being a youth citizen. She is now even considering applying to be the first Gleesian to immigrate to youth space when she gets the chance. For Eliathra, however, her new clothes and artificially beautiful lights aside, her view was in a more scrutinizing point of view. With so much raw power at the youth's disposal, the aliens would make short work of all the nations of Gleesia, to see her home island burn to the ground by youth firepower chilled her to the bone, but she must press on with fortitude if she wants to get out of here alive and safely. From what she can analyze with their fast within photographic memory, she tried to comprehend the many machinations and sophistications these strange breeds of humans have compared to the contemporary Zanigrad ones. Some of her own interpretations of the advanced technology were so astounding the outlandish that there's a significant chance that the readers of her reports might think she was raving mad or worse, under some sort of eldritch mental deterioration of sanity from the youth's corruption, and she has yet to feel any sort of hidden corruption that is trying to taint her soul away from the righteous path. Were the demons bidding their time and tempting her with luxurious amenities? Oh! 
Cheer up, Metal Man. I actually like you that way. Iris smiled. Yes. I got to admit, if it weren't you coming along, I would probably be chewing the technical manuals to not go insane all over. Ken added. The fuck? You do that? Diaz raised his eyebrow. Being smart can do that to you. It gets slowly as time passes. Ken said. Well you got Iris with you so if I were you, don't fuck it up. So, once we finish eating out let's get back to the garden district before the late night rush hour kicks in. Shall we? Come we can get to my favorite by crossing down this street. Diaz pointed to a wide and crowded pathway filled with neon lights and holographic displays. A rainbow of lights bombarded the Gleasons with their sophisticated patterns and visual images. Food items, beauty products and all sorts of modern amenities that the average youth human would take for granted enthralled the aliens. They never seen such wonders in the entirety of their fantastical existence. For Aliathra, such sights couldn't be the work of destructive demons out to devour worlds in chaos. In the midst of this storm of so many incongruous at best, eldritch at worst concepts of the modern world, she can see some semblance of a new breed of harmony that she didn't know could be possible to anyone. Steel in the youth world were as plentiful as the trees in the forest but for the various myriad pre-industrial age cities of Gleesia. Steel was only used for the building of weapons and armor. In her tongue, steel is called Belthtink or the destroyer metal. For all of its hardy and stainless properties, steel was only used in times of war. Most buildings back at her home were either made from carved stone to make the graceful and delicate geometric shapes that were the envy of their entire world. But to be there in Kesselheim, to see steel stacked as high as the highest mountains be such a common sight for the youth natives displayed the superfluous differences in power between the Gleesons, even her own fellow esteemed Death Island elves, and the youth humans was humbling at the glance of a simple commoner but for a princess and as a spy for her nation, it was terrifying in a cosmogonic sense, to put two and two together. The vast technological advantage the youth has over them would be also directly relative to the amount of experience the civilization has with dealing with varieties of problems as she remembered one of her court's philosophers in sociology would comment. Yet, these demons to her surprise were reasonable, pragmatic in an inhibited sense in terms of the military power but still reasonable. The elf's mind mentally recorded all the most important insights she could collect from their strange weapons, their metallic citadels and false fairies. Her world must know of this, but would people see these demons as their destroyers or as bringers of a new world order? The elf still had doubts over the youth's true intentions with glee easier. Power over an inferior foe is intoxicating as she has learned from the many stories, mythological or recorded accounts, that the strong will always devour the weak. Yet her mind was conflicted yet again by another strange contrast, that the stronger demons were helping Arya, the princess who has borne Lane to be able to walk again with no other material gain but friendship between Tyrian people and the youth. Were the prophecies of the demonic apocalypse perhaps? Aliathra thought but her mind was dragged out of the clouds as she accidentally bumped into the rosy-colored jacket of Diaz, who suddenly stopped. Ouch. Why did you stop? Aliathra questioned but as she turned to look at the roguish albeit charming in his own way Filipino's eyes, she saw through his orbs were of a concealed dread in contrast to his riveting charisma that she has seen him sport throughout the party's unofficial tour of the world he calls his home. Well, well, dear runner it's good to see you again. A naked headed man in a white suit greeted. He was accompanied by a dozen of thuggish men whose bodies were augmented with all sorts of varieties of cybernetics and their eyes were hidden in eye-shaped fitting sunglasses that to the Gleesons looked like their eyes were as pitch black as night which they find their ominous blanks in a disturbing display of their inhumanity. Shit, Diaz cursed softly as he raised his hands in surrender. You know, Vinny, the moment we all hear at Hecale Union of you going away, we all thought you were gone for good, the bald man said. I didn't leave voluntarily you know, Diaz corrected, which made it all looked oh the more. In the formal way, indefinite. With you gone Hecale Union began to muscle in as much ground from Aparo since you weren't there to force us to play defense. The Heckle Union man proudly declared. Oh stop being such a cocky fuck Fuchs. 
You wanna fuck someone fuchs you got to be a bit more charming about it. The way you say it's pathetic. Low energy I would call it. Diaz teased. My name is Falkard. The heckler union leader said. He then reached into his pockets and pulled out a large revolver from his coat so he can cock it. He kept the gun below his waist with its barrel downwards as he imposingly pointed to Diaz in a fit of challenge. I give you a deal here Vinny. Give me the elf witch iris on your right and I'll give you a ten minute head start before I blow your head off with this piece of point .44. Falcard pointed to Aliathra, but I am Iris. Iris corrected him as he stepped forward from Cairn's back. Damn it Iris you're not helping. Cairn panically informed her. The engineer was unarmed and tactically naked whilst he is pointed by about a dozen or more sights on him and his companions by the Heckler Union Megacorp thugs who quickly redirected their guns aim at her. Realizing her mistake, she hissed at their sight bearing her carnivorous fangs. I am surprised she doesn't sparkle, Falcard said. So, is my little mole in a paro off? That you went into some sort of exile to a goddamn fantasy book. With dragons, elves like the blondie here and knights. Make you go do a bunch of quests. Rub money all over your face. While wenches rubbed your cyborg six pack with oil and call you their hero. What do you really want fuck me or Iris? You can have both because I am gonna make you fight for for it. Fuchs. Let's end it all right here. Right now. Diaz challenged Falcard. You think I came here for a fight? I want to gangplan. Falcard readied his revolver as his mentor came at Diaz and Cain, taking care not to risk hitting the VIPs Aliathra and Iris who they plan to kidnap after they take care of their escorts. Come get a taste, Diaz said as he bent his knees down and assumed a gunslinger's stance. Under normal circumstances, if Diaz was just an ordinary human being, the Heckler Union thugs would have just gunned him down the moment they see the whites of his eyes. But thanks to the Corpo agents years of throwing wrenches down as many rival Megacorp's plans, Falcard and his posse of gunmen knew that underestimating him is a fatal error. His cybernetic augmentations were some of the best technology money can buy and what the human mind can physically conceive. He knew that he was worth more to them with his parts intact than riddled with bullets to a ruinously unsalvageable state. And the implications of what God knows what plans Falcard and Heckler Union would do to Iris and Aliathra is just equally apprehensive. He needs to protect them and Cain. His old criminal life catching up to him made Vincent regret some of his life choices. He looked back at Cairn who was bravely putting himself in front of harm's way with Aliathra and Iris hiding on his taller back. In all honesty for the Nigerian, he was the most normal person in this standoff with no cybernetic augmentations nor any magical talents to put next to his curriculum vitae. Yet the very notion of a cyphred in a normal person in Iris old Tyrannic dialect and Borgul meaning magicless in a derogatory sense in Aliathra's elven, that he the nightman, dare if. This G.I. Private first class of admittedly more clever than normal combat engineer is protecting a vampiress witch who can hold her own in a fight but is often ostracized for her rather peculiar appetite for crimson fluids and an elven princess who had feared that these strange variety or amalgamation based on her newly expanded view of them humans to see Cairn as someone not of what they expected, for a brutish man. He was smart and clever in addition to his valor of protecting those he considers his friends or those he is sworn to defend. Like an ironic twist of a knight in shining armor and straightforward good Samaritan he shielded the two magic users. All right, let. Not so fast your ingrates. A loud voice interrupted Falcards. More armed goons but in distinct green engineering uniforms complete with yellow hard hats centered the fray and made themselves known to the two hostile parties. Their appearance in contrast to the Heckler Union's thugs were sporting more crude weapons and barely any cybernetic augmentations in their bodies or none at all. Maximoff engineering here and that elf girl Iris is mine. A man in a thick Russian accent said. Your dirt bags have been in third place since forever. And no, the elf isn't Iris. Diaz shouted. Well doesn't matter. When I am done with you and the hecklers, you're going to be in dead place. The Russian said. Nihau bitches. 
A nasally Asian voice interrupted them yet again with their skin creamed skin surgically modified faces but still distinctively Asian features, flashy suits and gold and dragon engraved guns. Another dozen of so more well dressed but still lethally armed gunmen entered into the fray. Their entrance added more fuel to the potential fire storm that so many antagonistic groups gathered in one space and all armed to the teeth that can potentially explode it into nasty firefight melee artois, or melee quater for this case. Zooming entertainment presence Kesselheim streets run red. With dare runner's blood, the man in a sharply dressed red silken polo whose collar was arrogantly unfolded boastfully announced with his posse of pretty boys in their outstanding where they raced down youthfully to the circular gathering of rival megacorps. Well, looks like we got ourselves a pan-industrial slash multicultural melee quater plus one black dude on my back. Where's our brownie points for diversity? Diaz snarked which got a few chuckles from some of the armed thugs and even Kayan. You all know why we are here. You and Iris. Falcon reminded him. You know, now that you said that. The Maximoff leader said as he self-actualized his current situation. He drew and dual wheeled two pistols and aimed one at Diaz and the other at Falcon. Both of the pistols under grip laser red dot laser sights dangled brightly between both of their eyes. Some of Falcon's men reacted by redirecting their aim at Maximoff and his crew of armed industrial workers. You know, now that Heckler said it. The leader of Zooming Entertainment whistled to his goons and began to aim their guns at equivalently at all the three other parties. Killing also you two would be just as good as getting Diaz and the Magic Girls. He smiled coyly of bringing home for his organization some bonus scores. The fun prospect of seeing my girls Aliathra and Iris in a cheesy VR porn video ala. Exotic girls from far far away fantasy land or whatever shitty title you give it aside. You probably don't want to mess with the latter more. Diaz warned him. He turned to Aris with a confident but also anxious glance at the vampire witch. What's a VR porn video? She asked. A. Hey, you. They make you a. Hey. How do I say it? The zooming leader tried to construct a tactful answer to Iris' question. They'll make you work in a shitty brothel, Diaz said in a provocative manner to get the vampire to stand up for herself and be able to balance up the odds on this uneven encounter. Although his statement wasn't wholly accurate in terms of the difference between the sex trade of a medieval era red light district to the modern ones of the world's oldest profession, it was accurate enough for Vincent to get the disgusting implications across to Iris to sour her reserved demeanor. Such vulgarity. That's no way to treat a lady. Iris growled as she pushed Ken and Elia through away and conjured fire and ice on her hands. She bared her fangs like a territorial hound at the megacorp who dared to see her as an object. Such a terrifying display of the monster hidden beneath that feminine exterior caused them to step back and cower in horror of the unnatural. To see a classical horror movie monster in their own eyes was honestly frightening to them compared to the existential safety of seeing one behind a screen in a comfy chair in a cinema, public or home. See? Wanna kiss from her now? Diaz taunted. What is this blowjob you speak of another vulgar act to degrade a Kadahagan woman? Iris snarled. Her eyes filled with anger disgust pierced daggers at some of the less courageous folks of their ambushes. Well at least the intel that we got makes her worth their and billion credits. Falcon smiled. Oh. You are all the same. Diaz spat as he discharged his pistol while quickly covering as much of his vulnerable head with his left arm. The shot fired throughout the park went across the circle's diameter intending to shoot down the Falcon's head off. But the Swiss, in an act of sordid but effective self-preservation instinct dragged one of his goons on his side and had the hapless thug, unwillingly, take the bullet for him. As soon the first shot was fired. Everyone gathered in the park open fired. Some missed. Others were gunned down and the rest were wounded. It was absolute bullet hell and stride a group are dead in the middle of all of it. Diaz strafed to his right while maintaining his makeshift arm shield protecting his squishy head. He blindly fired back with his laser pistol ruiner. He could feel a bullet or two land violently at his arm shield but it didn't pierce through. 
he couldn't tell from his self-inflicted sightless condition if either it ricochet of his arm or was simply stopped dead in its penetration path. Either way he could easily shrug several bullets all over his body before his lightly armored frame gets ruptured to expose his more vulnerable vital organs and cybernetic structures. He needed to find something solid to hide from quick. The same logic above could be also said for Aliathra and Cain, both of who were unarmed and the Manu exhausted respectively. Iris blasted an infernal gale of fire towards the Chinese Entertainment Corporation and managed to incinerate three ill-positioned zooming gunmen. Her experience observing the youth soldiers gave her some insights on how they do combat with one another. In her own primitive observations, she concluded that most youths prefer to fight in range while discharging as much firepower they can humanly carry and output. She remembered that in one demonstration that the youth would use to countermeasure such a combat strategy is through smoke. They contained some smoke inside a small canister and in similar vein to their hand-thrown grenades, and not the ones she had used in the MGL previously as Kay and told her that there is a difference between them, and mechanism. The vampiress improvised by replicating the said smoke by unleashing a wind of blizzard from her left hand only to quickly evaporate the frozen water with another gale of her fire blast. She channeled the mana from her pure crystal necklace causing the entire battlefield to be covered in a befuddling fog. Their assailants turned down their fire and tried to regroup their men who were all scattered throughout the park blindingly trying to get away from its effect. Come on! Diaz yelled to Iris as the two doved down to a nearby hot dog stand for cover. Who are these people? Iris asked, her voice hinting with disgust on their attackers who dared try to sleaze their way to her. Baggies friends of mine. Diaz hoarsely informed as he reloaded Ruina. Well your friends think I am some cheap whore. Iris haughtily dismissed. Where's Cain and the elf? Diaz peeked over the hot dog stand and frantically tried to spot them. He saw, despite a blurry haze from his bullet suppressed eyes a tall negro male who is hurriedly pulling the arm of a blonde woman in the same colored jacket that Aliathra was wearing when she was given a new set of clothes courtesy of the Manila. The figures made a mad dash for a crowded shopping street northwest from where the cyborg and vampiress were holding up. You can cast those spells and all right? Diaz asked. Yes, yes I can. Iris nodded as she recharged her hands with more magic that gave a faint sky blue light. Follow me and don't stop running. Diaz told her as he made a dash out of the cart towards his other two friends direction with Iris promptly jumping into her feet with him. They flew through the park's grassy floor, weaving through the greenery, trees, bushes, holographic ad stands and dead bodies. They could hear the gunfire continue to roar behind them as they sensed bullets caress them mere inches past the two. Iris let loose several magical missiles behind her, all of each enchanted to hit the mark of any would-be kidnapper. Don't shoot like that. She's worth 50 billion credits alive. One of their assailants scolded. I'm not anyone's toy. I am free. Iris angrily replied to the callous corpus and unleashed an azurage of magic missiles. Six darts flew out of her hand and charged towards their pursuers striking them down with an unexpecting and deceptive force staggering and piercing four of them. Their feet dashed out of the park's jade grounds and into the asphalt street separating them from the shopping street across, the two not bothering to look both ways, weaved through precariously of the oncoming traffic that sped through. Iris barely stopped mere inches away from a speeding truck but Diaz managed to catch her on time before she was running over by several tons of steel. Keep your head down and the move come on. Diaz warned her. After the truck passed by them. They made their way safely across where they kept their heads low while continuing to gain some distance from their pursuers. The shopping street, from a busy albeit normal business day was erupted into chaos as gunfire and armed goons flooded the commercial area. Screams and the sound of merchandise crashing or falling apart can be heard as they barrage daily Aethra's ears. Where's Vince? She asked Cain. I don't know. I haven't seen Iris either. We need to. Cain gasped for breath before a dreadful click noise interrupted his sentence. To the two's horror they were held in gunpoint by the treacherous addition of four more thugs, all armed to claim their prize. Compared to the Heckler Union, Maximoff Engineering, 
and zooming entertainment, these thugs were more anarchistic in terms of their choice of clothing. Leather jackets with spikes and a rainbow of colors littering their clothes like a flower scattered in a cooking counter. Elfie is gonna make us rich. Bubai, a man in a purple spiky mohawk pointed his gun at Ken's head. Aliathra closed her eyes, not wanting to see Ken's head explode in front of her. Four loud shots coming from point-blank range thundered at the elf's sensitive ears making her scream. She knelt down and covered her ears and began to crack under the combative pressures. Her inexperience in the field plus the sheer stress one such as herself is enduring of being light years away from home. She shed tears and began to whisper to Nanith for salvation from her nightmare that she feels all too real. Hey, hey, hey. A familiar voice broke her silence as she felt someone's hand pull her left arm away from her ear. It was Diaz. Thanks. Cain gratified. Aliathra saw the four holdupers and would be murderers of Cain and kidnapper. At the elven princess turned spy lying dead on the floor. She saw Diaz's laser pistol exhaust a red yet also refractive gas from his gun's chamber. Once again this abomination saved her life. What now? They're everywhere. Iris asked. Diaz turned his head around the group's vicinity. The pressure of his friend's survival now resting upon the penal soldier's long history of Kesselheim's neon streets. Over there, Diaz pointed with Ruina, its barrel pointing to an abandoned and darkly lit convenience store whose doors conveniently opened as if recently abandoned. A perfect place to hide until the heat dies down. Grasping Aliathra's hand tightly but with a guardian's firmness, he led his friends inside the convenience store and quickly closed the door. The door's normal greeting ring was luckily turned off which gave them hope that they might be able to hide it out. It was dark inside with only the cartoon merchandise with their dead simplified black dots of an anthropomorphic irises to keep them company. The four knelt down quietly as they could hear the faint footsteps of their pursuers. How do we get out of here? Ken asked. There's a back door. I think we can escape through it. Iris pointed to the metal door behind the store's cash register counter. I'm sure that's just a supple knee door. Ken cynically informed. Hang on let me confirm. Diaz paused as he pulled out his phone. He covered his device's bright light with his jacket. As he checked his map, there's a back alley we can sneak off to straight for the Rainbow Bridge. It'll lead us to the Orchard District, Diaz told them. We'll be safe there right? Aliathra asked. Yeah, it's a Paro territory. Got to call my boss though. Tell him we are coming in hot. Diaz assured. I'll get it open now. Ken said as he stealthily crawled to the door and tried to open it. At first, he tried to push it open but it wouldn't budge. Then after a couple of attempts of pushing he tried pulling the door but it was locked in place. It's locked and it's one of those security doors. Ken sadly informed them. If he had his tools with him he could easily bypass the door's metal locks that kept it firmly enclosed. That's made of metal, right? Iris asked. Yes. Why? Can you actually unlock it? Diaz asked. In my career of enchanting weapons and armor of Mirian, metal shifting is a vital skill in my day job. Iris said. Okay you try that. But do it quietly, Diaz whispered. He took point near the door entrance as he observes the outside. Most of the stores in the shopping streets were now devoid of civilians and light, except for their pursuers' tactical flashlights attached to their guns, leaving the once vibrant commercial area abandoned except for the mercenaries, thugs and armed goons of virtually every rival megacorp crime syndicate or person Diaz has ever known to try and climb their way to the top of Kesselheim's dynamically Darwinian food chain. From a self-actualizing point of view for the ex-Corpo agent, being away from Kesselheim for a few months gave him a new perspective in life. He never knew there was more to the whole world than just the cybernetic neon lights of Kesselheim which is filled with excessive materialism, amateur capitalist ventures and simple greed. To see the green grass and natural calling of nature in an unexplored and untapped land far away made him reflect on those years stealing and killing for a living, but if it weren't for the raw and unadulterated thrill of adventure, and the rush of stealing high-value items from people in addition to the reputable perks of his successful exploits he had acquired throughout his previous career, 
he would have emigrated out of the planet to some lonely agri world when he got the money to make the transit. Let me check here and then we'll move out. One of the mercenaries told his comrades as he walked straight into their hiding spot's direction. Everyone in Diaz's party hid behind the safety of the shadows not daring to expose an inch of their bodies to the mercenaries' tactical light. Nothing here. Let's move. The mercenary was about to turn away when he heard an object fall down from the store's interior. No, Aliathra whispered in hopeless tribulation as she clumsily let a can of food fall down from the shelf she hidden herself behind. She naively tried to reach out for the can before the gaze of the tack light reached for it, but she underestimated the mercenary's reflexes. They're here. The mercenary yelled when his light shone at Aliathra's ivory lithe hands exposed on the cold marble floor midway between the fallen can. Shit, Diaz cursed as he emerged out of his cover and blasted the gunman who found them with a swift shot in the head resulting in his immediate death. Gunfire erupted in a hail of lead on the storefront as the party's pursuers descended upon their position. Ken struggled to keep his head down as he crawled to the dead mercenary's corpse and grabbed his rifle and ammo. Using his corpse to rest his gun on, Ken returned fire. Iris, get that door open now. He yelled, I am trying but the metal of this door is unlike anything I have handled before. Iris complained, the obstructive bars hidden beneath the door's facade that separated them from freedom are made from a composition of various materials with only one object being the familiar iron purified steel that Iris is used to metal shift. The rest were made out of alien non-metals that made her powers dampen in terms of effect. The aluminum glass and gypsum compound made it limited how far iris can manipulate the locks that and the fact she is under pressure from suppressive gunfire also didn't help her concentration i need mana aliathra yelled iris your necklace kane called out the witch unhooked her neckwear quickly and tossed it to kane over the counter she continued to struggle with the unusually made locks of the door whilst the other three members of her party were on defense. Kane passed the mana crystal to the elf who promptly siphoned the mana out of the high quality crystal. After a time of mana starvation the princess could feel her elven physiology and magical affinities return to her like when one was wandering a desert and found a watering hole, that is not a mirage. With her reserves back up to more preferable count, Aliathra began to cast some conjuration magic that she knew from her elven ranger training. By default, one of the elven ranger spells that all of them know by heart is the conjuration spell called Summon Bow. This is taught to them in the very first days of training in the belief statement that all rangers must be at the ready. She created a brilliantly bright blue bow from her hands that whenever she pulls the weapon's thinly glass-like bow string it creates a similarly colored magical arrow which as time goes on, it becomes powerful and comparable in terms of sheer penetration power, it is comparable to a high-powered bullet. Normally however the spell is used for emergencies only when a ranger is found without a weapon since it is more magically efficient to just enchant the arrows which in all existential importance was the essential item in the bow and arrow combo that makes selven rangers comparable to a contemporary rifleman. She pulled the bowstring and emerged from her cover, now with reinvigorated hope. She took aim and the first hostile fell down from her bow. His chest was pierced by the magic arrow that after it a moment was dissipated into nothingness, its particles fading away with the cold night wind. It left the man bleeding out profusely. Again, she pulled the bow and took fire. Every shot, the arrow landed on a gunman who tried to approach the convenience store, but for every one man they take down, two more takes his place. Their numbers and firepower seem to be unending. Beam rifle. Duck Diaz warned Aliathra. He dived down to Aliathra who was unaware that she overlooked a man who was carrying an unusually blocky but extremely destructive energy weapon. A verdant green beam of light slashed sideward from across the store's walls burning everything anything that it touched. Vincent managed to push Aliathra and himself out of the beam's way before it struck either of them. Yet from where Aliathra was standing she was unknowingly laying down fire while there's an entire shelf of motor oil, 
The beam's high energy at a movement combined with the oil's flammable properties caused the shelf to ignite brilliantly setting the place ablaze. Damnation. I thought they wanted us alive. Iris screamed. Well that's Kesselheim for you. Some want you alive, others dead. Diaz answered. He looked on at the fire and he saw the blaze began to engulf the entire store. The building felt like it was about to collapse on top of them any second now. You better hurry it up or we are gonna be dinner. Diaz yelled. I need a few more moments. Iris struggled. Sweat ash and tar fell down here flawless skin tainting her face. Hurry. Kayan turned his necks briefly to her as he continued to open fire his gun. The three continued on to defend Iris but now their makeshift fortifications were now being slowly sapped away by the oil fire. Not even the store's water sprinklers could do anything to stop the blaze but only cause it to erupt further. Eventually, the party began to run out of ammo, or mana in the case for the elf, places to hide and are starting to gasp for air. Iris cheered as she finally unlocked the door, she pushed it open and gestured everyone to get out. The party, wasting no time, regrouped with her as the store finally was fully engulfed in flames. Now in the back alleys of Kesselheim where they can slip away unseen. Diaz led them through the alleys, dodging trash, patrols and the occasional pest and stray animal to the Gleasons. The back alleys were like a softened version of the stories of the southern wastelands of Zanagrad where it's all volcanic rock and savage predatorial animals who hunt each other for their next meal. But still they find the smell of bio and non-biodegradable trash disposed indiscriminately in the plastic bins that littered the alleys. Before long, and much gagging later, Diaz halted the party as he gestured his eyes towards a shining bright light with the noises of car sounds following it. There's a bridge that will take us to the garden district. Hang on let me make a call, Diaz said as he picked up his phone, only to be greeted by dozens of unread messages and missed calls from his Apara Corporation associates. The unread messages were brief but alarmingly clear. You have been exposed. They are all hunting for you. Get to safety. Now. He always found texts and missed calls annoying but a necessary evil. He went to his contacts list and called up his boss Don Aparo, after a few brief moments of tensed silence in between the phones dial up and ringing, he heard a voice, Diaz, my boy, I, thought you were dead, Don Aparo's voice came out of the speaker, sorry boss, I was busy with them, I am okay for now, Diaz reassured, where are you? I will send some men to get you and those Gleasian girls and that black friend of yours out of here. Aparo asked. I am just near the Rainbow Bridge, near the Orchard District. Get anyone there now. We will be on foot. Diaz said. Got it. I will call in everything I can. Cops on our roll, mercenaries and some renter hoods. Stay safe all of you. Aparo said before he dropped the call. With the hope of safety just a bridge away. The party forged onwards to the bright light as they exit the back alleys. Welcoming them were the hustle and bustle of Kesselheim's rush hour. Cars moving left, right, up and down through the busy streets. Commuters walked past them like fishes moving upstream, ignorant to the four battle-weary companions. Everyone links up your hands and keep following me, Diaz told him. He grabbed Aliathra's hand where she held Cairns which is then followed by Iris. They navigated the dynamic jungle of human bodies as they approached the Rainbow Bridge. It is a colorful piece of architecture of the suspending wires varieties of bridges. It was held together by titanium suspensions that had omnilucent lights that shine every spectrum of the rainbow hence the bridge's colorful name. The bridge can accommodate a road for cars and buses, tracks for the monorail and two walking paths for those who wish to cross it by foot. Upon average the bridge can service an estimated average of 30,000 vehicles a day making it one of the youth's busiest mound of asphalt in their entire interstellar nation rivaling old Tokyo and Mars. Aliathra and Iris couldn't help but lose focus for a moment as they saw the bridge's lights shine in all the seven colors of the rainbow whose spectral light contrasted with the dark violet nightfall of Kesselheim. If it weren't for the boisterous noise of the, the traffic stuck cars made with their horns in addition to the passing by monorail and the heavy foot movement of people walking in a rhythm similar to a heavy downpour, the bridge would have been a very nice place to relax and see the sunset and rise every day. 
but halfway through the bridge, Diaz stopped as he urged the party to duck down on the side rails. What? Ken whispered. They dot a dot here. He fearfully mentioned upwards. Ken peeked outside and saw that there were more of the armed men who just exited their pitch black tinted SUVs and they were all not acting like a security detail of corporate VIPs. No, they were actively searching for them, examining every car, interviewing drivers and passers-by. Slowly but surely the bridge was getting into a pseudo lockdown. I have to say, I am touched by how much they miss me. Diaz snided. What do we do now? Iris asked. Nowhere to go but forward I am afraid. We need. You. A distraction. So you. By any chance you got any ideas? Diaz asked his companions. I can throw in this giant ball of light. It's an illusion spell that should blind them for a moment allowing us to run away. Aliathra suggested. Seems good enough. Ken nodded. I can agree to that. Let's go with that. Diaz said as he peeked over the side rails and strategized. He was no stranger to tactics and military thinking like Samantha. But compared to her, their mode of thinking was radically different. Diaz advocate for situational control in tandem with twistingly brilliant maneuvers above all else while Samantha focused on aggression and shock and awe. You see those seven over there chatting with each other? Diaz pointed to the thugs who were having a brief discussion about what they needed to do. Silently nodding, Aliathra casted a bright ball on her hand and then threw at the target. It erupted brilliantly blinding and disorienting the soldiers. Go! Diaz yelled as he emerged from his cover and opened fire. He shot a few bolts of lasers from Ruiner managing to take down two of the soldiers before they managed to pick themselves back up and gain their bearings. They saw their fleeing targets and began to open fire. Get him get him! One of the mercenaries ordered. Suppressive bullets flew through all over the intrepid companion's figures but luckily as if through divine intervention or sheer wit, they did not get hit by the bullets. Vinny, over here. The familiar voice of Bobby buzzed like a light in a dark room. Chef. Diaz smiled as he and the rest of his party met up with his old colleague. There was a mole back in HQ. Ratted you and Iris out. Come on. Let's get you out of here. Bobby said before the party could be safely escorted back to the garden district. Aliathra could hear a tearful goodbye. My baby. A young mother tried to reach out back into the fray of bullets and riddled automobiles but she was being forcibly stopped by policemen, who were under the Aparo payroll. Aliathra could feel that woman's sorrow strike chords in her heart as she turned around to see a crying child who was tearfully covering his ears and was carrying a gashing wound on his right leg. The young boy looked no older than four years old in a human's lifespan by the elf's deduction. In her years of studying under the clerics and nuns of Nenith, she was taught selflessness, self-sacrifice and benevolence to all who needs it. In that very moment, all of her prejudices, all of her fears and all of her subtlety were all thrown out to the drain as she hurriedly dashed towards the child. Hey! Diaz yelled trying to grab the elf but his reaction was found wanting. Aliathra weaved and dodged the bullets, the debris and occasional hazard as she made her way to the child. Diaz. After urging Ken and Iris to get out of the bridge, quickly followed her. After she reached the crying child, Aliathra hugged the poor boy close to her chest. It's okay little one. I will protect you. Aliathra comforted the boy. The bad men are. Are many dot everywhere. The boy stuttered before crying again. Indeed. Dozens of automatic fire began to besiege the car that the two were hiding from now that the mercenaries who were targeting the magic users spotted the elf rather foolhardily come towards them. Ignoring the distractions behind her, Aliathra gently grabbed the boy's leg and pulled it outwards to better assess the damage. It was a fairly standard fall wound on his knees that was contaminated with asphalt. Ailey, shit, I cover you. Diaz ordered as he opened fire his gun at their attackers. The bridge they were all on had become a war zone and a field day for journalists looking for the next big story. The various news companies of you famed their cameras at the elf whose hoodie was down exposing her pointy elven ears and graceful braids that looked so out of place in a contemporary city but not where Aliathra came from where a woman's hair is considered the epitome of elven beauty standards.
newscasters and reporters began to erupt in a wildfire of sensationalistic journalism as they began to discuss in a flurry of debates in similar veins to internet forums catering to fandom nerds like Space Battles, Sufficient Velocity, My Animalist and certain devoted demographics of Reddit. In all of the confusion, the message was clear. Who is this mysterious elf woman? Is that magic she is doing right now? Back at the ground, Aliathra was about to wrap up the finishing touches of the boy's wound. There we go. You're a strong little one, right? Aliathra smiled. Despite the high level of on-the-field stress right now she is facing, the satisfaction of helping a child in need made her ignore her mental pain albeit for a brief moment. Done. Let's get out of. Watch out. Diaz screamed as Aliathra turned her head around to see that one of the mercenaries managed to sneak around Diaz's protective gaze and aimed at Azza at point-blank range. Mommy. The boy began to shed tears as he saw his angelic savior about to get struck down. The elf princess quickly conjured a shield to protect her body from the taser just as the man was about to fire. Her shield barely had enough time to construct itself as the taser made contact with it. The electrical currents from the taser's probes made contact with the magical energies of the shield causing a surge of electrical energy to explode knocking back Haley threw off her feet and her attacker next to the boy, who was miraculously unharmed. Haley Diaz cried as he ran towards the elf who lay motionless on the ground. He checked her pulse and realized that it was failing. The elf maiden's eyes were bloodshot in a sinister contrast to Haley Aethra's as Eurirus's. No, no, no. Not on me. No, no. Diaz tried to grasp Haleathra as he grabbed her hand. She could feel the elf's lithe hands grip tightly on his. He didn't know it was a product of the electrical dispersion causing her muscles to contract or was it a sign of the elf's struggle to survive? For Haleathra, she was in death's store about to touch its knob. She could feel her heart slowing down as not all of the elven's superior physiological properties nor her self-inflicting restoration magic was enough to keep her from succumbing. The electricity in her body contracted as she felt defenseless, but the sight of Diaz who was always being nice to her despite several misconducts of manners attending to her made her give a slither but decisive will of perseverance. Vinny, damn it the kid. And the girl. Bobby ran towards him. His old and overweight Bill daringly entered the inferno of gunfire as the mercenaries close in after seeing a, an elven girl that they can capture for a hefty payday whether brought in dead or alive, b, a rival corporate agent who has caused so much grief and wasted money with his back turned in a very opportune manner, c, a senior figure of the said rival corporation who was hurriedly trying to rescue his friend and the elven girl. We need to get you out of here, I will never forgive myself if even either of the three of you die on me, Bobby said as he picked up Haleathra in a bridal carry. He then urged the straggling child who Haleathra freed to follow him to safety. There's too many of them Bobby, we're cornered. Diaz clamored, you need to do it, Bobby told him, with the last two words that gave Diaz a mental projection of what he needs to do if any of them are going to make it out alive. But Diaz tried to protest, don't worry. In a pyro, Siamo tutti una famiglia, we are all family, Bobby impelled him. In his years of being one Diaz's closest friends and working colleague, he knew why Diaz is so reluctant to do the one thing that he wanted him to do. To overclock his augmentations to the limit. It was deemed a dangerous and downright forbidden technique, a power at a terrible price, the benefits of superhuman enhanced performance at the tremendous risk of overheating his internal organs, rapid degradation of cybernetic augmentations structural integrity, potential permanent nervous system damage and in severe cases, death by self-inflicted heat stroke, rapid movement boosters. Activate overclock protocol. Password Devil Trigger Diaz mentally whispered to himself, it wasn't the way to actually make his cybernetics do overclock but if he's going to die he might as well say something nice for his gravestone so that his colleagues and new strider group friends have something to remember him by after his supposed funeral. 
He then mentally activated the systems and remove all the self-imposed safety limits that he created that separates him from casually abusing overclock for it was like a drug to those who abuse it. One way or the other. You will have a lethal overdose. The post pain of it all almost made him hesitated but for the first time ever. After about three other previous incidents beforehand where he did overclocked it wasn't for selfish survival and self-preservation needs. But now it is used to protect the people he cared and should care about. In that moment Vincente Diaz began his brief detour on a redemption mission to give back to the sins he had done in the past. In that moment, he was fighting something beyond himself. His body began to overflow with energy as all of his cybernetics began fire up his systems. He bended his knees down and draw Ruina. Come get me boys. Diaz confidently smirked as he ejected himself to face his decadent past. Dash. An unknown time later in a Saint Luke's. Dash. My god. That. Was. Glorious. Diaz smiled as dry ice packs and repair droids were tending to his body. His cybernetic limbs had signs of melting but were thankfully prevented from causing harm to the user or any of his surroundings thanks to the timely efforts of a nearby fire crew who sprayed Diaz with a shower of non-toxic chemical coolants after the effects of his overclock died down. I can't believe you actually did that, Samantha said, I can't actually believe you weren't there to fucking see me or actually smile to me like that. So now you like me? Diaz snarked, compared from earlier. I still don't trust you that much, but what you did earlier was something I honestly never expected you to do. In all of my years studying psychology and then enrolling for West Point, what you did was heroic. Samantha positively smiled. Thanks Sam. So I can now call you Sam now? Diaz asked. No. It's still Lieutenant Private. Samantha shot him down. Where's Aliathra? Is she? Okay. And that kid too? What happened to him? Diaz concerningly asked. The boy got reunited with his mother and is very happy you and the elf rescued him. As for Aliathra, the good news is that she's lucky she's alive. The bad news. The doctor wants to personally inform me about it. Hey I deserve to know too, Diaz said as he climbed onto a wheelchair. The ice packs still strapped onto his exhausted body. There was a slight chilling pain but it was rather safe for Diaz to be able to move around in wheelchair whilst allowing for limited movement of his arms and legs. Fine. The rest of Strider and also the guests want to greet her in her bed too. I will push, Samantha said as she went behind Diaz's wheelchair. Exiting his room and crossing to the other side of the hallway that they were residing in St. Luke's, Princess Aria can walk again but right now she's currently stuck using a pair of crutches. For now whilst the stem cells do a bunch blah blah medical jargon on her spine, according to the doctor. It will take time but by the time we return to New Albany, I am going make sure that Arya run to her brother for a great big hug, Samantha informed Diaz as she pushed him. Stu fucking Pendus. Vinny raised his heart to an upbeat attitude. Quiet. This is a peaceful and clean hospital. One of the medical staff reprimanded him. Yeah whatever nursey. Diaz passed it off as his wheelchair passed by the medical scrub. They then entered Aliathra's room where a doctor who was assigned for her well-being and recovery was in attendance. He was staring at a bundle of documents in an very astonished but also very insightful smile combined with shock. Aliathra could be seen sleeping quietly on a hospital bed where her pulse was attached to a monitor and her hand had four fluids pumped inside her. Dr. Hanjan? Samantha asked. Lieutenant Rose. It is good to see you. The subject is expected to make a full recovery. In all honesty, this Ailey, Atra, woman is quite there. I don't want to be offensive about it but I was about to say specimen. But I just simply can't ignore this. The doctor tried to tactfully explain to Samantha with a forced smile on his Indian face. Just cut to the chase doctor. What are you hiding from the youth state? Samantha pushed. Well this elf as you call it is quite similar to our physiology Miss Rose. Same amount of body parts albeit with rather minor differences, more tense muscles, no signs of any metabolic lust and even aging. This woman is at peak physical health and it's uncanny, as if like, 
she's a designer human or something like that beyond those lines. If only I can say the say the same for her heart, I would have loved to at least scan it if it didn't look like. Well you, I think you should see it yourself, Dr. Hugent said as he presented to them to their shock. Aliath res charcoal heart. It looked like it was left too long on an oven. Samantha commented with disgust. More like a piece of poo to me. Yuck. Diaz reacted with even more visual disgust than his superior officer. Wait. Does that mean? Diaz then caught himself when he soon realizes that since he is looking at Aliathra's burnt guardian then that means the heartbeat that was coming from the monitor was. I replaced the elf's heart with a synthetic, Dr. Han Jun said. You what? Samantha snapped. Should. I don't know. Tell her? Diaz asked. No, I don't want to risk her amplifying her stress to the point her body rejects the organ. I mean we don't even have any natural donors who are elves you know. Besides the artificial heart is working perfectly right now and if it persists then it should be able to fully integrate itself into her body with her not even noticing the difference, Dr. Han Jun explained. That was a very risky move you know. She reprimanded. By my honor as both as Doctor of St. Luke's and by the Hippocratic Oath I simply didn't have much options. It was either she gets a new heart or she dies. Please you have to understand where I am coming from here. I am the cardiologist here. Dr. Hugen pleaded. If this self, woman alien, whatever you damn doctors call her dies, or gets any kind of complications with her heart I am holding you responsible. Samantha asserted herself. She fiercely tapped her finger on Dr. Hugen's chest antagonistically. There was a disdain in her language on the doctor's terminologies of classifying Aliathra which for Samantha she found disdainful in the philosophically existential point of view. I will answer to the state if it does. He cracked. Ah. Oh. Was it all? A dream? Aliathra's voice interrupted them. Knowing he was still carrying Aliathra's previous heart, Dr. Hanjun awkwardly gnashed his teeth before discreetly running out of the door. Diaz and Samantha both approached the Nari Awaken elf and they smiled to her albeit forced, still trying to hide the fact of their shock on what the doctors had to do to ensure she could open her eyes again. What happened? Aliathra asked. Oh you got dazed. Like a stun as you can dot a. Say? Diaz gagged. You're in the hospital now for minor injuries. You will be just out and about the day after tomorrow. Samantha said. I remembered. A light and my body failing and then there was you. I saw you run up to me and held my hand. I grasped it as hard as I could. I. I didn't want to die. Aliathra said. That's what I like to hear. Some good old will to live. You got some heart you know that? Diaz said as he openly smiled at Samantha. Indeed, you do, say. Miss Sivrin? That's the name your last name, right? Samantha asked. Sylvan yes. Of Ethylon. Aliathra maintained her cover. So Aliathra, while we are all here, would you like to cheer up? I got something you might like and the rest of my friends would love to see it too right here in your room on the TV. Samantha said. The magic mirror on top of me? Samantha and Vincente couldn't help but react in laughter on her answer. Clark's must be rolling in his grave again even more now than compared to last time. It's the Lord of the Rings complete series in Blu-ray. A movie about fantasy worlds filled with monsters, elves and epic quests. She explained while trying to maintain a straight face. Oh. It's about your history? And you got to record it? I would love to see it. Aliathra eagerly nodded. Yeah. You. Okay whatever. So, wait. The rest of Strider group? Diaz questioned. Surprise kiddo. A bee dire cheers erupted. He was followed by Cain, Iris, Crocker, and Clay. They were carrying a whole assortment of snacks alongside thoughtful get well soon cards for both Diaz and Aliathra. We got popcorn, ice cream, chips and chicken. With of course some gravy. A bee dire smiled. Lord of the Rings Marathon. Ooh ooh. Clay howled. Quiet now. We barely got these through security. Hey LT. Does that include the Hobbit? Crocker asked. Yep. Samantha smiled. What is this Lord of the Rings you talk about Cain? Iris asked Cain who was now firmly holding his hand. It's a film based on a book about a fantasy world kind of like yours. 
It's one of the best written books the youth ever created from J.R.R. Tolkien. You will love it I assure you. You can sit next to me and we can share the blanket, Cain said. He had a flustered look on his face as he guided Samantha who was carrying the ice cream containers to the table. After a long day of high pressure action and a time of separation, everyone in Strider group were back together again and now have a moment for themselves as Samantha placed the DVD on the machine as the Lord of the Rings cinematic series began to play. In that moment, everyone could rest for a fleeting moment of felicity as the SOG team sat down grabbed their snacks and watched at the 40-inch TV screen. As for both Iris and Aliathra, the visual colors of Tolkien's adapted into film book captured their imaginations as they fell into a lucid state of deep immersion. Chapter 20, Return to Sender Pull Reed yelled as the soldiers fell back from their positions. It was dark, tight and heavily close quarters in the underground tunnels beneath the mountains. The marines were buying the demolition team time to properly set the explosives to bury the entire place. King Martin's skeletal warriors have so far been a significant help in bogging their attackers. Gunfire was exchanged by arrow and magics from the Slay agents as the youth scrambled for cover. The bright magical missiles thrown from Carlia and several accompanying battle mages suppressed the marines to the pillars. The rules of engagement states by order of Major Holyfield is to leave no survivors. Damn it. I am down to my last mag. One of the marines yelled. Switching to secondary. Yelled another. Firing. And that soldier warned as his rocket launcher blasted out of his shoulder. It zipped past the marines straight into a shielded formation of Slay Agent Legionnaires obliterating them where they stand. For the Empire. Rally cried one of the knights as he charged into the fray. He and a couple dozen or more medieval fantasy troops advanced at the marines. They were under the covering fire of magic missiles launched by Carlia and her mages in a rainbow display of magical prowess. The projectiles struck like rain falling on a roof of the tunnel's walls and pillars. Some exploded in a expulsion of fire, others made the ground it made contact with explode in freezing cold ice. Ag! It stings like a motherfucker. One of the marines cursed and gnashed his teeth, as he dove down to a nearby pillar for cover and looked at his forearm. It was struck by one of Carlyer's magic missiles in the exposed part of his rolled-sleeved army fatigues of his right forearm. The wound was similar to a bullet entry wound with the additional effects of a cauterized skin with third-degree burns and the wound was bleeding like a leak in a pipe. The rifleman luckily had a bandage on his pocket and with a little bit of dexterous movements from his uninjured left arm which was weaker than his right, he applied himself first aid and was back on the fight but in a reduced combat effectiveness posture now resorting to using his pistol to return fire. Filthy sorcery. Feel God's wrath upon you. Bishop breached as he unloaded several shells of his master combat shotgun at the Slay agents to read and the marines credit. He was fighting just as or even more intensely than they could do. The old priest was also albeit in a disparaging display of foolhardiness say he was letting himself be exposed right out in the open field. Yet as if from an act of divine providence, arrows, javelins and even a couple of magical projectiles narrowly avoided him. Your priest friend. I like him. King Martin commented, he reminds me of this crazy druid I knew who was my tutor. Well glad to know you're getting along with the last person I expect you would buddy up with but we got a tunnel to blow up. Inspector Reed yelled. How much longer Sage? Reed called out to one of the demolition engineers. Etc. Two minutes. Keep him away from us. The engineer replied. Begone back to whence you came spawns of hell. A distinctly armored man carrying with him a shiningly bright blade of a pale orange color struck down a whole squad of King Martin's skeletons. He was backed up with a dwarfish man with graying hair dual wielding a hand crossbow and an axe. Findrum. Flying Angel. Petra said as he began to feel overwhelmed with fatigue and minor burnout. He had one more card left to play that he uses when the fight hangs in the balance. The dwarf cupped his hands and placed his arms around his waist, his strong limbs in preparation for a boost as Sir Petra dashed towards the dwarf, 
he whispered in his head to will himself a cast of two of his favorite combination of utility spells which have more indirect uses in combat applications from the restoration school which is haste and fly. Restoration not only covers healing spells but it also has several spells that revolves around the person's body expending themselves to perform preternatural feats no one with magic could hope to achieve. Just as he was about to run over the child-sized man, Petcher's feet stepped off of the handy platform that Findrum made and upon contact, Findrum with his innate strength pushed Petcher upwards with all of his might. The magic soon began to flow in Petcher's body as he felt becoming lightweight as a feather. The magic knight's feet leapt off of Findrum's hands giving the jump start to finally levitate his feet off the ground. Towering above everyone by about 10 feet gave him a significant height advantage. With his spells or casting abilities, he grabbed an ethereal halberd from his hands and with a heavy swing and a hateful gaze for all demon and undead kind reaped down on the skeletons who swarmed below him like ants. Cutting them down was much easier when compared to doing the same on his feet but it left him more exposed to the enemy gunfire that he across the hall cowering behind the tunnel's pillars. Cowardly demons come and face me in glorious hand-to-hand -hand combat. When will Xigliloth send me a champion worthy of my strength? Petra invoked the seducer's accursed name. The old ancient legends said that Xigliloth was responsible of turning all bone against all of the world. Gave him secrets that turned his army into a terrifying legion of the damned that seek to devour Gleesia. It took the Empire's founder called Elstla Ejak and the ancestors of what will consist of the future noble families of Sainagrad to defeat him. Although Petra was only a few feet away from the ground, he now had an advantage against the skeletons, height like a farmer on a field of wheat in harvest day. He continued his reaping. Bones and rusted iron flew like tossed wind and rain in a storm as the Tyranny skeletons were cut down by the warped weapons of Sir Petra but his advantage came at a cost. He was just as exposed to the hail of firing projectiles that volleyed over him but thanks to his speed, he managed to expeditiously retreat to the cover of the pillars before hitting and running back to take down the skeletons. Focus fire on that fucking pretty boy up there, Reed ordered. We are done. Let's get out this place is going to blow. The demolition sergeant interjected in a moment of opportunity. Petra met his eyes on Inspector Reed who he got a good look on the face of these outsiders. His face was human but his body, everything from the blue short sleeve shirt with the golden badge on the sides to the leather like vest on his torso were all otherworldly to him. Even the metal stave he carried which he could confirm the rumors he had heard from travelers from Tyrian spat fire and drum thunder all in a nimble rhythm to outclass even the finest archery lines. After a moment of awe, the magic knight switched to raw and utter hatred. He dove down from his heightened position, not noticing the explosive charges starting the detonation process. His spear aimed to impale the tainted flesh of these demons. Further Bishop, for want of a nail looked back as he reloaded the slug shells of his shotgun and saw that pretty boy Slaeijan was about to make a nose-diving attack on the inspector. Die! Minion of all bone. Petcher gleefully said as he raised his weapon to the air at the unsuspecting reed. Psalm 67 Alien Scum. Bishop yelled as he breached a shot of 12G slugs at Petcher's direction. The shot landed on Petcher's armor but his armor managed to save him from being penetrated due to the thick Burragonite metal that he commissioned from some of the finest dwarven human smiths in Sanigrad. However due to the initial precondition of him enchanting his body with haste and fly restoration spells made him deceivingly bantam weight compared to his real 150 kilos, the stronger force impact of the priest's shotgun with collided with Petra's dainty frame caused the magic knights to fly the opposite direction 15 feet away from Reed. The inspector turned around to see what Bishop fired and saw the knockdown pretty boy magic knight and turned again to the priest who pumped a new shell into his shotgun's chamber smirking proudly that he defended God's children. Even Reed gave a fleeting but sincere smile too as a mental projection of gratitude, but then the tunnel began to start shaking. Then the ceiling collapsing gradually and thunder rumbling from the distance. The demolition has begun. Run, Reed told the old man. They turned tail and rammed their way through the slowly collapsing tunnel hall. 
It was a straight but very strenuous if running for one's dear life 100 hundred meters to the safety of the exit. Reed and Bishop were the only people that were in the last and worst possible position one can be in the planned demolition of the tunnels. Debris fell down and explosions occurred but the men, despite their rage skillfully dodged and weaved through the structure as the whole place began to collapse even further with more intensity. Meanwhile at the Stlae Aegean side of the tunnel, Petcher was helped up by his comrades Findrum, Carlia and Mita who got the knight back up to his feet. The tunnel. They are destroying the tunnel, Findrum screamed, denying us the shortcut to bypass the mountains. Clever. Carlia reasoned out the possible motivation behind such a turn of events. We need to leave now or this place will be our graves. Mita tugged Petcher who tried to chase after the demons. She had to be supported by Carlia and Findrum who tried to yank the hot-headed magic knight from certain doom. All around them the tunnel was collapsing and they might have only less than a minute left to get themselves out of their less meters words become true. Giving up albeit with much loathsome breath, Petra relented and gave up his little tug of war and let their eternal enemies go. He turned around and he sprinted alongside his companions. Watch out Petra, Carlia yelled as she formed a protective force field around the party. Rocks began to fall directly on top of them but the shield held, deflecting the boulders to the sides. But Carlia had to move slowly since the magic shield has to be channeled properly to maintain its strength. The adventurers were now painstakingly inching their way to the bright exit on the Slae Aegean side of the tunnel but every second they are still in the tunnel. The entrance slowly sealed itself with ruined boulders. Petra used the last few bits of his mana to cut down the boulders into more manageable sizes as the party made the home stretch when the tunnel was good as clogged except for the small gap of space of magic shieldings being produced being besieged by the full weight of the mountain and tunnel's collapsing edifice. Fatigue, sweat and the mana burnout plagued Carlia as she used up the last of her strength to push herself to the last few meters between everyone and safety. Yeah, Carlia screamed with all of her lungs as she and the rest of the Grey Order adventurers leapt out of the tunnel entrance before the whole mountain descended fully upon them. A great expulsion of dust followed fogging and irritating their eyes for a few moments before their eyes could clarify. They were all alive and accounted for. Beaten up but still a mendable shape, except for Carlia. Carlia, Petra shouted as he moved over the mage. She was breathing and sweating heavily like if she had just run a marathon. She was suffering from a severe mana exhaustion. We need a cleric now, Mita said as she turned around to see if the rest of the people who made it out, but she only saw a dozen other people besides them. All were either Slay Aegean legionnaires or some of the levied laborers. We need a healer here. One of ours burnt out her mana. Mita asked the survivors. The cleric that came with us. He was. In there, one of the legionnaires reluctantly informed the crow. I saw him, chanting some battle prayers and exorcisms but, the demons got him with their magic. His body, filled with so many blood holes, invisible arrows, he stuttered trying to break the bad news, to see such power, unprecedented, unseen, unheard of. The trauma. What? Are we all that is left? Petra said unnervingly. I am afraid so. Come. The town of Vercourt is only about half a day from here, let's carry the maid to the cart and hurry. Findrim ordered, as the survivors licked their wounds and gathered their carts for the road ahead, Petra's mind boiled with anger. They have not succeeded in their objectives, it was a mission failure. The shame of his first defeat, permanently branded on the magic knight's ego. He looked back at the collapsed tunnel as he was about to board the carriage wagon to the next town. The Emperor will hear of this desecration, Petra vowed. Meanwhile at the other side of the Dorham Mountains, Reed and Bishop were panting for breath, their bodies expended to the limit that people their age could fully muster, but their faces were kissed by the bright afternoon sun rather than the cold hard rock of the collapsed tunnels. Ha ha dot ha 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 ha. The priest began to laugh. What's so funny? Reed asked. I never felt so. So. Good for the last twenty years like this, the thrill, the bright lights, the danger. So, this is what Jesus felt like when he walked the earth to save the masses. I, 
I'm beginning to like this place already, Bishop said as he pushed himself upwards to stand up, but he began to feel some cramps on both of his thighs, grasping both tightly with his hands as he unsteadily rose upright. Nothing like a chair and a hot compress can't fix. I wonder if 7-Eleven got some instant tea or hot chocolate. I could use some right now, Bishop commented. Sir I got Major Holyfield on the line with me. What should I say to him? A radioman briefly butted in with his electronic mic on his cupped hand. Tell him. We are heading back to New Albany. The tunnels are gone. But I believe this is only the beginning. Reed muttered to him he felt like he was awakening a sleeping giant, and give it a thirst for vengeance. But for the slay agents in the other sides, they were about to say they just stepped into the gates of Seven Hells itself, unknowingly attacking someone far greater than anyone in Gleesia can ever hope to imagine. Dash meanwhile at Kesselheim Stardux. Dash. Iris Kadahagan eyes wandered like a breezy child. The Kesselheim city lights twinkled in unison with the stars above them. She was at the departure lounge's balcony of the Kesselheim Stardux quietly stargazing. The stars and the city lights made it hard to tell the difference between them in a beautifying display of contrasting visual arts. Trying to tell which bright distant light is a lit window or a star distracted the boredom of waiting for many hours in that departure lounge. It was a good thing that the first class exclusive membership club was completely reserved for the interstellar slash otherworldly guest for that night. The Manila is currently still fueling up and other pre-flight preparations and checks that takes time for the logistics ship to process through. She had always wondered, ever since she had left Gleesia, where her home world was in that vast ocean of darkness with starlit lanterns. She tried to reach out on all the stars out there as if she was trying to catch butterflies from the days of her youth. Despite the frightful incident of being chased by exploitative megacorpos who wanted her and Aliathra, she had an overall fun time at. Hey Iris, Samantha's voice interrupted her daydreaming. She was followed by their new elf companion Aliathra. Greetings Samantha and Aliathra. Care to share a seat with me outside? Iris offered. I would love to. Samantha nodded yes. The two newcomers grabbed the chair on one of the balcony's tables and sat next to the vampire. It was a rather intimate all-female sit-down between the three. Samantha still had suspicions and concerns for the elf especially after she was discharged from St. Luke's with that artificial heart. She was unknowingly implanted in to save her life. But Command said otherwise and insist that she is to be safely returned to Gleesia where she belongs. The once beyond scared straight elf who would hesitantly take a step forward in their presence was slowly brightened up as her demeanor upgraded to a content but stoic face. The lieutenant had always noticed that the elf was always very observant, almost nosy even when she walked the streets of Kesselheim both from her first hand account and the accounts of Diaz and Cain who had accompanied her. Originally, she wanted to personally take care of the whole touring part of the trip for the elf but she was told by Clay that she, Iris, Diaz and Kane were spirited away by people who looked like they were from a Paro corporation. So as the person in charge of introducing you, well officially to the safe being an enjoyment of our guests, I am required to ask for your feedback, Samantha told them. Feedback? Aliathra asked. You're required to ask us what we think? The elf continued her question. Yes, both of you. I got Princess Aria and her entourage's opinions and they said they enjoyed the whole trip and are inspired by all the sights of the youth's largest ecumenopolis. Sorry. City Planet, Kesselheim. Samantha said. City Planet? Are you saying that this celestial body is an entire city? Aliathra raised her voice in curious but very pushy dialogue. Indeed, our Hume. We Earth humans are very knowledgeable when it comes to such large and long-term engineering projects. Samantha answered, How can you build such a colossal planet? Back in Gleesia this would have been an impossible feat, even with our magic and every architect in existence both dead and alive to build this. This, Iris, almost excitedly pointed to the Kesselheim skyline. Hundreds of years of knowledge, 
experience, learned mistakes and some really forward-thinking architects of our own. Samantha couldn't contain her slight smile. She remembered from her contemporary history books that the people who made the conversion of Kesselheim from a mineral-rich savanna planet into the Ecumenopolis it is today were, by all accounts a few screws loosed inside their marbles. We have millions. No. Billions of books, data, records that detail all of our knowledge through the ages. Samantha stood up and spread her arms out like a bird in flight emphasizing the infinite knowledge that the youth have compared to the two primitives. So, you're saying you have your own great library of lion learner? Aliathra said, the center of knowledge in all of Gleesia, have you seen it? They say that you need to have permission to access the lower vaults and it's not even open to the general public. Did you actually? Went inside those vaults? Iris asked. Just one. It was about healing spells and notes from ancient clerics. Aliathra fibbed. It was further from the truth that as Alatha, she and her family by default had unlimited access to the entire great library. Not open to the general public you say? That doesn't sound healthy. Samantha objected. Why? Why would you say that? Aliathra stood up from her chair pridefully. One such the reasons why access to the great library is limited via referral memberships, or being Alatha was that first, the library has an archive of magic-related literature ranging from books, thesis, arcane treatise and journals of arcanists and those who researched the winds of magic and related phenomena. All dangerous in the wrong hands, especially to those of powerful magical capabilities. I am just saying, that keeping some information locked up can be very unhealthy. I mean more of the words of, regressive, Samantha argued. If you keep so much knowledge locked up, why keep it when it is meant to be shared? For such advanced knowledge we had to keep it safe from the others. Maybe dot maybe one day the librarians might let you come in. Aliathra tactfully reassured Samantha's curiosity. They were, even before they split were the most powerful civilization in all of Gleesia. Many of their own discoveries of magic and the mana crystals were made through hard work trial and error and some cases pure dumb luck, and straight up accidental divine inspirations. Such knowledge and intricacies were so complicated that only elves in their long lifespans could even hope to master, let alone be able to memorize such theorems, laws and reactions. The other races were more focused in their more base needs and wants such as food and a roof to sleep under. Elves in the other hand don't need to worry of such things and can dribble in the diversions of more refined paths such as artists, martial and aesthetic wise, philosophers and scientists. Elves were such blessed beings able to feel every intimate details of the world around them, the magic, the life, the touch of textures, the taste of a meal. The feeling of happiness. The feeling of homesickness. Homesickness. Aliathra looked back up to the stars again. She was mesmerized by their twinkling beauty but she was a stranger in an even stranger land. She felt a disconnection between her and the mana of Gleesy air, like a sense of abandonment. The same feeling one would expect a lover who let you go, or a child despairing over being orphaned. Where is Gleesia? From here? Aliathra muttered. She could feel her heartache as she said those words. The glass and painted concrete composure of Kesselheim was appreciative of such architecture but the absence of anything natural was uncanny to her. She missed the fresh air of the green meadows, the feel of the wind and the sprinkling of river waters splashing by rocks. Now that you mention Delph, where is it from here? Iris asked Samantha. Hang on, I got a nap for that. Samantha reached into her pocket. An app? Iris asked. You know our computers, right? Those machines that make our jobs easier? Samantha reminded the vampire. Yes. And you got many of such gizmos from as small as your hands to as big as a war horse. Iris answered. Well, the way our computers make our jobs easier is through these special abilities that we are encode. I mean, enchant. Yeah, I guess that makes more sense to you. We enchant our computers with these runes you see here on my computer that helps us do work. This rune here is called Kepler's Augmented Reality Stargazer. 
It let us see stars and find out more about them. Samantha pointed to an application she has on her phone of the said name. Ever since the advent of Earth humans ascending and expanding to the stars there was a renaissance on all things astronomy, sci-fi and xenology related. Kepler's augmented reality stargazer allows the user to be able to visually see the stars in whatever constellations that can be seen from the user's current position. More often than not, it was quite a perspective shift to see new constellations from other planets compared to the classical ones back at Earth. Samantha typed in their current location of Kesselheim and raised her smartphone's camera pointing upwards for the app to be able to function properly. After a second the camera view sparked a life with highlighted points, text and speech bubbles that were attached to each star. They even noticed that some of the constellations had playfully drawn pictures that were outlined to visibly represent the constellation. They saw a constellation that looked like a chair, another a trident and a crescent moon, they each had assigned names and the way they were speaking to the Gleasons was inviting. So, Benham's system should be over. Right there. Samantha turned to the right and pointed with her right hand while her left held her phone. The two other women huddled to her and looked upwards as they aligned the aim of their eyes to the direction of Sam's fingers. Benham's system is right over there. Frontier Territory. We called in Benham after a naval surveyor back when we Earth humans used to be sailing the seas rather than the stars. It's the name we call Glee Easier Over. Which reminds me. Do you have a name? For your star, son? Samantha asked. Anady. Aliathra said. Sounds like a really nice name. Samantha smiled. So where is this Earth you? Strange. You. Variety of sorts of human you said you come from? Aliathra asked. Right. Over. There. Samantha turned to the opposite direction and pointed again. What does your home look like? When I saw it from the ship it looked like it was just a giant big rock. No signs of a sea, or any foliage. Aliathra said. Yeah, is your home like that too? Iris asked. No. Watch here. Look. Samantha turned to her phone and tapped the icon for the Sol system, often nicknamed as the Origin system. The screen zoomed to a star system with elliptical arcs that hover around the sun. She tapped to the planet that was third closest to the star and zoomed in. The planet was mostly blue saved for some blemishes of green land that covered an eye-catching proportion of the land to water ratio of the planet. It was strangely like how Gleasia was theorized to look like if viewed from the heavens. Too bad they haven't developed any space-worthy technology to prove such theory that Gleasia was mostly green and blue. A marriage of jade land, with some discoloration from deserts and mountains, and as Eurotians all made. As their religion states by the loving care of Nenith goddess of life. It's like. Ours. Iris said mesmerized by the technology of the youth. How did you learn of such enchantments? I would like to meet these enchanters, perhaps we can talk about how we both share the same the vampire asked in her own, comedically mistaken, interpretation of Samantha's lecture on computer applications. I just. Got. The runes. For free at the store. He he. Samantha blushed. It was like trying to explain the birds and the bees to children in a language comprehensible to such archaic individuals. She couldn't help but hide her laughter in vain. What's so funny? Aliathra asked. Was it the fact that you said after watching that magic mirror play that theatre performance of Lord of the Rings and you said when Diaz asked you what did you like in it, you said I liked Jim Lee. He reminds me of my ranger master. Boisterous, tough for his small size and farts a lot when he's drunk. Iris gave out her guess on the sudden change of air that filled the redhead's face with such wild mirth. And I can still remember the roar of laughter that followed. I, don't get it, what's so funny? The elf complained. Were you paying attention to the film Miss Aliathra? Samantha twitched her eyebrows. Hey ladies, pizza is here. Crocker interrupted them. Pizza? Aliathra asked. Oh you will love it. Ken was such a dear when he and Vincent introduced me to it. It's like a pie. But you get to see the insides of it. Iris answered. The elf was no stranger to pies. Having at a dozen kinds of them from the fruit pies, vegetarian pies and meat pies for appetizer. Main course and desert for breakfast, lunch and dinner. 
she finds the cross-section part of the inner workings of the pie to be the most fascinating thing to see when she sits down on the table for a slice. Yet an open face pie was something she had never heard of. Wouldn't the ingredients flood out of the crust-like flood of mint cuisine on the clear table floor ruining its hygienic purity? They walked back inside the lounge where the youth and their otherworldly guests gathered themselves around a table as half a dozen square boxes were stacked on top of each other. A righty, I shall now show you my fantastic friends. One of God's greatest gifts upon all of mankind. Pepperoni. Diaz smiled as he flipped open the topmost box. The pizza pie was flat, with no distinguishing features but white curdles that dotted the golden brow surface of the pizza. Aliathra was disappointed by the revelation. Oh shit. This is the cheese. Diaz awkwardly knocked his head in admission of being caught dumbfoundedly in front of guests, diplomatic guests to boot. He pulled the cheese pizza aside and peeked open the box for a moment before confidently smiling again. Pepperoni. Diaz smiled as he flipped open the second box. It was much more visually stimulating compared to the bland aesthetics of the cheese pizza. There were slices of a blood-red colored pizza that dotted the oozy cheese ground of the pie. Their bodies showed signs of slight rising and a few bumps from the effects of molecular expansions when inside the oven. The slices' sun-kissed bodies also emitted an enticing peppery scent that tingled the noses. Guests first, Diaz said as he grabbed a circular saw and began to loosen the cheesy bonds of the pizza to allow the ease of serving. Aliathra, not wanting to insult her marks grabbed a slice of pizza and a plate. She silently stared at the morsel, not knowing how to eat it. Normally she would have eaten a pie with a fork and a knife but she wasn't given any such utensil. Then she noticed that some of the youth humans were eating the pie with their bare hands in a very uncouth display. See this is the best way how to eat it everyone. Diaz demonstrated by biting down a slice of the pizza in front of the guests before smiling. But to Aliathres and even the guests shock. There was a red pulp that stained the outlays of his mouth after he took away his slice of the pizza. Is that blood? Princess Arya gasped. Oh no. This isn't blood is one of their um, ingredients you put in pizza. Tomato. It's a fruit. At least according to most people. That when you mash it down to a sauce looks like blood. Don't worry it's actually taste very sweet and pulpy. Come on try it. Diaz explained. I was in that position too when I ate it. It's not blood and a bee dye has been selling them to the farmers and they said they love it. Iris added. Thanks Cyrus. A bee dye wholeheartedly showed his gratitude for the good word. With some hesitation the Tyrian entourage bit down on the pizza. Their concerned eyes soon changed to ecstatic smiles as they rose up and nodded approvingly on their food. Aliathra looked down on her food again. Reassured that she wasn't inadvertently eating something abominable. Aliathra, with the visual reference aside, grabbed hold of the pizza slice but as her delicate elven hand made contact, she felt a burning singe on her lithe palms. Ah, Aliathra cringed. She reflexively dropped the slice back to the plate's surface. She shook her hands to fend off the stinging feeling of the still fresh out of the oven dish. After it subsided, she looked at her hand and saw her hand had left a slight pinkish burn mark on her flawless ivory skin. So this is why mother told me that I should never eat with my hands. The elf said to herself, hey, here. Diaz's voice snapped her out of her own self-thought. He hand her a pair of plastic fork and knife for the pizza. Come on, please enjoy it. I had to run all the way across the terminal to get you this. Diaz said with a raspy breath. Grabbing the utensils, Aliathra delicately cut the very tip pizza slice and extracted a singular pepperoni slice from its cheese melted restraints and placed it right on top of the incised portion. She softly pierced the piece with her fork and placed it on her mouth and with the grace of an elven maiden took a bite. She enjoyed it, the moment the pepperoni, cheese and tomato sauce made contact with her mouth, the flavors exploded. At first it was spicier than she would normally would it but the spice made her mouth water with desire as soon as she swallowed the pizza slice. She immediately cut up a larger portion of her slice with her knife and fork. And again. And again all the way to the crust. This is wonderful human. Aliathra said. Thank you, Sir Vincent. 
she flattered him with a fake smile. The elf needed to gain more of his trust since as she observed, this earth human, demon, person thing was the one who showed interest to her like a suitor walking to try for her hand. Oh, my lady, an honor for your service. Blay Diaz sarcastically bowed chivalrously. So, princess what will you do after you get back to Gleesia? He asked her. Aliathra still remembered the cover story she and Diaz made to explain her unexpected appearance in front of Don Aparo in his corporate headquarters. Oh, I will go stop by at Vercourt outside of Tyrian before heading back to Eth Island. I will tell stories about New Albany during my travels as a good word for all of you. Aliathra lied. Vercourt, according to her instructions will be a rendezvous point for her and her Grey Order contacts. She would go there after she finished her scouting mission in New Albany and relay her findings to them. She have lots of stories to tell metal demons of questionable origins, cities as tall as mountains, everything ruled by magic and these mega corporations apparently ruled like kings thanks to their incomprehensible resources, power and ruthlessness if her near-death experience in Kesselheim had anything to go by. How in the heavens would her people and the whole Gleesian world can compete with such other worlders? She has seen how they contained the land by their presence in New Albany reshaping the land to what they deemed fit. She has seen their warriors, where one of their augmented of the speed and strength of ten of their best knights. She prayed to Nanith for some sort of sign of salvation from such radicalism. She saw the way their honeyed words and disarming inventions charm Princess Arya, a pillar of influence and moral support from the auspicious Princess Clovich of Tyrian based on her gathered information about the ruler of the Principality. She could feel her heart in a limbo of despair and feigning her stoic aura in front of such seemingly hostile elements around her. Dash. The next day, Dash. After some delays on the Manila's pre-flight preparations which involved tracking a shore-leaved sailor to a brothel, a misplaced fusion battery and a rat infestation. The military cargo ship was now ready to set her sails again. All it needed to do now was to deliver in some fresh new cargo of much needed supplies, machinery and equipment for New Albany and the slowly modernizing Tyrian. News from Governor White confirmed that they have now implanted some asphalt onto the larger old dirt and stone roads where carriages and the youth's many vehicles can pass through with ease like blood vessels fueling the growing health of the two cities slowly adopting each other like sisters. For Aparo Corp, their invested support was immediately felt. Crates with their branding were hauled into the cargo bays of the Manila. Samantha can count two dozen shipping crates that were eight feet height and forty feet in length. Robert Byongchin overseeing the logistical leap. So, tell me Mr. Byongchin, what are inside these crates? Samantha asked him. Mostly surplus items and dead stock inventories that the warehouse boys were trying to look for an excuse to get rid of them. This is all just the first wave of Aparo Corp's support for you guys, all the stuff we can ship to you guys in a moment's notice without having to pay taxes or bribing some corpo hacker not to rat us out. Dozers, constructor meshs, mazaks and other CNC machineries, chemicals, guns. All last last last. General. Guns? Samantha exclaimed. To hear the dreadful G word. Ever heard of gunboat diplomacy? Robert twitched his eyebrow. Wouldn't that be too harsh on them? Samantha objected. Apara may be optimistic on betting his chips on Benham 3 Lieutenant but he isn't naive. He always protects his investments. Legal or not. Besides, the constructor meshes are going to get paraded during the official opening of the youth embassy. It's going to happen in about three days after we touch down on Benham. Heard Governor White is going to make an epic speech when the ribbon gets cut. You know to show us as being peaceful and willing to live together in harmony. You know typical sweet talking and smiling to charm them to our side. The magics of behaviorism. Say some magic words and they will happily do what you say. I think I glossed it over in the mission file. Samantha confessed to her moment of inattention. Hang on, you said last several times before saying Jen. What gives on that? Oh, it's mostly the constructor mesh's third generation of its kind back when they were still relegated to civilian work with their balls and asses hanging in the wind like a naked hobo. That until before the military attached a minigun and a 90mm on it and bam, 
Battletechs were born. Hey I heard that Major Holyfield is attached with a garrison there alongside 119th Mechanized and 53rd Engineering. Heard that the 119th has a whole bunch of medium and heavy meshes including the Neutronese model ultra-cooled cannon. Robert said with a breath of geeky excitement when he talked about the meshes. He couldn't help it because Aparo Corp's weapons design division were the designers of the Trinis Battle Tech's main feature. A 180mm autocannon with a specially made barrel made from a top secret alloy that allows to the gun to be continuously fired without overheating for extended periods of time. This in complementary conjunction with the gun's autoloader which can load 10 rounds minute. An impressive statistic for such a gun's caliber. An additional fact from his statement is that the early meshes had their vital parts such as support structuring engine, exhaust completely exposed in order for maintenance engineers to quickly work on them in case they malfunction. This was an early design flaw that was addressed some time later when the constructor meshes and eventually their offspring the battle techs were given protective covering and more reliable inner machinery when they are sent off to more hostile workplace environments such as icy gale wind tundra and the spontaneously combustive volcanic yet mineral rich planets. I have seen one in a demonstration once during the last year of my cadet days but I still believe it's quite overkill. I mean we are dealing with people barely into the renaissance. We can't just expect to win their hearts and minds if we carry one of the biggest guns in our arsenal all around the time. Samantha said, you have a point on that but that's assuming they would like to play ball. How old are you Lieutenant? Robert placed his hips on the side judgmentally. 23 and fresh out of West Point, great school and all. But you still got much to learn kid, don't think you got that CO badge cues you are the daughter of a war hero and especially you being a strong woman in such a manly field. Robert pointed out with his piercing and weary eyes. The boys always beat me and sist me when they don't allow groin shots and weapon wielding. She objected. That ain't the point little girl. My point is that even if you are the leader, you must always listen to your team. Especially from the likes of Crocker and Abidaya, he said as he turned his head towards the two Strider group members who were casually enjoying a cup of coffee as they inspected their new military gear. Crocker, I know his kind. Seen more fights than a woman your age. At your period. In my experience, sometimes the safest approach is the best approach. Trust me on that since he had to deal with all sorts of cutthroats. Robert explained. Like Diaz? Yeah people like Diaz is what Crocker probably had to eat for breakfast every day when he was a peacekeeper. I read his files. All sorts of shit happened I can tell you that. What about a Abidaya? Abidaya like a good number of people have family to protect. In a workplace such as yourselves. He will most likely rely on you the most for what to do next right next to Crocker your second. You got to treat your lads right alongside with choosing carefully. You can't just push your men to the limit. Especially for someone of his age and a daughter. I hate to see a man like him put in a bag, yeech. He cringed. I see. I see. Maybe I am a bit too hard on a bed sometimes and sometimes behind closed doors me and Crocker would argue over things. But Robert, about my question about the Gleasons. Why so much caution over such primitives? Samantha said. Exhibit A, they might not think like we do. I mean they probably have never seen a gun before and they could just blindly charge in while screaming Leroy Jenkin. Or whatever to shank you. The range game is our edge with them don't forget that. Exhibit B. Magic. It was lucky for you to befriend Iris being a witch and a goddamn vampire. But what about everyone else? Would they smile on you or cast some crazy ass D and D shit on you to fuck up your day? It's a good thing mages, at least in rebounds per games I have seen they stand out like damn fireflies but they could do anything and we won't be able to know what they could do until it's too late. Dr. Malone better get some nice research over the new lab equipment I will personally hand over. This kind of stuff shouldn't exist in my book. Robert gave his opinion on magic. Meanwhile behind the crate, Aliathra was eavesdropping on the two. She had heard every single word of that conversation and gained some valuable intelligence, that the lieutenant was inexperienced, 
The Youth are bringing out some of their best weapons to meet the Splay Agents in battle and finally this governor who sounds like a very important almost revered figure who has the magics of behaviorism. Was it some sort of spell or set of spells that can make people happily do what you say? That sounded dangerous. If the youth can seduce people with their gifts of opulent cities and excessive firepower then her world is in serious trouble. The elf's heart race with dread at the imagination of such a destructive and altering force these earth human demon or whatever these people are. As a princess with a duty to protect her own from those who seek its harm, whether directly or by proxy, she must stand up and fight. But right now she must focus on staying alive first. She turned her back only to bump into the steeled up chest of Diaz. Whoa. Hi Elfie I was looking for you. Diaz said with a flirtatious smile. Looking. For. Me? Aliathra said nervously. Yeah. I just want to invite you to something. I mean you being a pretty girl and all. Being fish out of water in all of this new stuff. I want to. Fish out of water? Aliathra asked not comprehending the idiom. Being in a strange land far from home can get really stressful. It's not healthy am I right? My people feel like that every day. Working abroad away from home and family. Absolutely terrible. Indeed. Don't you suppose you have ways to alleviate such burden on yourself? Aliathra maintained her graceful demeanor to hide her silent terror. Electronic music. My car has some great audio and I got great soundtrack. Can be really fun to just chill out in. You want in? We can like maybe get to know each other more and stuff. Diaz also hid his rather obvious affection for the elf. Who could blame him with Aliathra's golden hair, blue eyes and flawless snow white with some pinkish hue skin. Plus the way she styled her hair with a braid on her back and bangs that helped emphasize the penetrating elf ears that peeked over her hair do was just inviting for any bachelor to seek her attention. The prospect of gaining more valuable information on Diaz, probably the greatest threat to the Alliance of Orders could face outside of the youth's incomprehensible technology and eldritch common language was too much of an opportunity to pass up. How can I refuse such a tempting offer? Take me to this electronic music you speak highly of. Aliathra flattered him. Great. Looks like I ain't sleeping alone tonight. You're gonna love it. These artists are like car bards. They sing of love, peace, freedom and bravery. The beat will mesmerize you. Vincent took Aliathra by the hand and walked her over to his Mustang for some time musical time together. Vincent couldn't wait to share on his social media that he dated an elf with princess-like qualities and a very brave iron heart. Chapter 21 Planning for Tomorrow Thank you Mr. Aparo for your investment. Governor White nodded to the holographic display of his video conference with Domenico Aparo, CEO of Aparo Corporation. As the mega corporation's boss disconnected, he sat on his lofty leather office chair that resides on his mahogany desk in his office at the now fully constructed Governor's Palace of New Albany, center hold of youth power in Gleesia, aka Benham III. They had just finished discussing matters about the finer details of Aparo's exclusive contract. More weapons, educated manpower to pool labor into, building materials, building equipment. It was obvious from his and other people's experience that they were trying to grease his hands with material wealth. Most of the time speaking back in the core youth worlds, the megacorps fight each other ruthlessly on the scraps of empty void of strategic economic territory amongst the citizens and their daily lives, always trying to outdo the other man through legal and extra-legal means. But for one such megacorp to instead viewing his attention to his many myriad white-collar occupations, this Domenico Aparo has been taking very personal interests in Gleesia. Was it the crystals? His company is one of the three corporations that make up the triumvirate of the privatized energy sector. It was obvious from the start that the mega corporation wanted these for themselves and if their history books has taught them anything about what happens when you combine a technologically inferior civilization with valuable resource paired with a resource hungry superior one, the results would make the Mayans, Incans, Malays, King Chinese and African tribes look like an orderly divorce. 
the governor needs to keep tabs upon a corp and mitigate any of their neo-imperialist ambitions when it rears its ugly head. Such notions of thoughts were both a guilty pleasure and old shame amongst his fellow Earth humans with such manifest destinies undergoing a global renaissance during the early to mid periods of the youth's expansion years between the years of 2076 and 2180 as agreed by historians who recorded in their databanks and media hands in the web archives. Jeremy massaged his aching temples, dealing with a megacorp was at best a deal with the devil but with youth budget cuts which thankfully the EO and Benham 3 expedition managed to get through despite the bureaucratic and budget constraints on the dozens of youth colonies and core worlds which was argued against during the hearings. A paro corp will now fill in most of the gaps left behind from the youth but it was more than obvious that in exchange the megacorp would want legal protection from the illicit activities in exchange for their support, the governor bit his lips in admission of defeat, it was either that or get the short end of a stick, he just hopes that their partnership could work out in a less disruptive light for both parties. Speaking about partnerships, he looked over to his desk and to his side was a telephone. A cable telephone, not many are made these days due to the prevalence of satellite technology overtaking cable but it still had its uses in the more far-flung areas of the youth. The telephone had several buttons attached to it but they weren't numbers that were assigned to each of them, they were names. The telephone was a hotline, a mean to voice his power to his subordinates. He had a hotline for the youth colonial militia headquarters, New Albany's utility plant, the police headquarters the administration offices and finally most unique for his special phone, a hotline to Prince Klovich in his castle. After holding very warm diplomatic talks with his counterparts in Tyrian, he personally saw to it that the prince and thus the Tyrian people have a means of communicating between each other. He even personally saw the installment of Klovich's telephone in his throne room which sat right next to his desk where he writes and seal his various letters decrees and edicts as he can exercise within his vassalized powers from the Slaegean Empire. Seeing the phone again reminded him of one of the governor's duties that day. Jeremy picked up the phone and dialed for Castle Tyrian. A ringing noise was made before the sound of a person's breath could be heard from the speaker. Hello? Prince Klovich's voice said. It's Gover. How do I know you're not some witch spying on me? Prince Klovich yelled accusingly. That's when Governor White realized he made a small blunder. He is still talking with a person who has barely just got familiar in using a telephone before. He recalled the various concerns of the prince when he was being demonstrated the uses of his telephone but it was like talking to a technophobe during the entire course. He was rather justifiably scared however of rogue mages people who use magic for various nefarious deeds to spy at him because he still thinks that a lot of the youth's advanced technology is magic. Clark's third law strikes again to him and his cronies giving nothing short of headaches. Even their infant children can properly operate a smartphone with no problem but the smartest Gleesian might get the same kind of headache one might get when struggling to learn algebra in high school. Jeremy sighed and came up with his proper response. I am going to give you a freshly baked creamelo pie for dinner. Jeremy said their arranged trust password. The reasoning behind this was actually a very amusing story. Creamelo is a golden orange colored berry that grows in Tyrian. It is used for making delicious pies, jams and even wines. It was a regional delicacy that ironically for the very ruler of Tyrian to be allergic to or in his wordings the gods burn me if I eat them. He tasted the berry himself and Jeremy made it a goal to grab a patch of them and pair it with some vanilla ice cream. He might make a call to some ice cream conglomerates of obtaining an exotic new flavor in the new world. Yuck. So, it is you again Lord White. What makes you call me in this hour? Do you have news about my sister? The cringe from Klovich's voice changed to excited concern over his sister Aria who he waved off to them for the cure to her crippled state. She can't wait to run up to you and give you a hug. Governor White emphasized. A slight chuckle escaped his throat over the heartwarming implications of Aria with strong legs being able to run to her brother with a beautiful smile on her rosy lips to the cheer of thousands. You will have my eternal gratitude for this. You know, Lord White.
You have done much more for me than anyone from Slaeja ever done to Terian since this realm was established. The prince shared his gratefulness. We may be very powerful the likes of which no one of your kind has seen, but we are respectful of you and you have shown nothing but hospitality and kindness to us. White replied with his diplomatic bravado. Indeed, you have my fellow man friend from another. Wherever in the gods' names you come from, Tyrian and also your realm of New Albany only prospered when you arrived on my doorstep. Rumors abound of Clovich's new friend in all over the lands from the Dwarven clan holdings, the elves Alphalnora, the eastern suzerainties, northern tribes and beyond. They speak of you of the many terrifying and wondrous things you can accomplish that no one could ever claim to do or even conceive of doing. Clovich praised. Yet. Some of these people might have misinterpret your you, unexpected arrival, Clovich muttered. Explain. White requested. He knew from the reports of Colonel Polonsky and Major Holyfield that they had underwent a skirmish with the Slaeagens earlier that was written down as no longer an isolated incident. Furthermore, there were reports of some very subversive rumors about the strange sky people who suddenly appeared out of nowhere and began to offer people gifts at a good to be true contracts. Some reports were from their earlier more publicized incidents such as the Divico siege and numerous quests that the youth soldiers undertake in order to raise hearts and minds. They all had an idea but they never talk much about it to Prince Clovich himself. Well. I had sent out several letters to several of my closest neighbors about you but, unlike your, this email of yours, they could take about a week or more, I still can't believe you have messengers that can instantly send out whatever you write, the prince said with a hint of suggestion to his tone on the last phrase, maybe one day we will teach you how to send out an email, but your phone is good enough for now, anyhow, your majesty. Your sister should be arriving back from her surgery soon at around four days according to the ship captain and the preparation for her arrival is well underway correct? Indeed, food, invitations have been sent and I pulled out the old banquet table meant for outdoor festivals and the my personal wine reserve, he boasted, that I would love to see, but I also want to add one thing, more, diplomatic in nature, Jeremy said, what would that may be? The prince twitched his eyebrows in curiosity. You said earlier that some people you know are suspicious of our new dot friendship right? Well to tell you the truth, we expect something like this would happen. My bosses. Bosses? Clovich asked in confusion to the earth human terminology. Masters. My masters back from our world of earth is trying to push for much more open relationships with you and everyone in Gleesia. They say a formal declaration of peace and friendship should help alleviate any of their fears. A speech, maybe some cultural enrichment and some gift exchanges would be best. I know that Major Holyfield's people have some of his men who can play some music, a violinist, a drummer and a bunch more that you never heard of. You're going to love hearing from them especially during the feasts. The governor said I would be waiting to hear their music soon. Well. Now that's all I have to talk about you I apologize to say to end this discussion early but now I need to get back to my duties, especially for the event, the suckling pig takes stays to marinade, Prince Clovich departed. Good luck with all of that and I will see you soon, the governor gave his adieus before he dropped the phone, a sigh of relief escaped his lungs after let go of his hotline and reflected on the words he and Clovich said. It looks like the governor is going to have to write a speech. He turned to his office computer and selected Microsoft Word 22K and began to type down his speech. On behalf of the United Federation of Earth we wish to first of all express our most sincere gratitude. End of Block 2